Hey guys. Here's the second and final part of a new cause. Enjoy, Chapter 13, Aftermath. Naruto had made it to the rain country within several days and was now walking toward the town where he was supposed to meet up with Itachi, a smile naturally formed on Naruto's face. The rain country is really beautiful when it's not raining, thought Naruto as he was purposely taking his time getting to the hotel. Nevertheless, Naruto soon arrived at the hotel and quickly found out which room Ichita, Itachi's cover name, was staying in. Naruto easily found the key that was hidden by Genjutsu above the door and calmly walked in. Once inside the room Naruto was a little surprised when he didn't feel anyone's presence, but shrugged it off thinking that Itachi must have gone somewhere. He took off his jacket and shoes and proceeded into room, well that's weird, thought Naruto as he looked around, none of his stuff is here. The hotel room, except for the usual hotel stuff, was completely empty. After a bit of looking around his eyes finally landed on the only one foreign object in the entire room, a scroll that was lying on top of the table. He walked over to it and looked at it, from, Itachi, to, Naruto it read. Couldn't he just leave a simple note telling me where he is? Mused Naruto. He tried to open the scroll, but found that it wouldn't even budge, then shook his head slightly and bit his thumb, always the extra careful one Itachi, chuckled Naruto as he ran his bleeding thumb over the edge of the scroll. Naruto then unrolled the scroll and began reading. Dear Naruto. I would usually lead you on a little goose chase before telling you exactly what I had in mind, but this time around I'm going to get straight to the point. If you are reading this, then I am dead. What? Thought Naruto with chills running down his spine. I had a feeling, a precursor, that this latest mission would be my last. I hoped of course that I was wrong, but just in case I took the time to write this scroll to you. You must be asking yourself how did Itachi die? Well I must have died in battle, as is suitable for warriors such as ourselves. I do not regret my life and I do not regret my death, so I must ask you not to try and avenge my death, if the person was able to kill me then he will also be able to kill you. It must have been that bastard Jiraiya. Growled Naruto, one thing I don't want you to become is an avenger. I'm not sure if I can honor that, Itachi, mumbled Naruto. While on the avenger subject, I wasn't able to accomplish much with Sasuke, so ask I must ask a favor, could you please make sure that he understands everything? Now I have to come clean about something I have kept hidden from even you, Kisame never died, in fact he is alive and well. Eh? During that mission I helped him stage his own death. The reason he did it was because he was tired of the Akatsuki, and also because he wanted to get away from everything in the ninja world, basically he wanted to retire I guess. Forgive me for not telling you, but I thought it best that no one knows the truth, after all the more people that know a secret the less of a secret it becomes. If you ever want to get in contact with him, he said he would be on an island outside of the water country, but he demanded that we don't attract unnecessary attention, I'm sure you understand. Of course. Moving on, after what you just did to the leaf you're gonna need some desolate place to pass the time. I happen to own a house in the snow country that I am leaving to you, take care of the place. To me? Asked Naruto incredulously, further on in the scroll there will be a map and directions for getting there. You should spend at least six months hiding out. Don't worry no one knows that it's there except for me and the guy who built it, but I already got rid of that liability. Why am I not surprised? Said Naruto with a smirk. Also, about the Akatsuki I have a premonition that it's not going to last very long. If I hadn't died on this mission I would have left that organization soon after. I realize that you have only stayed in the Akatsuki because of me, so now that those binds are broken you can be free. So just disappear from the chaos of the world for several months. Whatever I own I pass on to you, do with it as you please, but always take care. Goodbye Uzumaki Naruto, I wish you the best of luck in your future, but you don't need it. Forever Honorable. Yoroni I chan Itachi. A.N., it wouldn't let me put it on the right-hand side. P.S., thank you beforehand for the favor. Naruto's eyes watered up while reading Itachi's last words. Oni I chan isn't coming back. And for the first time in a decade Naruto openly cried, holding the scroll close to his chest. After several minutes he stopped crying and wiped his eyes and cheeks free of tears. I'm sorry Onii-chan, but I can't let your death go unpunished. Jiraiya will pay for what he has done and he will pay dearly, said Naruto in an ominous tone. I still can't believe this is real, mused Naruto while unrolling the scroll further, it just seems like a some sort of bad dream, a nightmare. But sadly I must face the fact that he's not here anymore and that I'm on my own. But I will get my revenge on Jiraiya, vowed Naruto. However he also realized that there was no way he could go back to the leaf right now, not after what had happened. Their security right now will be very high. So, no I'll wait it out. 
Just like Itachi wrote I need to disappear and also if Jiraiya was able to beat Itachi then I wouldn't stand a chance against him, mused Naruto trying to decide on his next course of action. Hmm. To think that he was able to keep the secret of Kisame's death or rather life a secret from me, said Naruto in a more cheerful tone. Nice to know that I haven't lost everyone. Naruto had now come across the map that Itachi left him. So his house is in the far north, well the farther from civilization the better right now. Except that I'm gonna have to carry a lot of food there. Naruto chuckled at the mental image of himself carrying a mountain of food, most of it being ramen. This is actually perfect, I'll be able to train there in complete privacy, then after a few months I'll come back and kill that prevented bastard of Senen. He then put away the scroll into his pocket and walked out of the hotel room. Not even bothering to check out of the hotel, Naruto went to the nearest restaurant had lunch and immediately afterwards left for the snow country. Just my luck, I had to come here during the early winter, Naruto cursed his luck as he looked over the snow-covered fields and mountains. I gotta say though this country really is beautiful. Naruto was now halfway into the snow country and was now village hoping since he really didn't want to camp outside. This of course slowed his progress, but he didn't mind it too much, especially since he was now nearing his destination. Naruto was eating dinner at the local pub as he looked at his newly acquired map of the snow country and compared it to Itachi's map, from the looks of it I have to go tangent to the main road about a half a mile out of town and cross this wilderness here. Then. I guess I'll just see it. Hopefully. The next morning Naruto filled his backpack and bag with food and started his slow track through the forest. The forest soon stopped and instead tuned into a completely white snow-covered field, after which Naruto could clearly see his route taking him up a mountain. At least I can walk on top of the snow instead of falling through it and climbing will be easier with chakra. After a 10 minutes break Naruto resumed his journey and after about 6 hours was up on the mountain. Wow. This is a killer view, said Naruto in a dreamy voice, now let's see if can spot the house. Naruto looked around, but unfortunately everything was covered in snow and it was very hard to decipher one thing from another. Well by the looks of the map it should be right to the northeast of me. I guess I'll just have to go down that way and see if it become more apparent. Naruto had to journey almost all the way down the mountain before he finally spotted the chimney sticking out of the snow. Sighing and relied that he had finally found it, Naruto quickly made his way to the house and stood outside looking at it. The house was a lot bigger than Naruto had expected, Itachi should have said mansion instead of house. Naruto then took out the key that had popped out of the scroll and went inside. Whoa, it seems even bigger on the inside than it does on the outside, said Naruto. He dropped his bags near the door and went to look around. First he walked into the living room, it had a large couch, a fireplace and a table with a go board on top of it. Hmm. The house had such a warm atmosphere. Naruto continued looking around the house finding the kitchen, a dining room, three bedrooms each complete with a personal bathroom and shower, and a training room. The training room was however completely bare, no way, Itachi would have some weapons at least, thought Naruto and activated his demon eyes. He instantly saw through the genjutsu that was placed over the far wall, walking over to it, he easily undid it and revealed a door. Naruto opened it and stepped into a completely dark room. He fumbled around a bit looking for the light switch, but found it soon enough and was amazed at what he saw inside. There were weapons of all kinds, Naruto could not find one single weapon style missing from the selection, and it even had some that he was unfamiliar with. Well I've got my work cut out for me in the weapons department, thought Naruto as he continued observing the room. On the right wall he saw a closet and walked over to it opening it up, inside were many scrolls large and small, several even had forbidden written on them. A scroll collection, huh Itachi? I wonder if there are some in here that you didn't teach me already. Naruto picked out a random scroll and looked at the name of the technique, Walk of Shadows, well I don't know that one. After glancing at half a dozen more scrolls Naruto found that he didn't know a single technique. Well more work cut out for me. The sun was quickly setting, so Naruto decided to go to the kitchen make himself dinner and go to bed. Tomorrow he would start training himself. His last thoughts as he drifted off to sleep were of Itachi and his newly found source of training. Leaf Village Tsunade was in her office busily working through the mountain of paperwork on her desk. Things had been rough since the Hyuga assassination, the civilians easily bought the lie about Itachi being the assassin, but some of the Hyuga that had survived the attack weren't so willing to believe. The Hokage then had to personally explain it to them and make them swear a blood oath not to tell anyone else. Still most of the Hyuga were unhappy that the Hokage had covered up the incident like that, this of course created tension within the village. However, the now small portion that made up the main family was satisfied with the cover-up since they did not want the village to know that the heiress had been in love with the assassin and had actually led him into the Hyuga manor. Hyuga Hinata, 
she was a whole other issue just by herself. Completely heartbroken over Naruto, she woke up in the hospital thinking that she just passed out during training and then the events of the previous night came flooding back and she thought that she would finally have her happiness, but then the news came. She was told that half of the clan leaders were murdered, along with her father and her sister. She was told to report to the Hokage immediately and once she came there she was told the full story behind the Hyuga assassination, she even found out the true assassin's identity. She was in an emotional turmoil for a week, she simply could not believe that her precious Naruto-kun could do such a thing. She finally came out of it after a week and said that she was ready to learn her duties as the head of the family, but everyone noticed that she had greatly changed. Gone was the indecisiveness and shyness, and out came the confident independent young woman that her father would have been proud of. But she was not like her father, she still had her sweet side present and because of that did not oppress the branch family and instead kept several of her close friends by her side as advisors. I may as well keep the promise Naruto had made to Neji, before the dark side swallowed him up, concluded Hinata. Several of the other clan leaders tried to challenge her, but she shut them up instantaneously and with the kind of force that made the others afraid to even disagree with her on small matters. It had been six months since that day and bit by bit the peace was returning to the leaf village, much to the delight of the Hokage. In that amount of time no one had even heard of Naruto, Tsunade understood that he must have gone into hiding and guessed that they probably wouldn't see him for several years to come. Just then the door burst open loudly and an Anbu ran into the Hokage office, Hokage-sama, I have some urgent news, he said panting. What is it? What's happened? said Tsunade jumping up. We just received reports from both the sand and the stone, that they have successfully raided and taken over the Akatsuki. What? yelled Tsunade, are you serious? How did they even know where to go? Very serious, Hokage-sama. It seems that the stone were anonymously tipped off about it and had sent two teams to check it out. The strike team was exterminated by a well-known missing nin from the stone, but the other team escaped, explained the Anbu member. So the stone and sand formed an alliance and took down the Akatsuki? Asked Tsunade already knowing the answer. That's right, Hokage-sama, confirmed the Anbu. Where is the Akatsuki lair? Questioned Tsunade calmly sitting back down. In the mountain country, he replied. It seems to have been inside of a mountain, the door of which was concealed by Genjutsu. All right I want an Anbu team sent to investigate the Akatsuki lair and try to find information about our own missing nin, ordered Tsunade. It will be done Hokage-sama, the Anbu bowed and disappeared. We might have finally found you Naruto, mused Tsunade, or at least clues of where you are. Every single country that had a missing nin sent their own teams to investigate. So the Akatsuki lair was crawling with Anbu from all different countries. While this created much tension and apprehension, it also made sure that no corner of the Akatsuki headquarters was left unsearched. However the search for Naruto had proved futile. The leaf Anbu found nothing about where the boy could be. There were only mission reports showing what he had done in the past and how well he performed. It seemed that he was the most valuable shinobi to the leaders of the Akatsuki and they were monitoring his growth with a hawk's eye. Judging by the records Naruto had gone into hiding six months ago, but even the Akatsuki had no idea where he went. Luckily, documents weren't the only source of information. During the attack the leaders, Rito and Kane, had been killed, but not Hajeko. He had survived and was now under heavy interrogation. The interrogation revealed a lot of information about the members of the Akatsuki. It seemed that there were only two members left, Reiko and Mia. The Akatsuki had concluded that Naruto had left the organization and gone into hiding from both them and the Leaf. So the only remaining team was sent to find him and kill him no less than two weeks ago, but they hadn't reported in since they left. The Leaf interrogation team found that Naruto had actually come to the Akatsuki willingly and was freely utilizing his power to help their cause. They also uncovered that he had gotten training from a Cloud Nin, Grass Nin, Miss Nin, and of course Itachi. Hijeko was also forced to admit that Naruto was the centerpiece for all their plans. Plans like killing off all the advanced bloodlines to weaken the villages and make them a lot more susceptible to attack. They also uncovered that the Hyuga assassination had only gone through the first phase, there was going to be another attack once things had calmed down. So the actual mission only required Naruto to kill the five clan leaders in Hyashi? Questioned Tsunade as she read the report. That's right Hokage-sama, the youngest heiress was seen as a bonus in the Akatsuki's eyes and Naruto was well paid for her head, explained Aviki. But why attack only half the Hyuga? Isn't it better to destroy them all at once? Asked Tsunade. I asked him the same question, and he said that they wanted to disrupt the flow of the clan by killing off half of the council and the head of the main family. But the biggest reason was to show off the Kyuubi's power to the world, replied Aviki. 
and that they did that well enough, mumbled Tsunade, Iviki just nodded. Well if even the Akatsuki doesn't know where Naruto is then we probably don't even have a chance of finding him, said Tsunade throwing the report down on her desk. We don't have to call off the search though, said Iviki. No, no I'm not saying that. Countered Tsunade. It's just that we can't put him on high priority. Agreed. All right then, you're dismissed, Iviki bowed slightly and vanished in a cloud of smoke. Not a minute later a medic nin came rushing into Tsunade's office, Hokage-sama, I have wonderful news. What is it? Asked Tsunade lazily. Uchiha Sasuke is awake, cried the medic nin. Tsunade instantly jumped up and quickly made her way to the hospital. There she found a groggy but awake Uchiha, who wondered how long he was out. Before answering Tsunade gave him a checkup and found him in perfect health. Physically he's perfectly fine, but how is mentally? She wondered. Sasuke, how do you feel? She asked him. Fine, came the monotonous answer. How long was I out? Six and a half months now, replied Tsunade as if it was nothing. What? yelled Sasuke. That damn bastard put me out for that long? Calm down. Ordered Tsunade. You know who did this to you? Yay, only one person could possible have those eyes, replied Sasuke in a bit calmer tone. What eyes? asked Tsunade. Those blood-red eyes with a black slit down the middle, answered Sasuke. The Kyuubi's eyes. So Naruto was posing as the grass nin. Not that we had much to go against that belief, thought Tsunade. So you know who you were really fighting against then? Sasuke gave her a suspicious look saying, so you knew about it too? Yay, I know. I was fighting with Naruto. Yes, Tsunade answered sadly. What technique did he use against you? He called it hell level 2 but it felt too much like Tsukiyomi, said Sasuke rubbing his temples. Except instead of him torturing me, it was some demons in hell. It felt like I was being tortured for all the sins in my life, just relentless beating. Sasuke shuddered just remembering and rubbed some of his long healed wounds. Huh? How come I have some scars here? He asked. It seems that Naruto's attack somehow made your own body inflict these wounds upon you, answered Tsunade. How is that possible? Asked Sasuke in a confused tone, how can that Dobi do that? Then another thought crossed his mind, why was Naruto disguised as a grass nin? Well he is a class S missing nin after all, said Tsunade, he can't just come here openly. Class S? Since when? Asked Sasuke, Tsunade cursed mentally at that slip of the tongue. We'll tell you when you recover fully, she said. No, damn it. Tell me now, he yelled. Tsunade sighed, he wasn't actually here for the Jounin exam. He had an entirely different purpose. A different purpose? Wondered Sasuke. What else could he want? He's changed a lot since we all knew him, Sasuke, he wasn't here for peaceful purposes. Did he? Attack the village? In a way. Tsunade then told all him about the Hyuga assassination. Saying that Naruto was Itachi's accomplice in this act. Itachi. Sasuke's Sharingan instantly flared up. Naruto is allied with that bastard, said Sasuke in a low angry tone. There's something you should know about Itachi, said Tsunade calmly. Sasuke narrowed his eyes suspiciously. Itachi was killed right after the assassination. Sasuke's eyes widened, what? How did that happen? He asked. Jiraiya killed him after chasing him down on his retreat from the village. Damn it. Damn it, he was supposed to be mine. Sasuke slammed his fist into the bed. You should be happy that he is finally gone and focus on more important things, countered Tsunade. She could easily see that Sasuke was fuming on the inside. That damn bastard Jiraiya, how could he take this away from me? It was supposed to be my revenge, mine and no one else's. Tsunade's face suddenly hardened, Sasuke, not very many people know that Naruto was also there with Itachi. For political purposes we have to keep that a secret. So now I'm ordering you to never speak about this again. You got that? Said Tsunade in a commanding forceful tone. Yes, said Sasuke somewhat reluctantly, but knew that crossing the Hokage wasn't a smart thing to do. Tsunade stood up and moved to the door, you are in pretty good physical condition, but still need to stay in the hospital for further tests. Sasuke scoffed at this, I need to go now and as for you, I order you to stay here. If you disobey there will be harsh punishment, said Tsunade menacingly. That damn spoiled kid, thinks he can do anything. Thought Tsunade as she walked out of the hospital and back to her office, at least he's finally awake. Sasuke recovered very fast and began training within a week of waking up. 
everyone was very happy to see that he was up again, especially Sakura, but she was then saddened when she realized that he had woken even colder than before. He was quickly brought up to speed on what had happened while he was asleep, however he didn't seem much interested. He never did forgive Jiraiya for killing Itachi, but continued training harder and harder for the new goal in his life. If Naruto was Itachi's accomplice then he will have to do for my revenge. I will definitely get the Mangekyu Sharingan and show those eyes of his who is the true master in mind torture. Snow Country Meanwhile Naruto had absolutely no idea what was going on in the outside world and didn't care either. He was happily living in Itachi's mansion, well now I guess it's my mansion, but I just can't get used that, thought Naruto during one of his training intermissions. The reason for his obliviousness to the outside world was of course his training, he was hell-bent on learning all the techniques that were in those scrolls Itachi had saved from his travels. It turns out that during all his travels Itachi constantly kept a lookout for Jutsus that he either couldn't copy or one so powerful that even his Sharingan was able to see through. He would then acquire the scrolls for these techniques, oftentimes forcefully, and stash them in that closet. Many of the techniques that Naruto found in there were ninjutsus, but there were a few jinjutsus, these were very powerful and neither the Byakugan nor the Sharingan couldn't see through them. Naruto did not neglect his physical training and would go for a run up the mountain every morning and night. Soon thought that became too easy and he started venturing farther and farther. During one of these times he found a lake not too far, by his standards, from his house. Since it was winter the lake was completely frozen, except for several places where the ice was thin and Naruto could see some fish swimming under the surface. Naruto instantly decided to melt off a little bit of the ice and catch himself a fish for dinner, may as well not come home empty-handed, he concluded. Melting a small portion of the ice was rather easy, but it wasn't nearly enough for Naruto to be able to catch a fish. Man I wish I could melt the entire lake. Then an idea occurred to him. He had seen a scroll back at the house that would let him make fire appear out of nowhere, but he hadn't paid much attention to it since he didn't have any jutsus that worked like that, that could work. A giant fire spreading out from the middle of the lake, all the way out to the edges and melting all the ice. I think I could make that work. Naruto then rushed back to the house to study the scroll intently. After many tries and several months Naruto had finally created his very own kinjutsu. He could now make the fire burst out from anywhere he wanted and spread out over as big an area as he wanted. He named the Jutsu Lake of Fire and would later on work on it to increase its power and spread rate. Time seems to just fly by when you're busy working on the things you love, and so it happened with Naruto. For him it seemed way too early, but summer had already come. Since the snow country doesn't really have spring, the only way you can tell the summer apart is that the snow actually starts melting. Nine months of winter and only three months of summer, mused Naruto, it is really a remarkable place. But the coming of summer means that I have already been here for nine months. I hadn't planned to stay this long, especially since I have business to take care of down south. Naruto decided to stay there until the summer's end and then leave the safety of his house and venture back into the world that he had so successfully disappeared from a nine months ago. Naruto knew that during his re-emergence into the ninja world he would have to avoid the hidden villages at all cost and travel under a disguise. A part of him did not want to leave this place, but Naruto knew that he couldn't leave his unfinished business hanging any longer. Jiraiya will pay for what he has done and then my mind will finally be able to rest. At the summer's end and before any of the snowstorms could roll in, Naruto left the bastion of his mansion and cautiously journeyed into the outside world. Chapter 14, Old Enemies, New Friends Getting through and out of the snow country was easy, considering that he wasn't the only one leaving. It turned out that Naruto got lucky, the time he was leaving was the same that all the visitors and her tourists leave, making it easy for Naruto to blend in. After safely getting out of the snow, Naruto crossed the border into the earth country. For the most part he managed to avoid the stone shinobi way, but one time he did happen to sit quite close to a stone shinobi group and overhear a single plan altering conversation. So were you part of the strike force? Ask Stone One. A.N. Um. It's three nins taking and I'm lazy. No, they sent me to clean up the mess and search for any secret documents and stuff, replied Stone Two. So what the hell was there at the Akatsuki hideout? Ask Stone Three. Nothing much at all, it was like it was deserted, explained Stone Two, we found who the members were, some info about the missions, but otherwise there was nothing. Two of the members are still on the loose right? Stone One asked. Yay. There were only three when we attacked, said Stone 3. I believe, there's a cloud nin and a grass nin that are still loose, explained Stone 2. Oh and there was something about a leaf nin, but he seemed to have quit that organization about half a year before it was taken down. So the Akatsuki were taken down. Mused Naruto. 
It seems that Reiko and Mia haven't been captured yet. That's good. Though I wonder how the stone knew where to go. Naruto decided to continue listening in. Doesn't it seem strange that just out of the blue there was an anonymous tip-off about the Akatsuki and that it was right? Wondered Stone One. Yay, but we got them, so I don't think it matters that much, said Stone Three. They continued chatting for a while longer before finally leaving, but never again about the Akatsuki. Naruto paid for his food and went back to his hotel to think, six months after I left, they were taken down by an anonymous tip-off. Who would know where the Akatsuki were located? Naruto quickly realized that no one, apart from the members themselves knew where headquarters was. A random passerby gets lucky? No. You'd have to be able to recognize them as missing Nin. Naruto pondered it for a little while longer, but came up with nothing. Oh well, that means one less group to hide from, thought Naruto happily. That's good that Reiko and Mia were able to escape. Now, though, they won't be found. Especially Mia she can hide like no other. Naruto wandered through the earth country for another week, seeking some more information about the Akatsuki takedown. He found out that the sand had helped the stone, but that this also seemed to have sparked a civil war to break out within the sand. A hot spot for danger, the people called it and Naruto agreed. After the earth country Naruto had a choice between the rain and the grass country. He considered the seasons and instantly chose to go to the grass country, no way am I going the rain country in the middle of the rainy season. No way in hell. Naruto had in no way forgotten about his training and would always make sure to practice wherever he went. Naruto walked off of the road and into a wide open field and began to practice his taijutsu. Halfway through one of his kata, he noticed a big solitary oak tree standing on the opposite end of the field, well I'll be. I remember this place. Flashback. Now Naruto, yelled Mia from the other side of the field, I want you to grab me with your vines. You're not gonna stand still are you? Asked Naruto with a scowl. Mia smiled, of course not. What's the fun in that? She gave a small chuckle before her face went absolutely serious, now come on. All right, all right, he grumbled and touched the tree. He closed his eyes to envision where the vine was going and directed them to go where Mia was. As soon as the vine got within a meter of her, she jumped away shouting, missed. Naruto then began to redirect the vine. But was again too slow, er. This is impossible how am I supposed to catch you with only one vine? He yelled. My dear boy, whoever said you can only use one. She said in a sweet voice. What? You mean this whole time I could have made several? Asked Naruto incredulously. Of course, she replied. Naruto once again pressed him palm to the tree, now she tells me. But how would I coordinate multiple vines? Naruto thought a little and then decided to put his taijutsu senses into play. I'll try to guess where she's going to jump base to her movement and then have a vine waiting for her. Naruto put his idea into action, but found it hard to guess where Mia was going to jump next, is she doing this on purpose? Wait who am I kidding, of course she is. At that point Mia decided to give Naruto another clue, kid you're never gonna catch me using this little number of vines. Little number, thought Naruto who had by now been trained to read into people's words. I'm using 10 right now, but. Wait a second this morning she said we were going to train on a full scale. Naruto growled a little. A full scale, of course. She wants me to cover the entire field in vines. Naruto then gathered up more chakra and did exactly that, he shot vines out in all directions and concentrated even harder to know which vine to activate to capture Mia. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Mia jump away and instantly prepped the group of vines she was going to land close to, gotcha, thought Naruto, but too early. Mia didn't land fully, she just barely touched the ground, but enough to jump away. It kept going like this until Naruto had run out of chakra. That was good Naruto, you figured out the point of my initial lesson, said Mia. And flashback. A smile grazed Naruto's face as he put his hand on the tree, ah memories. And then I remember the next day of training, to make the vines jump out like six feet. That was torturous. Naruto then noticed that it was getting dark really fast, I forgot that about the grass country, the dusk only lasts like 30 minutes. Naruto picked up his bag, got back on the trail and continued to the next village. A bandit tried to mug him soon after he had set out, but Naruto just calmly killed him without even breaking stride, fucking idiot. He rented a room at the hotel nearest to the village's exit and went to get something to eat. Afterwards Naruto decided to wander around the village and finally found his way to a hilltop overlooking the entire village, nice place they got here. It was about midnight when Naruto decided to stop his contemplations and go get a good night's sleep. On the way back he passed an alley where he saw a kid getting beat up by the local gang. 
Naruto was going to just walk on by, when suddenly an image flashed through his mind. The image contained himself as a ten-year-old kid being beat up by some villagers. Naruto scowled and looked back at the beating in the alley, God damn it. I don't care about that kid, I should just walk away. It's none of my business, said one side of his mind. But another said the exact opposite, Naruto suddenly found himself stuck in the middle. Finally on a random impulse he decided to walk towards the gang, I don't even know why I'm doing this. It's not like I care. Ah what the hell may as well draw some blood. He concluded. Naruto, very quietly, came up behind one of the gang members and snapped his neck. Once the body fell forward lifeless the others turned around and looked at the intruder. What the hell do you think you're doing? Yelled a man, who seemed to be the leader, as another crouched down to check his fallen comrade. He's dead, said the man slowly. This seemed to piss off the first guy, you're gonna pay for that, he yelled. Naruto just stood there calmly with uncaring eyes. The leader then rushed at Naruto and tried to punch him in the face. Naruto simply moved his head a little and counterattacked the leader with a powerful punch to his ribs. A loud cracking sound was heard and the leader fell down to the ground clutching his side in pain. Naruto then kneed him right in the face knocking him out and breaking his nose and maybe more. The rest of the gang was getting more and more pissed off every second and when their leader collapsed they all jumped at Naruto in anger. Naruto merely punched the first guy, kicked the second one and let in a few punches and kicks, their punches are about as strong as a light push from Itachi. Naruto took his time beating the crap out of them, making sure to draw more blood than was necessary before finally knocking them out and or killing them. When he was finally done he turned his attention to the boy, hey you alright? He asked. The boy was still shocked that Naruto could easily defeat all those people, why why yes. TT thank why us sir. No problem, said Naruto with a smile, now come on it's time for you to go home. Naruto helped the boy back home and assured him that those people won't be bothering him for a long time. They sure as hell won't, I killed at least half of them and the rest. Well they will be in the hospital for several months. After that some will walk, others won't. Naruto felt surprisingly good after doing that. Hmm. Why do I feel so? Happy inside? Naruto brushed it off and turned in for the night. For some reason unknown to Naruto, he stayed in that village for another week. Maybe it was to watch out for the boy or maybe to relive some more memories by practicing on that field, either way Naruto found the place to be surprisingly comfortable. But all good things must come to an end and at the end of the week Naruto finally forced himself to leave and traveled around the grass for about a month. After the grass country, Naruto made his way into the lightning country. Just like with the grass, Naruto stayed in the lightning country for a month wandering all over the place. During that time he found his way to a lonely mountain, the top of which was shrouded in clouds. Naruto decided to climb on top of it again, this time I'll take the hard way Reiko was talking about. Six hours later Naruto was only about a quarter of the way up the mountain, damn I should have known when Reiko said hard he meant it. Hey wait I wonder if I could do that jutsu. Naruto then pumped more chakra into his feet and jumped slightly off the wall, adding in more chakra to achieve the desired result. Yes. I can still do it, Naruto yelled while standing on air. Too bad it only lasts for about a minute though Naruto as he quickly made his way via floating to a more comfortable climbing area. And to think it took me three weeks to learn that. It was funny how Reiko had to try it three times before he actually got it work, Naruto laughed as he remembered that day of training. Finally after another half day Naruto was finally on the summit. I remember training to fight with these clouds obstructing my vision. Actually that's when I learned to use that special ability of my eyes. Flashback Naruto is standing in torn clothing in the dense fog looking all around him trying to anticipate the upcoming attack. Reiko strikes at him and this time Naruto is at least able to block, damn it. I can't last like this. The look in his eyes when he hits me. He's just laughing at me. All these thoughts slowly, but surely angered Naruto and he had activated his demon's eyes without realizing it. Reiko struck Naruto had in the middle section once more, but this time when their eyes met Naruto's mind flashed through all of the hellish tortures that he would give Reiko. To Naruto's great surprise and shock, Reiko fell on the ground screaming and grabbing his head in pain. Naruto then sees the whip-like marks that appear on his exposed arms, what the hell? No one around here has a whip. The screaming did not last more than a minute before Reiko abruptly stopped and fell unconscious. Itachi then came up and examined him. Finding only a few non-serious physical wounds, he drew back Reiko eyelids and activated his Mangekyu. In about half a minute Itachi stood up and looked back at Naruto who now in a confused horrified look on his face. Naruto tell me exactly what happened? Said Itachi in a very serious tone. Well. 
he hit me and I guess I had already activated my demon's eyes, Naruto began explaining. So then I was really pissed off and thought back to some of Kyuubi's memories from hell and wished I could do that to Reiko. Itachi seemed to think all this over, did you maintain eye contact with him during all of this? He finally asked. Naruto thought back, yes I did, he answered. I see, Itachi said in a faraway voice. What is it, Itachi-sensei? Asked Naruto. Naruto, I want you to do that same thing you just did, to me, said Itachi. But sensei, you will get hurt like Reiko and. Naruto started protesting, but was then cut off by Itachi. Just do it. Naruto then concentrated and brought back that same anger and frustration he was feeling during his battle with Reiko. He activated his eyes and let all his raw emotions out along with the Kyuubi's memories of hell. Itachi had by now activated his Mangekyu and was staring down Naruto, but for now neither side had an advantage. Itachi then increased the effects of his technique and finally made Naruto break down. What was that? Asked Naruto uncertainly, he saw that Itachi had activated his Mangekyu yet he was able to withstand it. Naruto, it seems your eyes have an ability similar to my Mangekyu, explained Itachi. What? Really? Naruto stared wide-eyed. Yes, though yours seems to work the mind a little differently from mine. How? I'm not exactly sure, said Itachi, we'll have to do more experimentation to find out. And flashback. It took me six months to fully understand and master two levels of that technique. A mind technique that affects all levels of the mind, making any imagined injury appear on the physical body. That was what Itachi said about it, Naruto had always felt that Itachi was a bit jealous of Naruto's eyes having so much power. Of course Mangekyu had its own advantages that Naruto's hell jutsu simply could not do, so Naruto's was not an all-powerful eye. Throughout the years I have managed to get it up to level 7. There are two more levels, but anything beyond 5 is basically instant death to humans. After the merge Naruto considered himself as more of a half-demon. Also he noticed that it would really throw off his opponents to be called human during battle. Naruto stayed on the mountain until his food had run out and then finally went down and left the lightning country several days after that. What is wrong with me? It's bluntly obvious I shouldn't stay so long in a country with a hidden village, Naruto continuously scolded himself. I guess a part of me never loses hope that I might stumble upon them just once more. When Naruto was ready to leave he contemplated the idea of trying to find Kisame, but decided against it. He wouldn't want me to just be pestering him without a purpose, reasoned Naruto. Hence Naruto briefly traveled through the water country and soon found himself in the wave country. He noted that it was now quite the economical center, completely different from its ruined state just six years ago. Wow, it has been that long. Naruto couldn't suppress his curiosity and went to find Tazuna's house. Making sure he wasn't noticed as he sat in a nearby tree waiting for the family to get home. The first person he saw was Inari who was now very happy and cheerful, Naruto smiled slightly as that. Next he saw his mother, who was scolding Inari for being late. Finally Tazuna arrived tired and grumpy, as usual, thought Naruto. From what Naruto caught of the conversation, Tazuna was contracted to build a bridge for the water country and has just returned today. Hmm. My luck is improving, thought Naruto. Naruto stayed in the wave country for a week, shadowing Tazuna's family, before finally leaving. Naruto decided to avoid the fire country and instead travel by sea, he hired a man to take him to the wind country on a private boat. The voyage took three weeks during which time Naruto and the captain had become good friends. The man had found out that Naruto was a ninja when Naruto accidentally dozed off and fell overboard, but landed on top of the water. The man didn't care for that and instead took the time to get to know Naruto as if he was a regular person. They arrived to the wind a week behind schedule due to the fact that they decided to wait out a storm. They were damn glad they did too, after all the wreckage that they saw along the way. Naruto wasn't that big of a water person and was happy to finally be on land, he paid the man and went on his way. I wonder how Gara is doing? He mused while walking down one of the main roads. Especially with that civil war happening in his country. Just then his senses picked up on a fight not too far in the forest. Naruto thought it's probably some bandits again jumped toward it. For the past several months since saving that kid in the grass, Naruto had been unable to pass up a chance to help people in need. However once Naruto got to the battle scene he wished that he hadn't come. There he saw six shinobi, San most likely, fighting three other San nins that looked familiar to Naruto. Damn it. I don't want to interfere with a shinobi battle. Just then Naruto recognized one of the San nin, that's Gara. He thought, then I don't need to help them, Gara will be fine. 
Naruto stayed hidden in the tree above the battle and continued observing. His plan was ruined when two of the six San Nin used a few Uitan attack that took out the entire tree that Naruto was sitting on and managed to cut his left arm. Destroying my seat is one thing, injuring me I won't forgive. Naruto then appeared right behind the two San Nins with dual Rasengans and slammed them into their backs, drilling a hole halfway into their bodies. The comrades of the two dead San Nins were absolutely shocked that a shinobi had appeared out of nowhere and killed two of their best few Uitan users. Who the hell are you? yelled the captain of the remaining four, and why the hell did you just do that? Naruto's dead cold eyes focused on the leader, no, and because they cut me, he replied monotonously. What do you mean no? Whose side are you on, the loyalists or radicals? The leader spat out the last name. My own, simply answered Naruto. So he's a loyalist. If this gets any worse I'll probably side with Gara. At this point the leader noticed that Naruto didn't wear a forehead protector, hey what village are you from? Naruto's eyes flashed slightly, I didn't come here to get interrogated. You have no authority over me, Naruto said very forcefully. So then you must be a radical, get him, he commanded a ninja dressed in all grey. The grey ninja rushed at Naruto, but before he could even throw a punch Naruto had already grabbed his arm, touched him lightly on the chest and gave him a sideways kick that sent the ninja flying into a tree on Naruto's left. All San Nin's present were shocked to see blood pour out of the grey ninja's mouth uncontrollably and weren't very surprised when he soon fell over dead. Gara saw the shock and confusion on their faces and took this opportunity to his advantage. He made his sand wrap around the leader and lifted him up into the air. Before any of the other sand nin could comprehend, Gara said, desert funeral. Blood sprayed everywhere and the remaining two loyalist shinobi ran for their lives. Naruto then walked up to Gara, and here I was thinking you could defend yourself without my help. Gara got a bewildered and angry look on his face, we were doing absolutely fine and had already made up a plan, until you showed up. Now Gara, we should be thankful that this young man helped us out, since we were outnumbered, said Tamari gently and bowed slightly to Naruto saying a respectful thank you. Naruto chuckled slightly, it was no problem. After all I was just repaying a debt, he said with a smile. The three San Nins looked at him with confused faces, what do you mean a debt? Asked Tamari, have we met before? Meanwhile Gara was closely studying this mysterious shinobi, who managed to take out three high-level San Jounin as if they were nothing. He had a very strange feeling that he knew this person and that this person meant something to him. Naruto could tell that Gara was close to guessing who he was and decided to give him a clue, he turned stared Gara straight in the eyes and then switched them to his demonic ones and back again. Gara's eyes widened in realization, you. You couldn't be. Naruto? He asked very uncertainly. Naruto smiles, guilty as charged, he said. It's been a while, hasn't it? Gara, Tamari, and Konkuro. The three stared at him wide-eyed, he had changed so much since they last saw him. They had all heard that he was a missing nin, and since the raid on the Akatsuki they knew that he had been part of that organization. Yet here he was standing in front of them, smiling even or at least they thought it was a smile since he still wore a face mask. Do people only recognize me by my whisker marks? I mean seriously, said Naruto with a laugh. Naruto then looked around, come on, we should leave the battlefield. As they walked to the San siblings campsite the regular how are yous? Were exchanged, Naruto tried to tell them as little about his life as he could. As a missing nin you must always be wary, is what Itachi used to say. At the campsite they all sat around the fire on which a large deer was roasting. An, the wind country is an all desert, where they are right now it's a forest, Naruto broke the silence, so what's with this civil I've been hearing about? He asked. The civil war is a dispute about who the next Kaze Kage should be, explained Tamari. The loyalists want to appoint Baki, our former sensei, as the Kaze Kage. The radicals however have nominated a female cage. A female cage, I don't see the problem with that. Who would it be? Asked Naruto calmly. According to tradition in the sand, the Kaze Kage must be male. As for who the female cage is. Well they have elected me, said Tamari. Naruto raised an eyebrow. So I'm talking to the future Kaze Kage, huh? Nothing has been decided yet, said Konkuro. It's basically some old geezers who are set in their ways against the new generation, concluded Naruto simplifying it for himself. Only it isn't that simple there are other factors that one must consider, said Tamari, there's the political and the economical angle. Naruto suddenly cut her off, but this is a war. Right now there is no politics and there is no economy. It's all about who can gain control first, said Naruto. 
you will be a great cage if you are thinking of these things ahead of time, but right now you must focus on the situation at hand, and that's the war. Once you win the war, you can worry about those other factors, all you want. Tamari was shocked that Naruto had just so plainly laid everything out for her. It was true she couldn't do anything politically, economically or socially until she was in the cage position. All right, so that simply narrows our problem down to winning the war, she said with new enthusiasm. Uzumaki, Naruto, thought Gara, whenever he comes into my life he always manages to change things for the better. So what's your plan of action? Asked Naruto, so that I know where and when to stay out of your way, he clarified. Huh? Asked Tamari, you're not going to help us? Help you? No, I'm just sightseeing here. And the last thing I need is Leaf Hunter Nin knocking. No breaking down my door, he said very calmly. You don't sightsee in the desert, said Gara bluntly, you are here for another purpose. Naruto frowned slightly, well I guess I did have an ulterior motive for coming here. Everyone listened closely to what Naruto was going to say, I guess I just wanted to see Gara again and ask how he was doing. The serious air was instantly broken and an exasperated sigh was heard from Konkuro and Tamari. Naruto laughed, what did you think? I was here to assassinate some advanced bloodline or something? I'm not part of the Akatsuki anymore you know. Advanced bloodline. The sand doesn't have that many, said Gara contemplating something. And all of those are very well hidden away. Look I'm not going to hide out for a year and then jump straight into the boiling kettle, also known as the Leaf Village, without gathering some information about what's happened in the world first, explained Naruto. Why would you want go to Leaf again? Asked Gara. I have a score to settle with someone there, answered Naruto, his eyes going cold stopping the conversation right there. They ate their food in silence, but before they all went to bed, Tamari made one final request to Naruto, please Naruto-san think it over, we could really use your help with this. I really don't want to attract attention, and this isn't the most discreet of operations you know, he replied. I understand, but maybe we could keep you in the shadows somehow. Just please sleep on it and give us your answer in the morning. Naruto nodded in agreement and went to bed. After everyone had gone to sleep Naruto was up for several hours contemplating his course of action. I could keep attention of my back and stay in the shadows as Tamari said. But then again this is a war we're talking about, I would have to fight and then rumors would get around and the next thing I know I'm fighting off Hunter Nin. Naruto did still feel obligated to help out his friends, they did help him out when he was in need. You must take risks and make sacrifices for your friends, said Naruto out loud. I don't remember who said that or how many times I've heard it, but that doesn't make it any less true. And with that Naruto fell asleep. An, Gara has also merged with Shukaku and can sleep now. An, on a scale of 1 to 10, how cruel would it be if I just cut it off right there? In the morning Naruto announced his decision, saying that he will stay and help them out. Tamari thanked him, Gara didn't say anything and Konkuro was still visibly wary of traveling with Naruto. So what's the plan? Asked Naruto. Well for now we have been gathering up support and fighting off loyalist attacks, answered Konkuro. Naruto thought a little while, I see. And how are things within the village? It's chaos, constant battles between the loyalists and the radicals. Explained Tamari. But who has supposed control? Who is in the Kazekage Tower? Naruto continued questioning. The enemy holds it for now, but they don't really have control over anything else, said Gara. Well. Naruto mused, if you are able to resist them enough so that they don't have control anywhere else, then all you really need to do is capture their last bastion. You're telling us to go and attack the Kazekage Tower? Asked Konkuro incredulously. Are you trying to get us killed? Naruto chuckled, well that is the only place you don't have at least partial control over. He's right, said Tamari in a serious voice. What? Yelled Konkuro. This is the only way, continued Tamari. If we hope to gain full control we have to relieve them of control of everything. Good, you understand, said Naruto. Now to think up a plan. You said that the sand village is in chaos and that there are constant battles, right? Yes, but how would that help us? Asked Tamari. Simple, the battles are a distraction while several of our teams attack the Kazekage Tower, explained Naruto. That sounds easy enough, argued Konkuro, but they have the tower right now and they can't gain control. So what makes you think that we will be able to? They can't gain control because your leader is alive and your followers have something to fight for, said Naruto, but if either side were to lose their leader it would be weakened greatly. So you're saying we'll have to kill Baki, said Tamari. Yes, if you want control. But he was our teacher. I mean, said Tamari. 
No. You can't hold any kind of attachments to him, said Naruto darkly. He's your enemy now, nothing more, nothing less. Naruto smiled a little, if all else fails, Gara can kill him right? Gara looked at Naruto in annoyance, you know I'm not a killing machine anymore, he stated with slight anger. Aha, uh -huh, and it didn't rain blood yesterday, Naruto countered. Then noticing Gara's slightly saddened look added, hey it's alright I understand how you feel. Hell, I killed more people than you yesterday. What did you do to that third guy? Asked Gara, since to him it looked like Naruto hadn't even touched him. Naruto thought a little, oh, you mean the guy with blood pouring out of his mouth? He asked absolutely calmly. The rest nodded, I just pressed several pressure point over his chest and kicked him to a place where he can die. The San siblings were shocked at the calmness of Naruto's voice when it came to such a bloody killing. Is this what Akatsuki training is like? Wondered Tamari. He's a monster, just like Gara, thought Konkuro shaking slightly. You've changed a lot Naruto. I hope you haven't become how I was before, thought Gara. wait a second, pressure points. So you were present at the Leafs Jounen exam right before the Hyuga assassination, said Gara as more of a statement than a question. Yeah, answered Naruto, that was my easy entrance into Konoha. How'd you know? We heard from a San Nin that was there about what happened. You were there for scouting purposes, right? Asked Tamari. Naruto was slightly confused now, well yes, I did do some scouting of course, he replied uncertainly. I wasn't just gonna dash right into the Hyuga Manor. Tamari titled her head at him, but you weren't the strike team, she said. What? Asked Naruto now completely confused. You want revenge on that legendary Sanin for killing Itachi, am I right? Asked Gara. Well yay, answered Naruto slightly shocked that Gara was able to read him that well. You were Itachi's accomplice during the whole thing, he continued. Accomplice? What story are you going off of? Asked Naruto. Gara and Tamari told Naruto the official story that Tsunade cooked up about Itachi being the assassin. So that's what they did? Mused Naruto. Well no wonder I've been easily able to avoid any hunter nin. They shifted the blame. Naruto then told them the truth about the Hyuga assassination. So they covered it up for political reasons, mused Tamari. A good move for them, the alternative would have raised chaos. I guess. Anyway we should get going, said Naruto. How dare they blame everything on Itachi Ni-chan? I keep finding more and more reason to kill Jiraiya. The group of four left their campsite and began their way through the desert to the hidden sand village. They had of course encountered some resistance on the journey, but nothing they couldn't handle. Naruto had picked up a sand forehead protector from one of his kills and could now avoid questioning by any of the other radicals. It took them about two months to coordinate the attack, a month to wait for everyone to get into position and another month to wait for the perfect opportunity. Their break came when they got word of a secret meeting that was going to happen in the Kazekage Tower, all the loyalist leaders were gonna be there. They knew the fighting would be tougher, but this was a sure way to gain control. Tamari, Gara, Konkuro and Naruto were all in one team that would spill to part once they got in the tower. Gara would go with Tamari to kill Baki and Naruto would go with Konkuro to kill the rest of the leaders. They would of course have support teams, but the responsibility would rest on them. Since the meeting was going to start at midnight, the distraction teams attacked at 11.30pm. They successfully drew off all the loyalist shinobi, except those guarding the tower. At exactly midnight Tamari gave the signal to attack the Kazekage tower. Gara broke down the gate with his sand and heavy fighting ensued. Gara, Tamari, Konkuro and Naruto managed to avoid the main fighting and advanced on up the tower. They soon came up to the meeting chamber and instantly burst in. Inside they saw Baki and six other people, who instantly jumped up into fighting stances. At this point Gara and Tamari split off focusing on Baki while Naruto and Konkuro took care of everyone else. Normally Naruto would use a poison cloud, but he knew his allies had no resistance to poison so he couldn't use that. Instead he did several seals and said, Katan, Hausenka. Five fireballs flew toward Naruto's opponents, who were shocked that a San Nin could do Katan. Some dodged and those that didn't, not only got burned, but were also hit with a shuriken. Konkuro used this opportunity to attack with his Kurori and managed to capture one of his opponents while he was dodging Naruto's jutsu. Naruto then dodged and blocked some taijutsu attacks that were being thrown at him. He quickly did half a dozen seals and whispered, Raiden, electric claws, Naruto then attacked his first opponent cutting him with his right hand claws, right above his heart. The man fell down grabbing his chest as if he was having a heart attack, which he actually was. 
Naruto's other two opponents quickly charged against Naruto and one of them managed to punch Naruto in the face. However Naruto used this to his advantage and kicked one of the San Nin in the face, blocking a punch from the other San Nin he drove the claws on his left hand straight into the man's neck, once again discharging electricity from his claws. That left only one more opponent, Naruto smirked as he saw that his opponent was going to use a wind attack against him. That won't work. Thought Naruto as he quickly ran through some hand seals, Raten, short circuit. Then at the same time that the San Nin shot forward his wind attack, Naruto shot his lightning attack at the San Nin. Since the wind attack took longer to complete, Naruto's attack reached the San Nin first and electrocuted his body until he finally fell dead. Naruto just weathered the wind attack. He then looked around to see that Konkuro has also disposed of his two opponents and that Gara and Tamari were now fighting Baki. Baki used his wind attacks to keep Gara's sand away and at the same time counter Tamari's attacks. Finally Tamari saw an opportunity, right after Baki had blown back Gara's sand, and she unleashed her most powerful non-summoning attack. Baki did not have time to raise a proper defense and thrown back into the wall behind him. He got up and was about to charge it when he suddenly felt that he could not move his legs. Unknown to Baki, Gara had had his sand creeping up behind Baki and when blown back Baki just happened to land in that sand. Gara then sent more of his sand and soon Baki was inside of Gara's sand cocoon and with the words desert funeral Baki died. One month later. Naruto had helped Tamari become the Kaze Kage and crush any revolts. Tamari instantly set out to make life better for everyone in the village and within a month was liked and respected as the new Kaze Kage. Naruto was now planning to leave, since diplomatic relations would soon be coming from the other villages including the Leaf. So you're going? Asked Gara. I can't stay here said Naruto while throwing more of his belongings in his bag. Plus I still have things to do. Do you really think you can beat him? I don't know. He was able to kill Itachi, replied Naruto. You know we're not all powerful, said Gara. you should, I don't know, test yourself somehow. Test myself? mused Naruto. That's not a bad idea. I would have to find a very strong opponent though. Gara nodded. Just know that you are always welcome here, he said. Thanks Gara. Naruto gave him a quick hug, you and your siblings are really good people. Not many of those left in this world. With that Naruto disappeared from the sand, leaving Gara with a feeling that they would see each other again. While running through the desert Naruto's mind went back to what Gara said, it's true, I need to test out my powers before confronting Jiraiya. After several minutes of contemplation Naruto knew exactly who he was going to test himself against, he'll be perfect, thought Naruto with a sly grin and adjusted his course slightly eastward. Chapter 15, Battle for Power Naruto sat in a tree overlooking the entrance to the underground house. I can just smell all the snakes crawling around here. My fox side is going crazy. Naruto had quickly made his way northeast, past the fire country, into the infamous sound country. He first made his way to the sound village, but had soon found out that Orochimaru actually spent most of his time outside the village in some sort of secret lair. It didn't take Naruto long to find this secret lair, considering all he had to do all follow the smell of snakes and blood. Once he had found it, Naruto spent an extra bit of time looking for some sort of back door or alternate entrance, but had found nothing. It's going to be a pain going through the front door, but it doesn't look like I have a choice. Out of habit, Naruto decided to wait till nightfall to attack, not that it really matters since they live in darkness anyway, but this way at least I'll feel more comfortable, mused Naruto. Naruto decided not to blow up the door with a powerful jutsu, but instead opted for stealth. He snuck up to the door and simply slashed it open with his katana. He was confronted with a dark corridor, Naruto immediately activated his demon eyes, which gave him night vision. He saw that the corridor was absolutely straight and sloped downwards. Naruto quickly followed it and arrived at a door, which he once again sliced through. Inside he was confronted with three doors, what the fuck? Naruto didn't really care though and picked the right one. A giant snake leapt out at him with its mouth open. Naruto jumped out of the way, kicking the snake in the back of the head. The snake turned around and made to bite Naruto who disappeared, reappearing right behind the snake and chopped its head off. Alright, let's see what's behind door number 2, said Naruto holding his katana in a defensive position. Naruto then opened the middle door and made to defend himself, but quickly stopped himself seeing that there was nothing. Naruto shrugged slightly and went inside ending up in a large completely open room with another door on the other side. As soon as he got to the middle of the room, the door behind him shut itself and a metal's bars fell down from the ceiling in front of both doors, sealing Naruto inside. Oh joy! Though Naruto as he saw four ninjas appear out of nowhere. 
Naruto decided to entertain himself, and who might you be? He asked in a pleasant tone. We are the four sounds, they then introduced themselves as the north, south, east or west gates, but Naruto tuned out all of that and openly yawned. This seemed to piss them off as some of the scowled. The North Nin attacked Naruto head-on with Taijutsu, which Naruto had no problem blocking and had soon counterattacked with a kick to the guy's ribs, sending him into a wall. Naruto then immediately dodged a few Uatan Jutsu from the South Nin. Seeing that the West Nin was going to use a Katan Jutsu, Naruto did a dozen hand seals and when his opponent said Katan, Gukaku no Jutsu, Naruto countered with a Karyu Enden. The West Nin, being immobilized while performing his Jutsu, could not avoid the attack and got his torso heavily burned. He fell to the ground screaming in pain, but soon quieted down in death. While doing the Karyu Enden, Naruto had been distracted and was unable to block a horde of punches from the South Nin. Naruto was thrown into a wall, but his opponent made a small mistake giving Naruto a bit of time to regain his footing and was rewarded with a kick to the head, immediately followed by a knee to the kidney and a heavy punch that sent her flying back towards her teammates. Not losing even a second, Naruto did a half dozen hand seals and said Raten, chain lightning, shooting one large bolt of lightning at the still flying back South Nin. The lightning hit the South Nin as soon as she had landed and immediately broke off and hit her teammates as well. Too bad chain lightning divides the damage making each of the target only take a fraction of the actual damage. The shock from the lightning had temporarily phased the sound Nins and Naruto used this little time to teleport right next to them and chop off the North Nin's head. He was going to stab the East Nin, but he had gone to curse seal level 1 and managed to get away in time. Naruto wasted no time in immobilizing the South Nin, threw a pressure point on the neck and rendered her temporarily paralyzed from the neck down. The East Nin, meanwhile, had pulled out three bells from his pouch and threw them at Naruto who instinctively dodged. However when the bells hit the ground they made a very loud high-pitched sound that Naruto just couldn't stand. God damn, what is that? Naruto was forced to stop his attack and cover his ears. The sound Nin smirked and threw another bell right at Naruto but this one exploded right after the first bounce. Naruto was thrown back and made a dent on the wall. Naruto then put a palm on the ground and closed his eyes, as if feeling for something. The sound Nin thought that the high-pitched sound was finally breaking down Naruto, but just as he was about to finish him off with Taijutsu he found that his legs were bound. Looking down he noticed some brown and green vines, with small purple flowers snacking their way up his legs. Suddenly the flowers opened up quickly shooting out a light purple smoke. The sound Nin didn't have time to react before the he had already inhaled the smoke. He suddenly felt the world around him spin, he shook his head several times and the spinning stopped. Hmm. The poison isn't even that strong. He thought. He rushed at Naruto, but out of nowhere a giant red plant jumped out at him and made to bite his head off. The sound Nin jumped back and threw three shuriken at it. The shuriken passed right through the plant, Genjutsu. How stupid of me. He then rushed at Naruto once again and when the plant went to attack he just let it thinking it would pass straight through him. That was not the case, however, as he was swallowed up completely. He thrashed and yelled as he tried to break out of the plant, but was not even able to damage it. On the outside watched, with a smile, as the sound Nin randomly waved him arms in the air and yelled something about letting him go, ha, huh, it seems the hallucinogenic poison took effect perfectly. That combined with a little genjutsu I put on him, he's gone. Naruto immediately noticed that the bells had stopped making the noise, I was right in assuming that the bells are connected to him. Naruto then stood up and threw two throwing knives, covered with poison, at the East Nin. One of the knives hit him in the chest and the other in the stomach, he stopped thrashing around immediately and dropped dead in a minute. Naruto now focused his attention on the only remaining sound Nin. Naruto grabbed her by the throat and slammed her into a wall, is Orochimaru here? He asked in a fierce voice. Ah. Ah. Answer me. He growled. Suddenly determination flashed through her eyes, you'll never get to him. She pulled out her kunai, but before she could do anything Naruto squeezed harder and squashed her neck. I know the time limit on that paralysis a lot better than you. Thank you, that was all I needed to know, he said as he simply dropped the body. He looked over at the blocked door and smirked. Then charging up a Rasengan, he attached some chakra strings to it and used them to throw it at the wall right next to the door. The wall exploded making a hole just big enough for Naruto to walk through. Unknown to Naruto, Kabuto had been watching him since he had entered the compound. This guy is good to be able to fight off the four sounds, thought Kabuto contemplating whether he should go and fight him. Then just as Naruto was doing his lightning jutsu, the screen Kabuto was watching went black, what the? The electrical interference had knocked out the camera, 
leaving Kabuto in the dark about how the battle was progressing. Several minutes passed before Kabuto finally heard was an explosion that managed to knock out the camera in the next room. Damn it. Looks like I will have to fight him. Kabuto, what is going on? Asked Orochimaru as he walked into the control room. We have an intruder, Orochimaru-sama replied Kabuto. Then deal with him, he commanded. Yes Orochimaru-sama, said Kabuto and left. Naruto, meanwhile, found himself in a large arena-type room. The ceiling was high enough to be able to do a large summon, and it was all made out of a yellow brick that had blood sloshed all over it. This must be some sort of battle arena that Orochimaru uses for training and God knows what else. Suddenly his sense picked up another presence in the room, he turned his head and saw a figure on the opposite side. Well, well, you've made it thus far, but this will be the end of your journey, the figure said. Confident as ever, Kabuto, said Naruto coldly. Kabuto tilted his head and a small smirk grazed his lips, Naruto-kun, never though I'd see you again. You thought wrong. Or didn't think enough, sneered Naruto, but it doesn't matter, I didn't come here for you. My, my and why would you be after Orochimaru-sama? asked Kabuto. None of your damn business, snarled Naruto getting into a loose fighting stance. I've had it with this guy, he always seems to get on my nerves. Naruto-kun, why do you want to fight me? said Kabuto calmly we are so much alike. How do you figure that? We both left that horrible village, sided with the enemy and betrayed the trust out former comrades, answered Kabuto. Naruto could not find any way to argue against that, and here I am, putting myself in the righteous seat. I'm exactly like him. Betrayed people that I used to call friends, even killed some of them, and why? For what? Because I was pissed off at them, so that I could complete my mission? My own selfish gains. Naruto's resolute face expression was faltering, but his darker side kicked in once more and Naruto remembered his original purpose here, forget this shit he's feeding you. You have a different purpose here and he's just in the way. Naruto shook his head, the coldness returning to his eyes as got ready for battle. Naruto-kun, surely you remember what happened the last time we fought? Yeah I kicked your ass. When I was taking it easy on you. But this time you won't walk away, since you don't have that legendary. Naruto cut him off by throwing three shuriken at him. Kabuto dodged and attacked Naruto in close combat. Naruto dodged and blocked Kabuto's strikes and counterattack too, but was unable to get anything through Kabuto's defense. You've gotten better Naruto-kun, remarked Kabuto. And you've gotten worse, taunted Naruto. Kabuto grimaced, did a few hand seals and his hand began to glow a greenish color. Gotten worse, have I? said Kabuto and charged at Naruto. Naruto remembered that medical technique and knew what he had to do to be able to counter it. He also did several seals and thought, demonic, fire wave, however unlike regularly, Naruto made his armor be skin tight. Kabuto attacked aiming for Naruto's vital points, but was surprised when his attack didn't do anything, did he block it? Didn't look like it. He must have gathered chakra to that one vital point, concluded Kabuto. He then assaulted Naruto again aiming all over body, Naruto blocked some but wasn't really worried about the rest. Kabuto started getting frustrated and put more effort into his attacks, thus leaving himself open. Naruto did not miss the opportunity and punched Kabuto in the lower ribs and face, throwing him back slightly. How is he able to dodge my attacks? Wondered Kabuto he failed to see Naruto doing some hand seals. Doten, Spike said Naruto tapping his foot on the ground several times. Several spikes shot up from under Kabuto, who was barely able to dodge them with a few scratches on his shins. Meanwhile Naruto was already preparing to use another jutsu at the same time, Fuuatan, wind tunnel. Kabuto had enough trouble escaping from the spikes that seemed to know exactly where he was going to land and now Naruto had thrown in a wind attack. Kabuto knew that he could only dodge one of them so he opted to avoid the wind attack, just as Naruto had predicted. I knew it. That's why I didn't pump a lot of chakra into it, Naruto chuckled mentally. Naruto then disappeared, reappearing right behind Kabuto and kicked him in the stomach making him land in a wall. Before Kabuto had a chance to fall down to the ground, two earth spikes came out of the ground in front of him, curved towards him and pinned him through his thighs into the wall. Naruto walked over to Kabuto, you're wondering why your attacks were useless? He asked his struggling prisoner. Naruto then untightened his fire wave, letting all the nine chakra tails be clearly visible. This is a little shield that I cooked up for myself. Though it has some offensive abilities too. Explained Naruto calmly. He got even closer to Kabuto, his tail swinging furiously behind him. He mentally picked out Kabuto's eight critical points and aimed the tails at each one. 
Then once he was in range he pushed his tail straight through Kabuto. Blood sprayed everywhere, on Naruto's clothes, hair, and face, there was a giant puddle right beneath Naruto's feet. Naruto then released both Doden and demonic Jutsus and let what was left of Kabuto's body fall down to the ground. With a satisfied smile, Naruto licked some of the blood of his lips. Naruto-kun. I have been expecting you to come visit me, said Orochimaru in a calm voice. Naruto turned around and just glared at him. I want to make you a proposition. A proposition? You're not pissed that I just killed your personal slave? Asked Naruto. No, he served his purpose. Answered Orochimaru with a sly grin. What is this proposition of yours? Oh it's very simple. I know that you hate Konoha and you know that I hate Konoha, so I thought we'd help each other out. So he wants to use me to destroy Konoha. And he actually thinks I'll trust him? Nope sorry that won't do, simply replied Naruto. Naruto, we are exactly the same, don't you see? He said with malicious smile. We have both devoted our lives to destroying that accursed place we grew up in. That's true. A part of me does want to destroy the leaf village. Completely erasing the history of my youth. Am I running away from it? Wondered Naruto. You came here now to kill me, it was more of a statement than a question. You're obviously doing this to test yourself. Naruto's head perked up a little, Orochimaru's grin widened. Surprised that I know this, Naruto? It's easily seen actually, continued Orochimaru. And there's only one reason that could possibly be motivating you. You want to kill your childhood teacher. Just like I did, he licked his lips at the fond memory. Naruto grimaced, he's right. And afterwards I'll be liking my lips just like him. A sudden sadness washed over Naruto, all these years I've hated Orochimaru and Kabuto, but actually. I'm exactly like them. Naruto was hit hard by this revelation, what have I become? He suddenly remembered the past few months in the sand, is this why Konkuro and Tamari were wary of me? Because I reminded them of how Gara was like. Would I even hesitate to kill any of them? His thoughts went to all the people he had left behind in Konoha and he realized that he could easily kill everyone without even a second's pause. It scared him. No Orochimaru, I won't join forces with you, said Naruto forcefully. I won't be like this anymore. This part of me will die with him, and that's a promise. Naruto-kun, I could grant you unimaginable power. Orochimaru was sharply cut off. Don't tempt me with power, I have plenty of my own, said Naruto. And it had instantly managed to corrupt me, Naruto concluded sadly. Naruto-kun, you're making this difficult then. I don't need your cursed seal, I already have enough dark power. Actually more than any stupid seal could ever provide, sneered Naruto. At this Orochimaru's face darkened and the smile fell, then I shall kill you for refusing my generous gift and offer. Orochimaru then activated his Kanashibari no Jutsu, body freeze technique, and tried to stare down Naruto. However Naruto simply activated his demon eyes and glared right back. If he keeps glaring like this I'll just use hell and end it, thought Naruto, amused at the slightly surprised look on Orochimaru's face, a lot of things have changed since we fought last. Orochimaru, unsatisfied with his jutsu's result, charged at Naruto, but at the last second disappeared and instead made a fireball fly right at Naruto's back. Naruto didn't have time to dodge and took it head on, Orochimaru smirked, that is until a poof was heard and he realized that that had been a clone. Meanwhile, the real Naruto had actually witnessed the entire conversation from the shadows on the far side of the room. As soon as his clone was eliminated, he did a few quick seals and tapped his foot softly, Doden, explosion he whispered. The ground under Orochimaru rumbled lightly and exploded, sending him into a wall, but he also disappeared in a cloud of smoke. However Naruto knew exactly where he was, you smell too much like snake my friend, and foxes hate snakes. Naruto instantly used split and had the clone run straight toward Orochimaru. Orochimaru thought that he had forced Naruto to come out and so went forward to fight him. Naruto went to kick Orochimaru in the head, but he blocked counterattacking with a punch to Naruto's side. Naruto twisted his body making Orochimaru miss and used that momentum for a sideways kick. The snake Sanin saw through this and jumped back. He held his palm upwards and blew out a fireball at Naruto. Naruto had already seen this move before and knew what was going to happen, so by the time that the fireball was coming at him, Naruto's clone had already prepared a kawarimi and reappeared right behind Orochimaru punching him in the kidneys. After two punches this Orochimaru dissolved into mud and the clone was killed by a shuriken to the back. Damn it. Curse Naruto, I'll see if can find him another way then. Naruto put his palm on the wall and began creating vines, good the floor isn't thick enough to stop them, so can also track him. 
Suddenly Naruto sensed danger and barely managed to avoid a snake bite. The snake chased after Naruto, but he kept avoiding it. Naruto finally split into three clones and while the snake was distracted with the clones he doubled back, took out his katana and chopped off the snake's head. However, as soon as he had done that he received a fierce kick to the side and flew into the wall. Naruto looked up to see the Kusanagi no Tsurugi, grasscutter blade, coming out of Orochimaru's mouth, and knew he was in for a sword fight. As soon as the sword was completely out, Orochimaru then made it fly straight at Naruto, who was able to block with his own. On the next strike, Naruto not only had to block the Kusanagi, but also avoid a Doden explosion that Orochimaru had done. Shit, I can't counterattack a sword. I'll have to go straight for the controller, concluded Naruto. He then parried another attack while doing a dozen one-handed seals, Raiden, Nova. Electricity went flying in a ring around Naruto hitting everything in its path and also illuminating the entire room. So even though Orochimaru managed to dodge it by jumping over it, Naruto instantly made his position. Few Uatan, Hurricane Wind said Naruto as he directed the attack at the mid-air Orochimaru, who countered by calling his sword and using it to alter the direction of the winds, even so his left arm and right leg were cut. Unrelenting in his attack, Naruto put away his katana and did several more hand seals, few Uatan, wind tunnel. Naruto poured in more chakra than normal into the attack making sure that Orochimaru couldn't just use his sword. As soon as the beginning of the attack hit, Orochimaru realized that his sword trick won't work this time, so he quickly unsummoned it and did several hand seals, few Uatan, wind barrier, he whispered. The wind attack and defense collided nullifying each other completely. Orochimaru landed safely not far from where Naruto was standing, he immediately noticed that that last attack had taken a lot out of Naruto and seized the opportunity. He the charged Naruto and kicked him hard in the face, followed up by a kick to the gut that sent him into a wall. Before Naruto could get up a horde of punches was thrown at him, and only stopped when he began falling face forward to the ground. However at the last moment, Naruto put his hands out in front of him, pushed up and kicked Orochimaru while doing a front flip. One foot kicking him in the chest the other in the face, both throwing him back a little. While in the handstand, Naruto generated chakra to his hands, Doden, Spike and a spike appeared right under Orochimaru who barely had enough time to jump away with only a small scratch on his ankle. However he did not notice the second spike that came up right behind him until he was right now to it, Doden, Spike explosion thought Naruto while flipping himself over. The spike exploded and sent Orochimaru tumbling along the ground. Orochimaru stood up to see a giant fireball coming at him, he quickly ran through several dozen seals and said, Kushios no Jutsu, Edo Tensei. A portal appeared under his feet and out of it came a coffin. Shit. I've heard about this technique, thought Naruto, he's raising the dead and using the coffin as a shield. I sure as hell don't want to know who it's going to be. But how to stop it? Naruto had to think fast, but fortunately quickly noticed that Orochimaru was maintaining the summoning, that's it. It'll drain a bunch of chakra, but affect him directly. Naruto quickly went through quite a bit of hand seals and said Kinjutsu Katan, Lake of Fire. Naruto made the fire start right under Orochimaru and extend out over half the arena, he especially made sure that the coffin was burned. Orochimaru managed to jump up on the wall and out of the fire, but was shocked that Naruto could make fire appear out of nowhere, a kinjutsu that I do not know. Perhaps I shouldn't kill him just yet, he mused. After making sure the summoning of the dead wasn't a problem, Naruto crouched down and put his palm on the floor. He knew exactly where Orochimaru was hiding out from the fire and instantly directed his vines there making them burst straight through the wall around Orochimaru who climbed even higher to avoid them. Damn it, I can't maintain both jutsus. Curse Naruto and release the lake of fire, but put more effort into the vines directing them down to the ground knowing that Orochimaru would come down off the wall. Just as predicted, once the fire was extinguished Orochimaru jumped down off the wall and was instantly surrounded by the vines. He then decided to fight them by using a cat and jutsu to burn them, Naruto saw this and had the vines release their poison. Orochimaru saw the poison surrounding him through the fire and knew the only out was up. He knew he couldn't fly so he did the next best thing, he bit his thumb ran it down the tattoo on his arm and said Kushios no Jutsu. Orochimaru appeared on top of a mid-sized snake, which crushed all the vines. He then noticed Naruto also biting his thumb, toads are useless in enclosed areas, don't you know? Oh really? Naruto then did four hand seals and said Kushios. As the smoke was starting to clear Orochimaru could see something swaying in the back of the summoning, but figured it was just the swords. Then suddenly a loud menacing growl was heard from inside the clouds. Yes, Kichi. We're having snake tonight, said Naruto in a low voice. When the clouds finally cleared, 
there was Naruto on top of a silver fox slightly larger than Orochimaru's snake, its tail was swaying furiously behind it, you were saying something about toads. Asked Naruto sarcastically and Orochimaru scowled. Kichi did not even wait for a command and instantly jumped at the snake, which managed to avoid the claws and teeth, but was slammed into the wall by the fox's tail. The snake recovered quickly and made a strike at Kichi, which the fox easily dodged, but instantly saw the opening and clawed the snake in the lower belly. Naruto also used that opportunity to direct a dozen fireballs at Orochimaru and his snake, he quickly cage bushined them making it several hundred. Orochimaru managed to raise a barrier for himself, but the snake took the fireballs head on. It hissed in pain and lunged itself into a reckless attack against the fox. Kichi, being well trained against snakes, found the desired opening and while pining the snake down with his paw bit into its throat, then thrashed it around for a few moments making sure it was dead. Orochimaru had long since jumped down from the snake's head and watched the death of his summoning from the shadows. As soon as Naruto had unsummoned the fox, Orochimaru attacked, Doden, mud slide he said making a mud wave crash into the Doden barrier that Naruto had put up. Orochimaru did not relent there and circled around Naruto doing katan, Keru Enden. Naruto once again put up the Doden barrier, unknowingly playing right into Orochimaru's trap. Once Orochimaru saw this he made a clone, while he jumped up and over the Doden barrier. The clone did a few quick hand seals and slammed its palms into the ground saying, Doden, quicksand, and a moment later the real Orochimaru attacked from about saying, Katan, Keru Enden. Naruto found himself trapped by the quicksand jutsu, but before he could get out of it another attack rained down from above. His clothes, hair and skin were slightly burned before the finally activated his demonic technique fire wave. Thankfully Kyuubi's chakra recovered him within a minute, unfortunately as soon as he came out of the fire wave his opponent was right there ready to beat him to a pulp. Shit I'm running low on chakra, curse Naruto while dodging. Wait. Those are estimates for a series. But. What about one attack? Naruto mentally recalculated how much chakra he had available. Great. So if I can get that attack to stick and get it halfway or more, I'll be fine, Naruto prepared himself mentally and physically. Naruto managed to pause the attack by hitting Orochimaru in the stomach and throwing him back out of reach. He then quickly went through two dozen hand seals and focused the chakra to his fingertips and it soon started moving them slightly. Meanwhile, Orochimaru recovered and was ready to charge at Naruto again, but found that his limbs wouldn't move. What the hell? It's as is all my muscles are numb. Orochimaru wondered what had happened. He looked up at Naruto who was smirking. Can't move can you? He asked tauntingly, Orochimaru scowled. Now. You will feel a sharp pain in your right arm, said Naruto and twitched one finger. Instantly afterwards Orochimaru screamed out in pain as he felt as if his right arm was being burnt from the inside out. Another scream of pain came out of the snake Sanin as his left arm was now feeling the same thing. After several minutes Naruto spoke again, now that your arms are disabled. What shall I do with you? Orochimaru looked up to see that Naruto's eyes had changed to red and began to glow, he was also radiating in human amounts of killer intent. Seeing the discomfort on Orochimaru's face he continued, perhaps I should burn all your insides, finally ending with a heart. Naruto noticed the confusion and absolute fear on his opponent's face and decided to explain his technique. I simply attached chakra strings to you and using electricity numbed the places where the chakra strings are attached so that you had no idea they were there. Once attached I can send chakra through the strings, which on contact with the your skin changes into electricity and I can direct it anywhere in the your body. If shot at the brain, the nervous system will get screwed up and the person won't be able to move, as you can see right now. I call it, Kinjutsu Raten, electric wave, however there is a compliment to this jutsu, how about we try that one out? An evil look covered his face. Naruto then brought his hand forward and started closing it slowly, Orochimaru felt his chest getting hotter and hotter. Electric funeral, said Naruto evilly and tightly closed his fist. Orochimaru felt an incredible pain in the left part of his chest. Smoke soon started rising out of Orochimaru's chest, a few moments later Naruto opened his fist and Orochimaru's body fell dead, face permanently twisted in a horrifying expression. Electric funeral, directs all or most of the electricity straight to the heart or brain and that part is then fried to a crisp. Beautiful, no? Concluded Naruto with a sadistic smile. He then walked up to Orochimaru and chopped off his head putting in his bag for later, for exactly what, he wasn't sure yet. As soon as he had done that, the world blurred and he fell down unconscious from overusing his chakra. Several hours later he woke up in darkness to an unfamiliar ceiling, where the hell am I? Turning his head a little he saw the headless body of Orochimaru, oh right. Now I remember. 
thought Naruto as he slowly got up and silently thanked the QB for its regenerative capabilities. He picked up the bag with the head and made his way out the darkness of Orochimaru's lair and into the bright sunlight of the forest. Naruto looked down at the head in his bag, I should at least tell his village that they are free from him. He then regained his bearings and went off in the direction of the sound village, all the while contemplating his revenge on Jiraiya. Is it selfish of me to want to get him back for killing Itachi? Wondered Naruto. I really don't want to be like Orochimaru. Respected out of fear. I want people to respect and recognize me for who I am, not the image that I carry around. Itachi tried to carry an image not his own, mused Naruto getting angry after the last part, for that bastard with a one-track mind, who can't even take the fucking hint. Naruto growled wanting to beat the shit out of him again. He sat in on a tree branch overlooking the sound village, it looked so peaceful, kinda like the leaf. Where the hell did that come from? Wondered Naruto. Then again it wouldn't have such a bad reputation if it wasn't for Orochimaru. Well he's gone now and with him the old me. Naruto looked back out at the village, to think that an entire village could be hounded by just the cage. He looked back and forth between the bag in his hand and the sound village, dot I wonder. Chapter 16 the sound. Naruto looked out over the sound village that was illuminated by the midday sun, I wonder if this could work. He mused entertaining a certain idea in his head, I may as well give it a try. He sat there for some time contemplating how he should do this, a nice approach versus a forceful approach. Naruto then jumped off the tree and went around to the far side of the village wall and stealthily made his way over the wall, past the security and into the main stream of the village. Naruto then steadily made his way to the Odokage Tower, in the sound village no one really likes Orochimaru and would probably jump at the opportunity to replace him. Naruto remembered Itachi saying. And that is exactly what I'm going to play on, thought Naruto. Naruto walked up to the top floor and asked to see the steward saying that even though he didn't have an appointment it was very urgent business. The secretary could tell that Naruto was not joking and after clearing it with the steward showed Naruto in. Naruto walked into a large room, half of which looked like a library because of its immense amounts of books and scrolls. There was another door on the opposite side of the room, it was open and Naruto could see that inside was a large conference chamber. He looked to the right and saw a desk, which was much cleaner than he had ever seen the Hokaye's desk. Behind the desk sat a man about 50 years of age with a wrinkled face, semi-gray hair, and brown eyes containing many years of knowledge, but also heavy traces of fear. Not surprising that Orochimaru picked someone old and weak to govern for him. Manipulation by fear. It just makes this easier for me. What is this important business that you have? Asked the steward trying to sound confident. It concerns this village, said Naruto cryptically. The steward eyed Naruto suspiciously, what do you mean by that? And who are you? It is about the future leader of this village, answered Naruto simply. The old man jumped out of his chair making it fall to the floor, what? The future leader? Are you crazy? He yelled at Naruto who remained completely calm. And you never did say who you were. Actually I answered both your questions with my previous answer. The steward looked over Naruto from head to toe, you're saying that you're going to be the next Otokage? You've got to be joking me kid. The steward sneered the last word. Guards, he yelled. Naruto's face hardened a little because of that demeaning comment, he pulled out the bag from his backpack and reached into it. Just as the Anbu came into the room, Naruto pulled out Orochimaru's head for everyone to see. The steward was halfway through yelling at the guard to throw Naruto out when he caught sight of the severed head. His breath caught in his throat and he along with everyone else in the room stared at the head as if it was a wonder of the world. Several minutes passed in complete silence until Naruto finally put the head on the table with a heavy thud. The steward snapped out of his stare and went over to the table to examine the head making sure it wasn't something Jutsu created. When he was finally satisfied he went to gaping at Naruto, this kid. He. He killed that evil tyrant. Naruto sighed at the scene in front of him, seriously people don't just stand there like fish gaping at me. I expected a horde of questions and I get absolute silence. Go figure. Hey, said Naruto forcefully, can we move on to the official stuff? What do you mean by that? Asked a day's steward. I'm going to become the next leader of this village, I'm sure there's some sort of paperwork to fill out, said Naruto. The steward realized introductions haven't been done yet and stretched out his hand, I'm Yukinochi Masashi, the steward of this village. Naruto accepted the handshake, Uzumaki Naruto, the new Odokichi said with a smile. I have heard that name somewhere before, said Masashi. Naruto chuckled a little, I'm popular. In a bad way though, the last part said with sadness. At that point Masashi instantly figured out who he was talking to, you're originally from the leaf, Naruto nodded. 
Just then the Anbu captain perked up, you're that missing nin that was with Itachi during the Hyuga massacre, he stated. Sort of, but that story was a fake, the Anbu captain tilted his head in confusion, the Hokage fabricated that story for political reasons. Naruto then told them the real story, making note of the interesting cross between fear and pride. The steward then addressed Naruto in a more business-like tone, so are you serious that you're gonna become the leader of this village? In a slightly begging tone that Naruto instantly picked up on. Yes, why the sudden skepticism? Asked Naruto in curiosity. Well this village isn't in the best condition, doesn't have the best reputation, and I just thought that. But before he could finish Naruto cut him off. So you thought that I would want to take over a better village, asked Naruto with a smile on his face and the steward nodded. No this village is a lot better. This way I can shape it into anything I want. I would really hate to be the leader of a village that is so set in their ways that it takes a revolution to change anything. So you're gonna actually make changes in the village? Asked one of the younger Anbu. Naruto looked over at him silently asking for an explanation, it's just that Orochimaru would never want to do anything, but raise more people for soldiers that he would then use in his war against the leaf. Naruto nodded in understanding, well I'm not like Orochimaru. Naruto then remembered his childhood, I guess I finally attained my dream. I will never make this village like Konoha though. The Anbus were dismissed and left Naruto and Masashi to talk about political and economical things concerning the village. Naruto assured Masashi that he could easily correct the relation between them and the sand, the leaf however was a whole other issue. The conversation continued well into the night, they had dinner brought up to them and Masashi arranged for a guest bedroom to be set up, which Naruto had finally gotten to by the middle of the night. Waking up in the morning Naruto found that he was slightly happier than usual, am I looking forward to my new day job that much? He wondered with a smile. He got up to the office and saw a note of the desk, Otokage-sama, your robes have been made and are in the closet. I have relinquished my post since you are in charge now, I will come to get you for a tour of the village at 11 after which we will go to lunch. Naruto went over to the closet and looked at his new robes, good they made a veil, I don't have to wear a face mask anymore mused Naruto. After putting them on he noticed how they felt very much like the Akatsuki cloak. A tour of my village, then I'll start doing the administrative stuff. I really hope I don't have as much paperwork as the old hag, Naruto caught himself reminiscing about his days in Konoha with a smile. As promised at 11 sharp Masashi came in with several Anbu as an escort. Naruto had initially objected to the escort, but Masashi convinced him by saying that it would attract less attention to him as an individual if he went along with the customs. During the tour Naruto was introduced to many important people in the village, Naruto however was introduced as the Otokage keeping his identity a secret. The sound village for the most part was falling apart, the marketplaces were mostly deserted, grocery shops had little or no food. Most of the civilians walked around in rags. This village is really in bad condition. I have a lot of work to do, thought Naruto. They stopped in the middle of the street to talk with an Anbu team that was doing some routine checks. During the conversation a wind blew and quivered Naruto's veil, unfortunately for him there was a certain sound Chonin who had been watching him intently for some time now. When the wind blew, for an instance it revealed the three very distinct whisker masks on the new Otokage's cheek, those can only belong to one person. Naruto. The sound Chonin's expression darkened severely, that traitorous bastard. Joining forces with that snake. The killer intent radiating off the sound Chonin was small and barely noticeable to anyone except the one it counted with. Naruto immediately felt it and turned his head to see his newfound enemy. He saw a young sound Chonin staring maliciously right at him. In that moment their eyes locked and flashed with recognition of each other. Naruto blinked and opened his eyes to see the sound Chonin already running away, shit. I can't let him get away. Naruto instantly used Split to leave his clone in his place while he disappeared to chase after the Chonin. Damn it. He spotted me. If I'm caught I'm dead, thought the sound Chonin as he raced through the alleyways of the auto. I must also warn the others. Naruto has seen them all before and would most likely recognize them. But I can't do anything if I'm dead. After about a minute of running, he looked back to see if he was being pursued and that was when he caught a foot to the stomach and an elbow to the head, which sent him into a wall. Before he could even recover, both his arms were locked behind his back and he was pushed down to the ground roughly with a knee pressing into his spinal column and a kunai resting at his throat. Thought you could run away from me. Konohamaru? Asked his attacker. Konohamaru remained silent, that's alright, he continued, I know all about the don't say anything if you're captured business but that's what torture and interrogation specialists are for right? Konohamaru winced knowing what was awaiting him. Naruto forcefully stood him up, let's go 
he pulled him along back to where Naruto had left his clone. In several minutes they arrived at where the clone was still talking to the Anbu. Naruto made his clone disappear and temporarily scared the shit out the Anbu that were guarding him, until they caught sight of him coming out of the alley dragging some Chonin who he then knocked out. He walked up to the slightly confused Anbu captain, captain send this sound Chonin to the interrogator, and handed over Konohamaru's body. The captain instantly understood what was going on and disappeared with the spy. Masashi whispered to the Otokage, this will boost your public opinion. Naruto smirked slightly at that, though I'm sure he wasn't alone. Means there are more rats in my village. Throughout the rest of the tour Naruto along with Masashi and the other Anbu kept a lookout for other suspicious characters that took unnatural interest in the new Otokage and apprehended them for questioning. None of those had turned out to be spies, which was a good thing. After the tour and lunch, Naruto returned to his office and started drawing up the plans for some of the things he had planned for the village. In a few hours an Anbu walked into the Otokage's office to deliver some reports, but before he left Naruto stopped him, would you happen to know where is the spy that was caught this afternoon? Yes Otokage-sama, responded the Anbu. Naruto closed the folder in front of him and got up, where is he? The Anbu motioned for Naruto to follow him. They went down below the first floor of the Otokage tower, into the basement. There Naruto saw several interrogation rooms and cells, in one of which lay a body, which the Anbu said was the spy. Naruto acknowledged and dismissed him. As he did so another jounin in a dark red cape approached him, Greetings Otokage-sama, I am Ryaoki the head of torture and interrogations, the jounin introduced himself. Hello Ryaoki, said the Otokage, I heard you already interrogated the spy, said the Otokage as more of a question. Yes Otokage-sama, answered Ryaoki in a somewhat ashamed tone. Naruto looked at him pointedly. I have not been able to get anything out of him, explained Ryaoki, he seems to be able to take anything we throw at him. Next we are going to be using an auto-jutsu to shatter his mental resilience. Naruto walked over to the cell with Konohamaru in it, may I have several moments with him alone? He asked. Ryaoki had a slightly worried look on his face, but obliged after a slight glare from the Otokage, he handed Naruto the key and left. Naruto walked into the cell and crouched down next to Konohamaru. Long time no see, ha, huh? Konohamaru-kun? He asked in a pleasant tone, made it to Chonin already I see. Konohamaru looked up with pride and anger in eyes, what do you want, traitor? he spat out. Naruto chuckled, you're the traitor right now, he said calmly. As for the leaf, it was more like I was forced to leave. Than anything else, the last part was said with a little sadness. Forced? Bullshit. What about the Akatsuki? exclaimed Konohamaru. They helped me out until I was able to stand on my own, said Naruto, although some of the missions I would rather not have done. Like going with Itachi to kill the Hyuga? Betraying and killing your friends? Questioned Konohamaru, you'd rather not have done that? Naruto sighed, the past is not a pretty picture. The future though will be a lot better. You bastard. By a lying with that snake the future will be better? Continued Konohamaru. A lying? Laughed Naruto, why would I ally with someone weaker than me? Konohamaru's eyes widened in understanding as he finally realized that he was dealing with a real Otokage and also that Naruto was now in a very dangerous position of power. I see that you understand now, said Naruto, and I also see a little fear in your eyes, afraid of me are you Konohamaru-kun? I'll never be afraid of you, said Konohamaru forcefully. That little fear didn't disappear. You know what that means right? questioned Naruto in a deadly calm voice. Konohamaru was trying as hard as he could to project completely emotionless eyes, but couldn't. What the hell are you talking about? He snapped. Naruto gave a low chuckle, I'll explain it to you then you're afraid for your friends. Konohamaru's face pulled visibly, Naruto had hit the nail right on the head. Just as I thought, Tsunade sent an entire team instead of individual members, am I right? Asked Naruto knowing full well that he wouldn't get a response. He then stood up and gave a knowing chuckle as he was walking out. Konohamaru tried to attack him, but was very well restrained by the metal cuffs that were attached to the walls and the special jutsu binding his hands together so that he couldn't use jutsus. He yelled something at Naruto's back that sounded like they are too smart for traitorous bastards like you, but Naruto didn't care. Eventually Konohamaru slumped back down to the ground knowing that it was futile and that he and his friends would probably be executed soon, I'm still not strong enough grandpa. Naruto got back to his office and sent for Masashi, who came several minutes later. Masashi we're gonna need to organize a rat hunt, said Naruto calmly. So that spy from the leaf was not alone? No, the Hokage must have sent a team 
explained the Otokich. Any ideas on who it might be? asked Masashi. Naruto thought a little while, another guy and a girl, he said, and I would probably recognize them if I saw them. Would you like me to get you files on all the chonin we have? offered Masashi. Yes and no, replied Naruto, I would like a trusted Jounin teacher to go through the files and find anyone even slightly suspicious. Then have those files sent to me. Yes, sir. Naruto leaned back in his chair, let's hope that neither of them has gotten any information that I am the Otokage, mused Naruto, the leaf would absolutely flip out if they knew. And there's also a chance that they might use this change in management to attack in the way the village is right now, it certainly can't that kind of aggression. Something suddenly hit Naruto, oh shit. I forgot completely about that place. If Leaf Shinobi were to find it that wouldn't be very good at all. Naruto looked outside to see that the sun had already set and the moon was halfway up. Naruto decided to take his leave saying that he had some personal things to take care of and he wouldn't like to be disturbed. His secretary said she understood and bid him good luck. With that Naruto left the Otokage tower and had soon snuck out of the village. Once on the outside he quickly made his way back to Orochimaru's lair. I need to check it out and see if there is something there that I can actually use, mused Naruto while making his way into the underground compound. He made his way into the arena where he had fought Kabuto and Orochimaru, and went over to the ladder that he had seen Kabuto jump off of. He went up it and through a short corridor to find himself in a room with an operation table in the middle and a large console with many screens and keyboards on the far wall. This must be the control room. Concluded Naruto. He looked around until he found the blueprints for the compound, oh good. Now I won't be randomly wandering around this tomb. Naruto followed the blueprints and had eventually found the study, which contained scrolls about Orochimaru's techniques. God damn it. Why do most of them have to be connected to snakes? Complained Naruto, I can't use this unless I have a snake summoning contract, which I can't get one since it would conflict with my foxes. He continued to look through the scrolls until he found one that was booby-trapped, why would anyone booby-trap their own scroll? Wondered Naruto as he activated Fire Wave in preparation for opening the scroll. When Naruto did open it, a large flame shot out and would have completely burned Naruto if not for his shield, trapping it with a Karyu Endon, he really was insane, thought Naruto deactivating the shield. He opened it, his eyes widening as he read it, so this is how he did it, that sly bastard. Naruto continued reading the extra description about the technique. When he was done he rolled it up, held it for a little while before throwing it up in the air and burning it with a gukaku. That technique is the definition of necromancy, reviving the mindless dead for your own selfish purposes, mused Naruto. If those creations didn't end up mindless, I would actually consider reviving Itachi, but, Naruto sighed deeply, some things are simply not possible. Naruto ended up going through the entire compound twice making sure that there was nothing he had forgotten. However the second time, Naruto had set fire to each room. He then quickly made his way out and burned the outside of the snake lair. He sighed contently knowing that he had done the world a favor by getting rid that snake. His thoughts drifted to his village, it would seem the only use Orochimaru had for the sound village was war. Talk about an adequate leader. Naruto chuckled and leapt up into the trees heading back to the sound. Several months later. During the week after Naruto had become the Otokage there were two spies caught, Konohamaru and Moegi. Their other teammate had managed to escape, but from what they managed to get out of Moegi it seemed that he had no idea who the new Otokage was. Both spies had been allowed to live and were now permanently residing down in the dungeons. This was very quite relieving for Naruto, who wanted to rule in secret for as long as he could, from the leaf at least. After cleaning up his new homeland, Naruto went on to resolve the relations between the sound and all the villages except the sand and the leaf. He tried to keep his identity hidden to all of the villages, but some had found out, like the snow and the rain. What surprised Naruto was that they were actually happy that someone had finally been able to relieve Orochimaru of power over a ninja village and they didn't seem to care much for Naruto's image. The sand and leaf were the only ones left now, I am not going to the leaf. Not yet. The sand however would be much easier to establish connections with, mused Naruto while filtering through the papers on his desk. My ambassadors, however, have told me that it is futile. At this point Naruto realized that if he wanted to friendly relations with the sand that he would have to go there alone. He informed Masashi of his plans, left him in charge and got ready to leave. Going at a normal pace it took Naruto a week to reach the hidden sand. He simply snuck through the sand's defenses and using the same false name he had several times in the revolution he asked permission to speak with the Kazekage and was quickly allowed in. He stood in front of the Kazekage's desk, Hello Tamari. So you've come back, Naruto, she responded calmly. 
I guess you could say that. So what kind of business brings you here? She asked reading through his ambiguity. You've taken after your brother, always getting straight down to business, he commented. Well as the Kaze Kage I don't really have time to chat. Understandable, anyway the reason I'm here. Have you heard the news about the sound? If you mean that they have a new Otokage and that Orochimaru disappeared somewhere, then yes, she answered. I see, so the leaf must think the same thing. Well I can definitely use that to my advantage, contemplated Naruto. So what do you think of him? Asked Naruto, the new Otokage that is. I don't know I've never met him, she replied somewhat annoyed, he's visited all the villages besides the sand and the leaf. But I do have to say that what he has done for that village so far is really good, a definite positive change from their dark times of being rules by Orochimaru. Naruto chuckled slightly at this, well Orochimaru didn't really rule the village, he just used it for war, Tamari nodded in agreement. It's too bad that Orochimaru managed to escape though, she said angrily, I'd like to see that snake prosecuted for all the shit he's done. Well then, let me refine your story a little bit, said Naruto, Tamari tilted her head a little bit in curiosity. Orochimaru didn't just disappear, he's dead. What? Impossible, she yelled. Why wasn't this announced? This would have been great news. Why keep it a secret? She regained her composure again, how is it that you know this? She asked in a more calculating tone. Easy, I was the one that did it, replied Naruto calmly. Tamari nearly fell out of her chair, why why UK killed him? Naruto nodded. No way. She suddenly remembered Gara mentioned that Naruto left to find a suitable experiment, so this is what he meant. Also explains why the death was kept secret, only a very few people in the world could kill Orochimaru. An odd feeling stirred within Tamari and she began scrutinizing Naruto, soon noticing faint outlines of a forehead protector underneath his jacket. Suddenly it clicked and her eyes widened, you couldn't be? Naruto chuckled slyly, ever the perceptive one, Tamari, he reached under his jacket and pulled out his sound forehead protector and tried it around his arm, there it's official. Tamari just gaped at him, this guy was able to take over a village in a few months. I knew that most people in the sound hated Orochimaru, but this is amazing. Naruto waited patiently for her to come out of her trance, listen Tamari, you were right I didn't come here to just chit chat, said Naruto in a business tone. You want to restore peace between the sound and the sand, right? Asked Tamari. Yes, replied Naruto, but just to clarify I only want peace, no alliances or anything yet. The sound is not ready for those kinds of things yet. Tamari nodded in approval and they soon had the treaty signed and finalized. I would like to ask one last favor before I leave, said Naruto to Tamari. What is it? She asked curiously. Please keep the Otokage's identity a secret, especially from the leaf. Tamari blinked, is he this paranoid about people knowing? Well he technically is still a missing nin. She contemplated for a few seconds. All right Otokage Dono, your secret is safe with me, she answered with a smile. Thank you Kazekage Dono, replied the Otokage. He bade goodbye to Tamari, Gara and Konkuro and once again left the sand village on his track to the sound country. That guy is really something isn't he? Asked Tamari. Yay! Replied Gara. he did always seem like the type of person that would achieve his dreams. Though I wonder if he will ever be able to make peace with the leaf. I'm sure he will try his best, said Tamari and walked back into her office. Back in the sound village. Naruto was sitting in his office with the three newly written and sealed letters in front of him, waiting for the teams of Anbu to arrive. This is a difficult and tedious journey I'm sending them on. But somehow I feel like I owe this. The first Anbu team walked in at that moment. You requested to see us Orokage-sama? Asked the captain. Yes, replied Naruto calmly, I have an assignment for you, he handed the captain a letter. You are to deliver this letter to a certain person, who lives on some island below the mist country meaning we have to find him too? Asked the captain. Yes, and before you ask his name is Hoshigaki Kisame, the Anbu were shocked. I trust you know who I'm talking about then, said Naruto. Yes, but why do we have to deliver something to a missing nin? Asked another Anbu member. Naruto's face hardened, I give the orders. My reasons are classified, he said sternly. Yes sir, said the Anbu member in a shaky voice. One more thing when you find him. Do not engage him in combat in any way. Not even any potential hostility. Got it? Yes Otokage-sama, said the captain. Good, I don't want any of my shinobi to come back in boxes, said Naruto coldly. You're dismissed. The Anbu instantly disappeared. Well that's one. Though Naruto, 
the others are much harder. Two more Anbu teams came up to see the Odokage and were also given assignments to find and deliver a letter, to Reiko and Mia. These teams however weren't given a location to search in, but more like possible places where these people could be. They were told to check in every two to three months for updates and were of course given the same warning. Kisame won't be that hard to find, speculated Naruto, the others. If they find anyone it'll probably be Reiko. Naruto stopped his train of thought and went back to his paperwork, there was still much to be done in the village. It wasn't until two months later that his first Anbu team returned with a figure cloaked completely in black with a hood and a bandaged sword on its back. Naruto dismissed the Anbu telling them to take some time off from work. Greeting Kisame-sensei, said Naruto. The figure took off his hood and the top half of Kisame's head was clearly seen the bottom still covered by the cloak, but Naruto could tell that he was smiling, long time no see Naruto, replied Kisame, Naruto nodded with a smile. Welcome to my humble home, said Naruto motioning to his office. Kisame chuckled, I had heard that Orochimaru was overthrown and there was a new Otokage, but honestly didn't expect it to be you. Well that wasn't my initial plan. Naruto went on to explain what had happened with Orochimaru. I see, said Kisame, you're not going to use this village for your revenge are you? Hell no. Good. Itachi wasn't that big on revenge anyway, you know? Asked Kisame and Naruto nodded. So what is it that you wanted to talk to me about? How would you like to become a shinobi of this village? Asked Naruto. Kisame's eyes widened a little bit, and why would a missing nin like me want to become a proper shinobi again? Naruto smirked, because then you wouldn't be hunted anymore. Not to mention that you probably didn't like all that peaceful living you were doing. Actually it was really nice, no one hunting you. You can sit back and enjoy the finer things in life, said Kisame. You hated it. Kisame turned his head away slightly, you're just like Itachi. Yeah, it seems he did a good job teaching me to read people, said a smiling Naruto. Kisame grumbled, I'll think about your offer. Of course, didn't expect you to make up your mind instantly, replied Naruto. A room has already been prepared for you. Come on I'll show you, Naruto walked him over to the Otokage's house, where three guest bedrooms had been prepared. Pick one and then we'll go to lunch, said Naruto. The rest of the day Naruto and Kisame walked around the village catching up on old times and Naruto talking about the future of the village. By the end of the night, Naruto had convinced Kisame to stay in the village and he promised to arrange for an apartment for Kisame first thing in the morning. The next morning Naruto called Kisame into his office, could I ask a favor of you Kisame? Well I am a shinobi under your control you know, replied Kisame. I'll always see as a friend not a subordinate, said Naruto. Kisame smirked, fine, fine I'll do you a favor. Alright, I need you to catch up to an Anbu team that is currently in the rain country and lead them on their search for Reiko. Are you trying to have some Akatsuki reunion or something? Asked Kisame. Naruto laughed, not really. It's just that I think that now I have something to offer, and you guys have done much for me, so. Ah stop it kid, you're gonna make me cry, he said wiping an invisible tear of his face. Naruto waved his hand at him, aw shut up, he yelled. Anyway will you do it? Yay. I'm actually kind of excited to meet up with those guys again, said Kisame in a fake nostalgic voice. Naruto laughed and handed Kisame a map of the Anbu team's location, he took it and disappeared. For about six months all the reports coming in were negative, not surprising Naruto much since he knew how well these two could fall off the face of the earth. What really surprised him was that Kisame's team had missed their last report, were they all killed or something? Wondered Naruto, then mentally scolded himself for such pessimism. No, there is probably a good reason for this, he concluded. There was a knock at the door and a Chonin entered the office saying that they just received a report that Anbu Beta team was returning and that they would be back here sometime tomorrow. Naruto thanked him for the information and dismissed him, so they found him. Or I guess it could be her, but that's doubtful. The next afternoon, Naruto was going through several papers about the new teachings that would be implemented in the academy and comparing some statistics sheets from different Janan teams. He stopped sensing two presences in the room, one in front of him the other behind. He quickly did a single hand seal and teleported across the room all the while analyzing the very faint chakra signatures, these are so familiar. Wait the slightly stronger one is Kisame. So that means. He quickly did a dozen hand seals, crystallization, he said. Chakra rippled outwards from him and outlined the two people in the room. Still on your feet Naruto, said a feminine voice. I have to be, especially against people like you, he countered with a grin. Both figures disabled their jutsu, 
clearly revealing Kisame and Mia. Naruto smiled, nice to see you again Mia, he said in a pleasant voice, hope Kisame and the Anbu didn't give you too hard of a time. Yay, yay you're lucky I didn't kill them all, she smirked. Humphrey, but you like to think things through before engaging the enemy, remarked Naruto. True, and when I saw that Kisame was actually leading the Anbu, I decided to find out what was really happening. So what the hell did you drag me all the way out here for? A little proposition, said Naruto. Let me guess, you want to become a shinobi of this village? Inquired Mia as more of a statement. Naruto laughed, you've already known that since they started dragging you here, so what is your answer? You know me too well, you know that? She said somewhat sternly. I'm sure I'm not signing my death warrant yet, countered Naruto, though by accepting you could get your death warrant nullified. What's the difference? I can keep hiding out like I've been doing for the past few years. I know I can't convince you to make a decision, so I'm gonna give you some time to think it over, said Naruto calmly. There has already been a room prepared for you in the Otokage's guest house. Oh yes and Kisame, Naruto took out something from his desk and threw it at him, these are the keys to your apartment. Thanks, but where is it? Asked Kisame catching the keys. Don't worry I'll have some chonin show you, replied Naruto yelling for a messenger. Within a minute a chonin came in and after several words with the Otokage, he walked over to Kisame and asked him to follow. Once they were gone, Naruto turned back to Mia, so Nei chan want a tour of the village? He asked in a sweet voice. She quickly hit Naruto on the head, I thought you learned better, Naruto shrugged, anyway I would like a tour of the village, but not by some random shinobi who I don't know and might wish to kill. Naruto chuckled, of course not, if I gave Kisame a personal tour you'll at least get that. Mia narrowed her eyes, I see how it is. And you expect me to stay in this village. Naruto merely smirked, give me a few minutes to finish this stuff and I'll show you to the guest house and then we'll go on the tour, he sat back down at his desk and went back to his papers. Mia looked at him curiously, what are those for? She inquired. New methods we're implementing in the academy, said Naruto without looking up. Mia came up behind him and looked over his shoulder, teaching academy students proper chakra control before they become Janan, she said, interesting tactic, I must say. You remember the academy? Asked Naruto and Mia nodded. Well did that history and studying ever help you in the real world? Yeah I understand what you mean, she said with a smile. So you see, the kids lose over four years of potential training time, explained the Otokage, and for what? To learn about some lords that have been dead for several centuries or about how a kunai or shuriken would theoretically fly in a given situation, Mia chuckled remembering her childhood. That kind of stuff you get by experience in the field not by sitting until your ass is numb in a classroom, Mia laughed at the last part and Naruto grinned. You might actually have some sense in this, she said jokingly. Naruto laughed it off and showed her to the guest house and later took her for a tour and dinner. During the next couple of days Mia often visited Naruto in his office, mostly to watch how he was handling his new position of power. Naruto found the company quite pleasant and liked being able to talk over some issues with her. Occasionally Jounin and Chonin would walk in to bring reports, most of which Naruto would simply skim and put into a pile on his desk. However this latest report caught his eye, Hey Mia, he called. What is it? She asked getting up from the couch. Do you happen to know where Reiko is? You're searching for him too? Yay. As Kisame said we are having a reunion replied Naruto. Mia chuckled a little, well that's gonna be a little impossible, she said. What do you mean? Asked Naruto seriously. Before you even think it, no he's not dead, Naruto visibly relaxed. He's just left the ninja world. What do you mean by that? Naruto was confused. He went home. She replied. Went home? Asked Naruto, he's from the lightning country, isn't he? Well actually no he isn't, Naruto tilted his head in confusion. He's actually from some village west of the ninja world, explained Mia, he said that when he was an infant, his village was the location of a battle between some shinobi of the cloud and stone and that it was completely destroyed. His mother had managed to save herself and him, and the cloud nins took them to the lightning country. So he went back there, huh? Asked Naruto. Yeah, he said that in a city near his village, he might some relatives. She answered. Going back to find family. I really wish him luck, said Naruto with a far away look on his face. Yay, said Mia uncertainly, so there's no real way to find him now. Naruto looked intently at her, you know you could have told me that earlier, he said with disappointment. Well I'm sorry, she replied sarcastically. 
Naruto quickly wrote a response to the report and called in a Jounin, I need you to deliver this to the Anbu team, he commanded. The Jounin bowed and disappeared in a cloud of smoke, Naruto went back to looking at Mia intently. Hey you know I've always wondered, he said curiously, what had happened with the Akatsuki? You mean how did the stone know where to go? Clarified Mia and Naruto nodded. Well you see back then we, Reiko and I, were given orders to kill you. Naruto's eyes widened, kill me? Why? Because as far the Akatsuki knew you had betrayed them, which wasn't that far from the truth was it? Naruto shrugged. Well anyway. They were so pissed off that Reiko and I didn't dare cross them. Once on the outside though, we agreed that we didn't want to kill you. But you couldn't just tell management that, so you figured out a creative way out of the Akatsuki? Precisely, said Mia her almost glowing. We figured that if the Akatsuki were gone then we wouldn't have to do anything. So we accidentally dropped the map of the Akatsuki lair in the Tsuchikage's office. And the rest is history, as they say, she concluded. So then you just hid out for the next two and a half years? Inquired Naruto. We traveled together for six months. Finally splitting up in the lightning country after Reiko visited his late mother, the last part was said with slight sadness. After that he decided to leave and I went into the mist country for a little over half a year. Ah. I see how it was, said Naruto happy to have finally received closure about that one issue. So what did you think of Orochimaru? Asked Mia casually. Strong, but not too bad, replied Naruto, then again he had a bad tendency of arrogance and underestimating people, so perhaps fighting Jiraiya would be harder. Mia nodded, every opponent is different, there is no one universal key to a battle, she said matter-of-factly. Yay, you taught me that, said Naruto, though Jiraiya isn't my top priority right now. And what is? Questioned Mia knowing full well what the response would be. This village, replied Naruto in a serious voice. I guess if the opportunity came along I would take it, but to actually go out looking for him. No I simply don't have time or desire. I'm very glad to hear that she said with a smile. So when are you leaving? He asked looking over a mission report. Huh? She asked confused, what do you mean? Naruto looked up, when are you leaving the village? You're not gonna stay here. Like you said it's not your style. Mia smirked, well, I thought I taught you that styles change, she said with a glint in her eyes. Naruto looked at her completely surprised, you're actually staying? She nodded, the world must have frozen over, he mumbled. Hey! She hit him in the shoulder, or am I not welcome here? She spat out jokingly. Naruto laughed and said, no, no you're more or less welcome here. She pouted, well then I guess I'll go back to my room, since I'm so not wanted here, she said and walked off. Naruto chuckled a little, she's still the same as when I first got to know her. His eyes glazed over thinking about the past. Five months had passed since both former Akatsuki members joined the Sound Village, both being right under Naruto in power and authority all had been well except for the past month or so, something had been stirring in Konoha and even their top spies had no idea what it was. However staying in the darkness was not acceptable for Naruto and two weeks ago he had finally sent her in. Mia was, to put simply, the best when it came to espionage. Naruto knew that, unlike with his other spies, he wouldn't get regular updates, but rather receive the complete story when she returned. So he waited patiently, knowing full well that Konoha's secrets were very hard to get to and would definitely require a bit of time. Over the last year the auto had attracted much attention from many ninja villages. Several smaller ninja villages, even wanted to draw up alliances with them. Naruto was pleased, that his village was becoming economically stable and was attracting a lot more future shinobi than it had ever during its years under Orochimaru. This of course had been frightening most people in Konoha, some even said that Orochimaru was still leading it but just disguising himself in a different body. The Sanin had completely denied this, saying that the new Odokage's character was completely unlike that of Orochimaru. But Konoha has always needed a scapegoat for their problems and now, even though the Otto wasn't doing anything direct against them they still blamed them. However the Otto wasn't all that innocent, Naruto had specially arranged so that businesses were given better rates in the Otto than in the Leaf, but he was in no way planning any kind of military action against the Leaf. Naruto pondered all of this while standing on top of the Odokage tower overlooking his village. He felt a presence behind him and stiffened a little, old habits die hard, but relaxed when he realized who it was. She walked up and stood right next to him to watch as the sun set behind the fortified wall. Once it was dark she finally spoke, as the sun sets on the sound, the black moon arises shining in its own light. Naruto grimaced, black moon. He thought. 
It was an Akatsuki codename for bad or troubling information, however usually these black moons did not shine. What Mia had really said was do you want the good news or the bad news, first? Light, answered Naruto. Humphrey. It has nothing to do with the auto, she replied, or any other village for that matter. An internal affair? Wondered Naruto, to attract so much attention and still be kept a highly confidential secret? Now he was really interested. How full is it? He asked, sticking to the Akatsuki terminology, where a crescent was horrible and full wasn't that bad. Thin crescent. For you. She answered. And the group? Half, as can be seen through the clouds. Naruto sighed a low growl, we need a better place to talk, he left heading to his office, Mia following not far behind. They both sat down on the couch, Naruto looking intently at her waiting for the explanation. The whole commotion is about a scroll, she finally said. A scroll? Asked Naruto in annoyance, they've been raising hell for a scroll? She continued with something that immediately caught Naruto's attention, not just any scroll, but the scroll that the Yondame left. She paused for effect. For his son. He left me a scroll? Yelled Naruto jumping up. Yes, but that's not all. Naruto sat down to listen once more, since you are a traitor and there is no way to reach you, some have been saying that they don't want the Yondaime's legacy to die and want to open the scroll. They want to what? Naruto growled. The Hokage has been able to keep them at bay so far, stating that it would be an invasion of privacy of one of Konoha's greatest heroes and also slightly mentioning that it had a very strong blood seal on it, Mia continued explaining. I wonder what is inside? He mused out loud. I don't know, she said in a disappointed tone. I wanted to steal it for you, but I didn't even get a glimpse of its hiding place. It seems the Hokage really doesn't want it seen, much less opened. Hmm. I need to get my hands on that scroll, somehow mused Naruto. I guess you could always trade, offered Mia. Trade? Asked Naruto, what do I have to trade that Konoha would want? How about the Sandaime's grandson? Who is still down in your dungeon, suggested Mia, or that other girl. Huh. I completely forgot about them said Naruto. The only problem is that they know who I am. They're going to have to come out sooner or later you know that right? Naruto nodded reluctantly. I'm actually surprised you could hold out one year. Yeah, me too, said Naruto, his mind obviously preoccupied with a different matter. Anyway. I'll leave you to your thoughts and go to the hot springs, she waved goodbye, which Naruto returned only by autopilot. It's true that I can't hide the Otokage's identity forever and trading Konohamaru for that scroll would work. But I can't have them finding out from him that I'm the Otokage. Naruto contemplated on the best plan of action. In the end he could only come up with one thing, I will have to meet with Tsunade, alone, and negotiate all this out. Naruto concluded. Knowing that he could not meet her in Konoha, it meant that he would have to arrange a special meeting place. He sat down at his desk and began writing in a scroll, which he later gave to a Jounin to secretly deliver it to an auto spy in Konoha. The spy would then make sure that it somehow ended up on Tsunade's desk. In the scroll was named a location where to leave the reply. A week later Kisame brought Naruto the reply, it said. Uzumaki. I will meet with you and you alone at exactly 9am on the specified date in the specified place. God I'm Hokage. So she's making this formal. I really doubt she will come alone though. Thought Naruto. Are you going to meet with her? Asked Kisame. Yes. She will not come alone, you realize? Of course. You should also have someone accompany you then, offered Kisame. It's alright, I'll be fine, Naruto went to leave, but Kisame grabbed him by the arm. You know I'm not just doing this because you're the Otokage, I'm worried about you as a friend, Naruto nodded and Kisame continued, and as a friend, I'm advising you not to go into this potential death trap alone. Naruto was very reluctant, alright look, here's what I want you to do. Two days later. Naruto was standing at the edge of the forest looking out over a mead-sized clearing. On the other side another figure was standing, also near the forest. As if by clockwork, both Naruto and the other figure started walking towards each other at the same time, finally coming to a stop leaving 15 feet between them. Long time no see Tsunade, said Naruto. Likewise. Naruto, answered Tsunade. You look a little older, your genjutsu must be slipping, he commented. Age takes its toll on everything, she countered. True, very true. Since here we are, on opposite sides, facing each other. What happened Naruto? Inquired Tsunade. I will talk, but first. 
he sniffed the air, could you please have your escort come out? The shock became even more clearly written on Tsunade's face as Naruto said their names, Jiraiya, Sasuke, Sakura, and Hinata. Chapter 17, The Meeting Don't look so amazed, said Naruto, I was trained to detect Anbu and Hunter Nin. It was essential for my survival. Tsunade could understand that he would detect Sasuke, Sakura, and Hinata, but for him to detect Jiraiya that was really surprising. Well, come on out, yelled Naruto looking at four distinct places in the forest behind Tsunade. Tsunade gave a silent signal and the four named nins walked out and stood behind her. Naruto's eyes glistened, so we meet once more, he said cheerfully. Sasuke scowled, Sakura and Hinata tensed, and Tsunade and Jiraiya remained completely calm. Silence passed in the group. Naruto's eyes slowly shifted from one leaf nin to another, examining them closely. Tsunade looked practically the same perhaps, though somewhat older. Age catches everyone. Jiraiya was definitely older and seemed to be fighting hard not to slouch. He is definitely weakened. Sasuke was wearing Anbu combat gear through which one could easily see that he was more muscularly developed, Naruto also noted that his chakra was larger. So he's grown since our last meeting. Sakura and Hinata were both wearing jounin vests that were noticeably stocked with weapons and scrolls, they both held an aura of self-confidence and much greater chakra reserve than last he saw them. They seemed to be ready for battle. Not a bad precaution. What's up with the mask? Asked Sasuke breaking the silence, you think you're fooling anyone, Dobi? Naruto simply ignored the nickname and chuckled, I thought you'd recognize me better by the image you saw three years ago versus eight years ago, he simply stated, among other reasons. We all know it's you, yelled Sakura with slight hatred. Fine. Naruto slowly took off his mask to reveal much thicker whisker marks, but most shocking of all, two fangs protruding between him lips. You like what you see? Asked Naruto sarcastically, all five leaf nin gaped at him. Naruto, why? Asked Tsunade in a caring tone. Why what? Asked Naruto, why did I run away? Why did I join the Akatsuki? Tsunade and Sakura gasped. Why did I come back three years ago and raise hell? Tsunade nodded dumbly, still shocked at the Akatsuki comment. Well let's start off, I'm pretty damn sure you know exactly why I ran away, said Naruto sternly. Tsunade and Jiraiya both got a saddened look on their faces, seems what Itachi said was true. Thought Jiraiya. Then why join with the Akatsuki? Said Sasuke in obvious anger. Naruto shifted his eyes to meet the Uchiha's, you mean, why did I ally with your brother? Sasuke's anger flared up and his Sharingan activated. Naruto laughed, I'll take that as a yes. You damn traitor, yelled Sasuke. Much like you, countered Naruto and Sasuke scowled. I changed. I'll never be like Itachi, said Sasuke forcefully. Damn right you'll never be like Itachi Ni-chan. Naruto shrugged, anyway I joined them because they were strong, they could train me, explained Naruto. Jiraiya was about to interrupt but was cut off and also because he recommended it. Naruto gently tapped his stomach and smirked at the shock on Tsunade and Jiraiya's faces, the rest just looked around confused. Naruto, are you still in the Akatsuki? Asked Sakura in a much more timid voice than before. Naruto sighed, the Akatsuki was destroyed six months after the Hyuga assassination, said Naruto slightly annoyed. I know that, she yelled, but are you still with them? Alright, you're asking whether or not I still travel with the former Akatsuki members? Sakura nodded, I will not answer that, Naruto concluded simply. What? yelled Sakura. I will not tell you where they are. That's not what I'm asking. She started saying, but was cut off by Jiraiya. He knows that if he answers, he'll be giving out information about them, which may possibly lead Hunter Nin to them, explained Jiraiya and Naruto nodded. But what are your relations to these former members? Naruto smirked, they are good friends of mine. They should watch out said Sasuke, with how you treat your friends. Ah, you're talking about the Jounin exam, said Naruto. Well, whoever said Kiba and Ino were my friends? He asked in a cold tone visibly shocking Sakura and Hinata. Naruto, this isn't like you, said Tsunade, what did the Akatsuki do to you? Not like me, huh? He thought a moment, you mean, it's not unlike my happiness mask, to hate most everyone in Konoha? he said with absolutely cold eyes, which startled the younger nins. I thought so, mumbled Tsunade, I'm sorry I wasn't able to help you, Naruto. That one time when he was able to do the Rasengan, he felt like another person, thought Jiraiya, my instincts were right. While training in the Akatsuki, 
I was able to drop my mask and I guess you could say, I became cold-hearted, said Naruto with absolute calmness. Naruto, did you ever kill anyone from Konoha? asked Tsunade. Naruto laughed, I didn't discriminate, I killed everyone, answered Naruto. Any Anbu of Hunter Nin that crossed my path, from any country. Survival was the only thing that mattered in those times. You're a murderer. Accused Sasuke. I'm survivor. Countered Naruto, can you take on a team of Anbu or Hunter Nin by yourself? Huh? Questioned Naruto forcefully. You, with your fancy Anbu gear, can you take on your whole squad and win? Especially if you're fighting to the death. Naruto started raising voice. You're still that seven-year-old kid trying to impress his parents, said Naruto in a loud, but cold voice, Sasuke's eyes instantly went into his fully developed Sharingan. What's with the eyes? You think just because you have Mangekyu I'm gonna be scared of you? All the leaf nin looked over at Sasuke in surprise. Sasuke was shocked, H how did you know? He asked. Naruto scoffed, I spent five years with the best user of the Mangekyu, you think I can't tell? Best user. I'll show you, yelled Sasuke as he started activating his Mangekyu. Yes, show me, Sasuke-kun, said Naruto while calmly activating his demon's eyes preparing to use hell. Sasuke had activated Mangekyu and was trying to use Tsukiyomi, but found that Naruto wasn't even budging. Sasuke got angry and pumped more chakra into his eyes attempting to increase the effects, but Naruto was still calmly looking at him with those red eyes. Just when he thought he was getting somewhere, his world suddenly started getting blurry and become slightly reddish. He soon lost his balance and fell to one knee, deactivating the Sharingan. Everyone looked on in amazement as Naruto chuckled after somehow surviving a Mangekyu attack. Naruto, how did you? I can't even do that, wondered Jiraiya. He has grown quite a bit, concluded Tsunade, the scariest part being that he's most likely not even showing a quarter. Naruto, you hurt Sasuke-kun again, but you're definitely not the same person I remember. Naruto. Strong as ever. But why did you use power like that? He not a thought, caught between admiration and hatred. Not bad, Sasuke, said Naruto. A level 2 Mangekyu from a non-existent, in three years. Level 2? What the hell are you talking about? Asked Sasuke still recovering. There are several levels for the Mangekyu, explained Naruto, you have the second, your brother had the fifth. Sasuke got a thoughtful look for a second, but how were you able to resist it? He proceeded to ask. Naruto chuckled and met Sasuke's non-Sharingan eyes with his demon's eyes and used only a second's worth of hell level 1 on Sasuke, causing him to become dizzy again and fall onto his side. My own jutsu can resist Mangekyu up to level 4, he said calmly. Demons are helpful beings you know? He said with a smile that made a shiver run up Tsunade and Jiraiya's spine. Sakura was instantly by Sasuke's side trying to find out what was wrong, Sasuke-kun, are you alright? What happened? You're not hurt, are you? She asked in a quick series of questions, which almost blended into one. Naruto deactivated his demon eyes and shook his head in disapproval, still the same old Sakura I see, he said, Sasuke-kun this, Sasuke-kun that. You know how much that drove me up the wall? He growled. Sakura looked up at his with angry eyes, at least I care for my friends. She half yelled. Humphrey, so I suppose I wasn't your friend, is that right? Sakura immediately adopted a sad, regretful look when she remembered how she treated him. Who am I to talk about caring for friends? She thought sadly. She then remembered something, but he shouldn't be talking like that either, she thought angrily. What about Hinata? She was your friend and look what you did to her? She yelled at Naruto. Naruto looked over at Hinata with slight regret in his eyes, I used her and ruined her life for a selfish reason. He mused, but then remembered something. Humphrey, her family was a bunch of assholes anyway. They were still my family, yelled Hinata. I would never have wished death upon them. Then, I am sorry, he bowed, but it was my mission. Orders. I'm sure you understand how that works. Orders? You did it all just to complete a mission? Asked Hinata frantically, he nodded. Even. Even. She looked down at the ground and her voice lost its intensity, I didn't really mean anything to you, did I? Naruto sighed, if you're referring to some of the things I said before the assassination, then no, I did not mean half of what I said. He answered bluntly, confirming her worst fears. The truth is, I overheard you on talking on the wall and decided to seize the opportunity and end the mission. I felt bad for my actions, so once I was inside the Hyuga Manor, I spared your life by knocking you out instead of killing you. 
Hinata shook, her worst nightmares were coming true right in front of her. He did not love her, she had been used, just like the surviving Hyuga had told her. After all this time of believing that Naruto-kun was still the same kind-hearted, loving Janan and her memories, she was proven wrong. Love turned to anger, fury and hatred. Naruto, she growled, you truly are a demon like I've heard people say in the village. I didn't want to believe it, I loved you. Hinata was yelling now. I never believed anything the villagers said about you, but it looks like they were right. In the end. She looked up at him with angry eyes, from which poured tears of heartbreak. Sakura suddenly realized that Hinata was right, she had also heard the villagers call Naruto a demon, why did they call you that, Naruto? How did they know you were so cold-hearted? Naruto looked at Tsunade incredulously, you mean you didn't tell the children that favorite bedtime story that I grew up with? Sasuke, Sakura and Hinata looked at Tsunade questioningly, she simply answered no. Well then I'm going to have to remedy that, Naruto said calmly. Naruto, are you sure you want to do this? Asked Jiraiya concerned that the current level of tension would get even worse. Of course, Jiraiya, I'm completely comfortable with it. Replied Naruto. He's actually going to tell them the secret. Thought Tsunade in amazement. Well then, once upon a time there lived the great Yondaime Hokage. Started Naruto. Sakura blinked, why is he starting the story there? Could he? He lived a nice peaceful village called Konoha, that is, until a great fox demon appeared, the Kyubi. Now truth be told, Kyubi had just awoken from a thousand year sleep and what does he find right in the middle of his territory? A village. Full of people that attempt to control some of the elements and attack him as soon as they see him. Naruto paused to judge the reactions. Sasuke, Sakura and Hinata are shocked of course. Soon they'll be even more shocked. Tsunade and Jiraiya seem kind of interested in the Kyubi's perspective on this fine tale, but disbelief is also apparent. So he did the same thing you would do if you found a stranger in your house, he attacked. Now, several days of battle passed, the body count kept rising, so finally the Yondaime Hokage appeared on top of Game Abunta and engaged the Kyubi. After quite a struggle, the Yondaime started the sealing technique, Shiki Fuujin. He ended up ripping the Kyubi's soul out of its body and sealing it into a newborn child. Any guesses on who that might be? Asked Naruto upon finishing his story. Shock, disbelief, and anger mixed with jealousy were on Sakura, Hinata and Sasuke's faces, respectively. Naruto, you? Sakura couldn't formulate a proper question. Naruto nodded in response. No way. She trailed off. Naruto, so this is where you got all you power, Sasuke stated. And you told me never to rely on my cursed seal, you goddamn hypocrite, he yelled. Naruto sighed sadly, those were different times, Sasuke, I was still trying to live in an ideal world, which didn't hate me. Explained Naruto. Naruto, we never hated you, said Tsunade. By we you mean, you, Jiraiya, Iruka, and Hinata, he stated. No, sorry, those odds are too small for me to like the village as a whole, Tsunade sighed regretfully. So that is how you were able to beat me eight years ago, said Sasuke, and you used the same power three years ago. Naruto nodded slowly not really understanding where the Uchiha was getting with this. I will kill you, he yelled. Tsunade gave Sasuke a very harsh look, what the hell do you think you're saying? He's a traitor and a murderer, replied Sasuke, I will get my revenge. Are you stupid? yelled Jiraiya, do you want to turn him into an enemy? He already is, countered Sasuke. Ku ku ku, for who are you doing it, Sasuke? asked Naruto, completely calm. I know you didn't care for any of the Hyuga, so for who? Kiba? Ino? Or just because? For Lee, he answered. What? inquired Naruto completely confused, just because I beat him? He's dead because of you, yelled Sasuke. Naruto looked over at the others in confusion, their expressions only confirmed Sasuke's words. No. That's impossible, said Naruto slowly, that attack doesn't kill. How do you figure? asked Tsunade. Well the technique just knocks the person out, explained Naruto. Well for Lee, it was combined with a paralysis technique that took out his lower back. I don't see how those two would have killed him. Sasuke does not lie, said Tsunade, Lee is dead. He did have other wounds. If they were two. Mused Naruto in a whisper. Is it possible that he was treated using chakra healing? Naruto asked Tsunade. That is how almost all healing is done now, answered Tsunade, especially post-battle treatments. Well that could have done it, said Naruto. 
how do figure on healing techniques killing people? Asked Sakura. Hinata, what happens if a tenketsu is closed, but chakra is constantly getting pumped to it? Asked Naruto. It ruptures, she answered somewhat coldly. The pressure point that I use to knock out Lee is in the same place as the cerebellum tenketsu, Naruto explained further. So you're saying that when the medic nins used chakra to heal him, they were actually overloading that particular tenketsu? Asked Sakura. Yes, I remember injuring his back and chakra travels very well up the backbone. So are you trying to shirt the blame now? Asked Sasuke fiercely. Shift the blame? Wondered Naruto, I am merely proposing a logical explanation for what happened. By saying that it's not your fault? Countered Sasuke. It isn't, shouted Naruto, how the hell was I to know they would use chakra to heal him? His wounds weren't that bad anyway, and he would have become conscious within two days. It is still your fault, yelled Sasuke. You're hopeless, said Naruto, maybe I should have used the Kyuubi's instincts instead of listening to your brother when it came to killing you. Jiraiya's jerked up, you can talk to it? He asked disbelievingly. Yes, I could. Tsunade tilted her head slightly, you could? Yes, he's gone. Jiraiya's eyes widened, what do you mean he's gone? Doesn't anyone know how that seal was designed? Naruto received completely confused looks. It's in their own scroll of seals and they are completely oblivious. He sighed. The seal was designed to absorb the QB after a period of time, explained Naruto. And exactly when did this happen? Inquired Tsunade. Several months before the Jounin exam, replied Naruto calmly. But during the Hyuga assassination I felt its chakra, said Jiraiya. I can use his powers as if they were my own, explained Naruto, Tsunade and Jiraiya gasped. They come in handy for hunting purposes, he smiled coyly. Oh yes, that reminds me, do you know what happened to Orochimaru? Asked Naruto. He's gone into hiding, answered Jiraiya, even I can't find him. Really? Asked Naruto slyly. Tsunade instantly caught on to his tone, Naruto, what do you know about that snake? Ah uh, ah uh, ah, uh, not so easy, Tsunade, said Naruto with a fox grin, I'm not just going to tell you. Then what do you want? She asked hoping for some sort of compromise. A certain scroll you have. A scroll? Asked Tsunade. What scroll would you want? Is he really going to ask for the scroll of seals? Thought Tsunade. The scroll belongs to me, said Naruto cryptically. Jiraiya started to catch on, are you referring to your father's scroll? He asked skeptically. Yes, and it belongs to me. Tsunade's eyes narrowed, it is the property of the village. But how is it that you know about it? Naruto smirked, I have my ways of finding these things out and property of the village my ass. It has my name on it, he said forcefully. You know, from, the Yondaime, to, Uzumaki Naruto. What? yelled Sakura and Hinata, Sasuke was just taken back. You heard correctly, said Naruto. How did you know? asked Jiraiya. Someone had the decency to tell me, said Naruto with his eyes narrowed in resentment. You weren't ready for that kind of information eight years ago, replied Jiraiya. Oh yay, and believing that my parents were absolutely insignificant was much better, countered Naruto sarcastically. Back then you'd brag about everything, so we couldn't trust you with that kind of information, responded Jiraiya. No. I would have taken it to heart. I was a lot more mature than anyone here will ever know. Look, Naruto, I'm sorry that I did not tell you, and that I underestimated you, said Tsunade. Naruto sighed that doesn't really matter, he said. Then after a pause, how about a trade? Trade? wondered Tsunade. Yes, the scroll for information about the snake Sanin, offered Naruto. How can we be sure you won't lie to us? questioned Sakura. You'll have to trust my word. Humphrey, your word isn't good anymore, scoffed Sasuke. He's right, said Jiraiya, you've broken a couple of your promises already. Yay, like protecting your friends, added Hinata. I haven't killed you yet, have I? Plus the only people, from the leaf, that I truly consider my friends are, Iruka, Tsunade, and maybe Jiraiya and Hinata. What do you mean maybe? Asked Jiraiya. You did kill Itachi Ni-chan, so my friendship with you is a bit unstable, explained Naruto. Jiraiya scowled at the Ni-chan part and Sasuke glared at Naruto. Tsunade tried to change the subject and break the arising tension, you give us the information and then I'll give you the scroll, offered Tsunade. You're actually going to bargain with a traitor? Questioned Sakura. 
Tsunade noticed the disrespectful look on Sasuke's face, do not question the Hokage. She glared at Sasuke and Sakura, who cowered back in fear. Naruto smirked at the display of power while contemplating Tsunade's offer, I trust the old hag, but if they hear that he's dead more questions will arise. And worst case scenario they'll figure it out, and it'll be like trading with the enemy. But if worst comes to worst, I do have something to fall back on. All right, I'll tell you, responded Naruto, but first I need to see that you actually have the scroll. He's definitely wised up, though Tsunade, good thing I brought the scroll. Fine, she pulled the scroll out of her pocket and showed it to Naruto, who activated his enhanced sight to make sure it was the right one. After briefly activating his demon eyes and not finding any genjutsu around the scroll he nodded in approval. You may think that Orochimaru disappeared off the face of the earth two years ago, Naruto paused a little, and you are absolutely right. What the hell do you mean by that? yelled Jiraiya. Isn't it obvious? Seeing the confusion on their faces, he's dead. Impossible, said Sasuke matter-of-factly. Why? Because you can't kill him? asked Naruto coldly. Because only another Sanin could match him in power, replied Sakura. Itachi outmatched him in power, stated Naruto. He had the Sharingan to his advantage, countered Sakura. So you don't believe me? asked Naruto. Hell no! answered Sasuke and Sakura at the same time. I wasn't asking you, said Naruto looking at Tsunade. Do you have proof? Tsunade finally asked. Naruto sighed regretfully, no I don't have any evidence, he noticed Sasuke was going to say something and decided to continue, his lair was burned down soon after his death. And his head disposed of several months later. Sasuke's eyes narrowed, you know too much, he said in a low voice. True, Naruto, how do you know all the details? asked Jiraiya suspiciously. Naruto shifted his eyes away from the leaf nin and sighed, is it not obvious? he asked quietly. He heard a huh? from someone, and grew out his claws holding his right hand in front of his face, foxes hunt snakes, don't you know? Sakura and Hinata gasped while the others were just taken aback, why you KK killed him? asked Sasuke uncertainly. Naruto continued to stare off into space while answering, he was supposed to be just a test. Tsunade's eyebrows shot up, taking on that snake as a test? My real objective, at the time, was Jiraiya, Jiraiya twitched slightly. At the time, I wanted revenge. Revenge for Itachi, but I doubted my power since Itachi had always been able to best me. So I needed a trial run, someone with as much strength as Jiraiya. One of the Sanin was an immediate choice. However, since attacking Tsunade was the same as War on the Leaf, I went after the last remaining Sanin. What I don't understand, is why you didn't come after me two years ago? Asked Jiraiya. I was. Preoccupied. Replied Naruto with a slight smile. Killing people, I suppose, said Sasuke. Only you can be so blinded by rage and revenge that you don't see anything around you, countered Naruto. What the hell do you know? Yelled Sasuke. I know quite a bit. I know that your brother didn't want you dead, Sasuke was taken aback. Rather he wanted you to be able to see through the image. Image? What image? That he's a bloody murderer? Yelled Sasuke. Naruto sighed, so stupid for a genius. He thought. It is your duty to figure it out, I can't give you all the answers, he said in a calm tone. Sasuke growled, you talk like you know everything. You know nothing. Your brother told me everything, Sasuke-kun, said Naruto with a cold demeanor, more than you than you see in your worst nightmares. At that point Sasuke couldn't handle it anymore and charged at Naruto with his Sharingan blaring. He went to punch Naruto, but Naruto dodged, however Sasuke's Sharingan predicted where Naruto was going to go and Sasuke instantly sent a kick at that place. Unfortunately for Sasuke, Naruto was used to this, so before the kick could connect Sasuke felt a sharp in his kidney and immediately felt that he was being thrown back by a kick to the stomach. Tsunade had watched as Naruto countered Sasuke's Sharingan by creating a clone behind Sasuke, without using any hand seals and thus fooling the Sharingan. Not surprising for someone that trained under a Sharingan master? She thought. Sasuke was pissed off, but was now being held firmly by Jiraiya. You idiot, don't you see that he can easily kill you? Yelled Jiraiya right in Sasuke's ear. Naruto glared at Sasuke for a moment then returned his gaze to Tsunade, my scroll, if you will, he requested in a calm tone. Don't give it to him, yelled Sakura running up to Tsunade, not after what he did to Sasuke-kun. That bastard attacked me, I merely defended myself, 
said Naruto while glaring at the pink-haired girl. You provoked him, said Hinata coldly. By telling him the truth. Perhaps, he said calmly, but as a shinobi he needs to keep his feeling in check. You did it on purpose and you know it, said Tsunade, making a move to put the scroll back in her pocket. Naruto's eyes narrowed, my half of the deal is done, he said in a half growl, now pay up. Naruto's eyes glimmered red when Tsunade completely removed the scroll from view, what the hell do you think you're doing, Hokage? asked Naruto enraged. You are not the Naruto I once knew. And certainly not one worthy of any kind of sympathy from me, asked Tsunade coldly. Sympathy? Sympathy? Naruto spat out. Who the hell asked for your sympathy? Naruto had to calm himself a little bit, I came here for a simple talk of neutrality and to get back my belonging, he paused to study Tsunade, who still had her cold demeanor on. We made a deal. Are you as the Hokage of the Hidden Leaf going to disrespect your word? He asked, trying to play the honor issue. Tsunade smirked coldly, I am not obliged to anything when dealing with traitorous scum. Jiraiya had always been optimistic that Naruto was not evil and could be made into a friend of the village once more, so he was shocked that Tsunade had turned her back on Naruto. Sasuke, on the other hand, saw this as an opportunity to escape and broke free of Jiraiya's hold. He jumped to the side and started going through the hand seals for the Chidori. Naruto's eyes darkened when he noticed that Tsunade was doing nothing to stop Sasuke. He looked at the Hokage with a slight glimmer of hope, if he goes through with this I will take it as an act of war, he gave his ultimatum. I never should have agreed to this meeting in the first place, uttered Tsunade just before the deafening screech of the Chidori overrode all other sounds in the region. As Sasuke was rushing towards him, everyone clearly saw Naruto's eyes almost completely drain of color. Just as the Chidori was about to make contact, Sasuke was thrown back halfway across the clearing, and a large dust cloud appeared on either side of Naruto. When it cleared Leaf Nin saw three sound Nins and a former Akatsuki member and missing Nin from the mist, Hoshigaki Kisame. It sounded like you were in trouble, Naruto, said Kisame. Well, they did basically declare war. Replied Naruto. Whatever happened to coming alone? Questioned Sakura, sounding betrayed. You didn't follow the rules either, so don't question me, bitch, Naruto said coldly, pissing off Sakura. Naruto drew his sword and pointed it at Jiraiya, looks like we are well matched. Chapter 18, Battle of Understanding The sword in Naruto's hand vanished, reappearing back in its sheath. Naruto instantly got into a loose stance, getting ready to attack Jiraiya. Don't underestimate me, Dobi, you'll need that sword of yours, said Sasuke and charged at Naruto. However before he could completely make it to Naruto, he was intercepted by a sound nin with a large scar across his forehead. Sasuke stopped where he was and glared at the sound nin, what the hell do you think you're doing? He asked vehemently. You opponent is me, declared the scarred shinobi. What the hell? Growled Sasuke and tried to get around the sound nin, but forced back once more. Fine. Prepare to die, yelled Sasuke as he charged at the scarred shinobi. Sasuke executed several kicks and punches that were all blocked. He let his anger get the better of him and slipped up in his defense, so the sound nin was able to land a kick in Sasuke's gut and send him flying back. In midair Sasuke was trying to calm himself, I cannot let my emotions control me, he thought, just concentrate on your objective. Killing your opponent. He breathed out a steady stream of air and flipped himself over, at the same time throwing three shuriken at his opponent. The sound nin pulled out his kunai, do you really think a couple of shuriken will help? He asked as he prepared to block them. Sasuke smirked and formed a single hand seal, the sound nin's eyes widened, shit. I've seen Otokage sama use that jutsu once. Sasuke channeled some chakra and said, Kage shuriken no jutsu, making the three shuriken into thirty. The sound nin was forced to put away the kunai and run through a quick set of seals, he then placed his palms on the ground and said, Doten, earth wall no jutsu. As planned, the wall stopped the projectiles, but Sasuke was nowhere to be seen. The sound nin looked around, his senses on high alert, but still couldn't find his opponent. Just as he started thinking that his opponent had once again started to pursue the Otokage, a hand shot out from the ground, Doten, Shinju Uzanchu no Jutsu, inner decapitation, was heard as the sound nin found himself being pulled down. Once the sound nin was buried up to his neck, Sasuke got out of the ground and put a kunai to the sound nin's throat. However, as soon as he pressed into his opponent's skin, it started crumpling, what the hell? questioned Sasuke. He then punched his opponent's head, only to have it crumble into dirt, damn it. I can't believe I fell for that, Sasuke scolded himself. 
This, of course, was no time to relax, as Sasuke suddenly felt a presence very close behind him and unfortunately didn't have time to dodge or block as a fierce kick was delivered to his side. Leaving him with very little time to recover before another onslaught of kicks and punches was sent his way. Sasuke was getting annoyed again and activated his Sharingan to be able to easily block and counter his opponent's attacks, not to mention copy his Jutsus. Instantly, Sasuke was able to see his opponent's next attack and was able to dodge and instantly deliver a fierce punch right under his opponent's arm. Afterwards, Sasuke immediately elbowed the Sound Nin in the chin and kicked him into a tree. The Sound Nin stood up and looked right into Sasuke's eyes, he gasped when he saw the Sharingan, Sasuke smirked at his reaction. Before the Sound Nin had time to recompose himself, Sasuke did a few very quick hand seals and slammed his palms on the ground, Doden, land bind no jutsu, said Sasuke. The dirt under the Sound Nin's feet rose up and wrapped itself around his feet tightly, holding him in place. Sasuke did several more hand seals and held his left arm slightly away from his body as Chakra started to appear all around his left hand, Chidori, he cried and dashed at his opponent. The Sound Nin did a few hand seals and bent down to the ground, Doten, Doraku Geishi, he said, A.N., Earth Wall Land Flip. The Sound Nin happily realized that Sasuke would be unable to alter his path and would be forced to hit the wall instead. Sasuke saw the wall and scoffed lightly, the Chidori will easily go through that, he thought as he increased his speed. The Chidori impacted the earth wall with a loud explosive sound and immediately ate straight through the wall and continued on to the Sound Nin. What? yelled the Sound Shinobi in his mind. Sasuke's Sharingan eyes narrowed as he saw his opponent gather a small amount of chakra. It didn't matter, though, as the Chidori hit the sound in a second later. However, instead of blood flying in all directions, a poof was heard and the sound nin disappeared in smoke to be replaced with a log. Kawarimi, mumbled Sasuke. Yes, came the reply from behind Sasuke, sometimes the basics are a major help. Humph, was the only thing heard from Sasuke. The sound nin started to make hand seals, but before he could even get the second one done, he felt a presence very close to him. He turned to look and the last thing he saw was Sasuke stabbing him with a kunai straight through the neck. But mostly, basics are useless, concluded Sasuke, and let the body fall. Meanwhile with Naruto. As they split, Naruto forced Jiraiya to the corner of the meadow, so as not to involve anyone else. After three years, we finally meet on the battlefield, said Naruto. Naruto, you don't have to do this, said Jiraiya, we can work things out. I can talk to Tsunade. Naruto cut him off, and say what? She obviously hates me. I saw it, through all her genjutsu, I saw that hatred hidden deep inside. Jiraiya sighed and shook his head lightly, I can't say you don't deserve it, Naruto, he said softly. First you leave and join the Akatsuki, noticing the slight surprise on Naruto's face he clarified, yes, I found out you were in the Akatsuki about a year after you joined. I told Tsunade, but no one else, we gave you the benefit of the doubt and assumed that they forced you. But then, you go and do something as horrible as the Hyuga massacre. Do you know how much chaos you caused? I can guess, calmly responded Naruto. Over the years, she's grown more and more wary of you. Trust being replaced by hatred. You betrayed her, Naruto. Now that you hold a high position in the sound, who are sworn enemies of the leaf, Naruto's eyes narrowed at this new information. You've spying on me haven't you, Urosenin? Asked Naruto. We had been getting reports on the sound from a team inside for a year before two members vanished without a trace. That was a year ago, just as the new Otokage came to power, explained Jiraiya. Naruto scoffed and smirked darkly, you want to know whether or not Konohamaru and Moigi are dead or not, Naruto stated, and not only that, but you want to know who the Otokage is because that is a vital piece of information that you have been unable to get, am I right? Jiraiya stared at Naruto with a raised eyebrow, this definitely isn't the Naruto I once knew. To be able to see through me like this. Jiraiya contemplated his next move. Will you be so kind as to answer then? Naruto laughed lightly, I will say that they are not dead. Yet, Jiraiya stiffened at the last part. But you also wonder what part I play in all this, stated Naruto and Jiraiya nodded. Let's just, spoils to the victor, said Naruto with a slight smile. Either way. Naruto suddenly dashed forward and punched an unsuspecting Jiraiya in the stomach, this battle will continue. Damn it, should have expected that, the Sanin scolded himself. He mentally kicked himself into battle mode and was successfully able to block or dodge all of Naruto's punches and kicks. Once he saw an opening, he hit Naruto in the stomach and sent him flying back, 
however he noticed that Naruto flew back farther than he should have. He purposely left that opening, so that he could use the momentum from my punch to get farther away. That means a long-range attack. As soon as Jiraiya thought that, a lone shuriken was sent at Jiraiya. Once it was very close Jiraiya, it multiplied into several hundred. However, Jiraiya had expected that and had left Ibushin in his place while he crossed the battlefield to where Naruto would land. That pervert won't fall for the shuriken, so instead of cage Bushin I'll make it regular Bushin and, he quickly did some hand seals, I'll set up a little something for him. As soon as Jiraiya landed, he felt very strong winds around him. At the same time, Naruto got the final fix on Jiraiya's location and activated his jutsu, tornado, he whispered. The winds around Jiraiya started spinning wildly, and instantly began tearing his clothes apart. With his plans foiled Jiraiya did the only thing he could, raise a few Uatan ninjutsu defense. Naruto smirked, good, now I've got you right where I want you, he formed several hand seals, quicksand, he tapped his foot. Jiraiya thought he was temporarily safe within his wind barrier, when suddenly he felt himself sinking, what the hell? He looked down and saw that the ground beneath him had turned into quicksand. He tried to use chakra to oppose the effects only to find that he began sinking faster, this is the sand village's special resistance quicksand. Concluded Jiraiya. He then released his wind barrier, but was surprised that Naruto's wind attack was still going, the kid's good, to be able to hold two different types of ninjutsus going at the same time. Even though his instant reaction was to avoid the attack, Jiraiya smirked and let the tornado hit him. The tornado did make several cuts and scratches on Jiraiya, but the force of its attack also ripped Jiraiya out of the quicksand. Naruto narrowed his eyes, using my own attack to help himself, albeit getting cut a little bit, but it's worth the sacrifice. Just as Naruto released both jutsus, he heard the unmistakable sound that Chidori. Looking over at the source he couldn't help but curse, damn it. Hirotaro is not suited to fight the Uchiha. That wall won't stop the Chidori. While Naruto was distracted Jiraiya had enough time to recover. He quickly summoned a toad that was twice his size and had two katanas. Naruto was brought back to his own battle by the sound of swords being drawn and the slight shaking of the ground, turning to look he saw a large toad charging at him dual wielding katanas. Shit. Cursed Naruto as he drew his own sword and parried the toad's attack. Naruto alternated blocking one sword and dodging the other and in a little while managed to land a blow on the toad's shoulder. However, his game was thrown off as Jiraiya attacked in sync with the toad, so while Naruto blocked the swords Jiraiya managed to kick him in the back. Naruto realized that he wouldn't just be fighting the toad and mentally prepared himself for the time when Jiraiya would attack, he'll probably attack me from the back, mused Naruto. After blocking the swords, he felt a presence behind him that was closing in fast, so he's going to attack now, I better get ready. Naruto had set up a very thin chakra barrier on his back so that he would sense the attack before it actually impacted him, so as soon as he felt the barrier being breached he transferred some chakra to his feet and jumped a little bit upwards of the direction the kick would push him. Thus, for a few valuable second Naruto ended up right above the toad's head. He, of course, used this time to his benefit and chopped the toad's head in two with his katana. When he landed behind the toad, he saw it vanish into smoke and caught a quick glimpse of Jiraiya biting him thumb and doing hand seals, is he going to? Before Naruto could finish his thought a giant cloud of smoke pushed him back about a hundred feet. Once he got back on his feet he saw Jiraiya standing on top of Gamabunta. What are you going to do now, Naruto? Asked Jiraiya with a sly grin, no other toad will fight against the boss. Suddenly out of nowhere, Naruto once again heard the Chidori, though this time it sounded like it was coming towards him, what the hell? He turned around and was greeted by the sight of Sasuke running at full speed at him, Chidori blazing, is he serious? Thought Naruto with amazement. Naruto sighed and slowly did several hand seals, I hope this is the right way to do it. He thought. Naruto finished the hand seals and held his hand tightly in a clapping position. What happened next took both Jiraiya and Sasuke by surprise. Sasuke suddenly fell to the ground, releasing the Chidori and screaming in pain while holding his cursed seal. Well, I guess it does work, said Naruto with a hint of surprise in his voice. Sasuke looked up with hatred in his eyes, what the hell did you do to me? He seethed. Well, you see Orochimaru used the curse seal as a means to control his subordinates and this is the pinnacle of that control, explained Naruto. So you didn't actually kill him, did you? Asked Jiraiya with contempt. You're working for him aren't you? No, I did kill him, replying Naruto calmly, though he was boiling with rage inside. How dare he even assume that I would work for that snake? I'm gonna rip off his arms and legs and. Naruto decided to stop right there before he got too carried away. 
spoils of war, people, he chuckled, I just went through Orochimaru's stash of scrolls after I killed him and found a little something about the cursed seal. If this deal had gone like I had planned, I would have given you this scroll because it also talks about how to remove these seals, but now. Naruto trailed off as Sasuke finally passed out from pain. Now, where were we? He asked as he turned back to Jiraiya. By this time Gamabunda had become aware of the situation, if you fight me, Naruto, you can consider our contract null and void, he stated and Jiraiya laughed. Naruto chuckled darkly, who needs toads? He bit his thumb and ran through a half dozen hand seals, Kushios no Jutsu, he said and disappeared into a large cloud of smoke. In the next moment he was standing a little higher than Jiraiya, on the head of a black fox with yellow malicious eyes, Jiraiya's laughter died instantly. You were saying something? Asked Naruto darkly. Jiraiya gulped, even though the fox's eyes were yellow, they were in the same shape as the Kyubis. He's probably the only one to ever have the fox summoning contract, contemplated Jiraiya, no doubt given to him by the QB. Gamabunta almost dropped his pipe, impossible, no one should have the fox summoning contract. It's forbidden and was sealed away with the Lord of Foxes, he said. The fox boss chose this time to speak up, Lord QB sama chose Naruto-sama a more than worthy successor of the contract, he said with pride. Shall we, Yori? Naruto calmly said to the fox. Yori gave a slight growl and crouched down preparing to attack. Gamabunta pulled out his katana and charged at Yori and Naruto. Gamabunta went to slash, but Yori just jumped over him, Kitsune spiked tail he said, while in mid-air over Gamabunta. The fur on the fox's tail stood straight up and thickened, to become sharp chakra-infused spikes. As Yori came down, he brought his tail down over Gamabunta aiming to cut his back. The toad managed to dodge most of the attack, but Yori managed to clip his backside and draw blood. You damn fox, yelled Gamabunta. We get that a lot, don't we Yori? Said Naruto somewhat sadly. Yori, vines. Thought Naruto, knowing that Yori could hear him because of the telepathic link Naruto has with all foxes. Naruto did the hand seals, and Yori generated and directed the chakra appropriately. At first a single vine tendril went up to encircle each of Gamabunta's legs and arms. Gamabunta saw and cut the two vines that were attacking his arms, but missed the other two. Once the two that were going up to capture the legs were successful, a dozen more shot out of the ground. Some entangled the legs further, while others intertwined with each other to bind the legs together. Yori charged once again, Naruto doing hand seals throughout the run. As soon as the fox got within striking distance of the toad, it just disappeared, huh? What the hell is he doing? Wondered both Gamabunta and Jiraiya. They didn't have much time to ponder this as a few Uatan attacks suddenly hit them head on, out of nowhere and because Gamabunta was tied down, he was forced to take the whole of the attack. Naruto smiled darkly at the sight, that's the beauty of in Vortex, it travels right behind me and hits my opponents right after I disappear. Naruto quickly started contemplating his next attack, in Vortex damaged the vines enough to allow Gamabunta to cut through them without too much effort. Yuri, I'll need you to rip apart the toad while I engage Jiraiya. Yes, Naruto-sama, replied the fox. The fox boss charged in and began attacking Gamabunta using his tail, nails and teeth right as the toad finished cutting the vines himself. Gamabunta had at first tried blocking with his katana, but soon realized that the fox was a lot faster and more agile. It was at this time that Naruto teleported onto Gamabunta's head and knocked Jiraiya down to ground level. Gamabunta jumped back, away from the fox and formed a hand seal, Sutan, Tepo Dama, two water bullets shot out of Gamabunta's mouth. Yori paused his onslaught for a second to also form a hand seal, Fuuatan, Rinku Dan, he countered the toad's attack with two airwave cannons, water was scattered all around the battlefield. By the time the water cleared, Yori was already next to Gamabunta fiercely attacking him again. Naruto noticed Jiraiya looking at the summoning's battle and said, We have our own fight to finish, wouldn't you agree, Jiraiya-san? Jiraiya got into a fighting stance waiting for Naruto to attack, Gamabunta can take care of himself, I should worry more about my former student. Naruto did a single hand seal and the ground under Jiraiya exploded. Jiraiya jumped away to dodge, but the ground under him exploded once more, he must have set up chakra-activated land mines. Jiraiya finally settled in a tree only to have the ground beneath the tree blow up and the tree fall. As soon as Jiraiya recovered, he was assaulted by a swarm of punches and kicks. The Sanin managed to block one of his punches and catch that arm, but Naruto seemed prepared for that and did a few one-handed seals and brought the tips of his fingers to his mouth, Katan, Gukakyuu, he thought and breathed out. The toad Sanin wasn't stupid, 
he instantly used Kawarimi, so Naruto ended up burning a log. Jiraiya sat high up in a tree watching Naruto just stand in the field all alone, he's really a tough opponent. And that black fox of his has already made Gameabunta disappear, good thing it didn't decide to attack me. Thought the Sanin. And to think he hasn't used his signature technique yet, the cage Bushin. Just then Jiraiya realized that no way Naruto would have stayed in the middle of the field doing nothing, shit. He felt a presence right behind him, but couldn't react fast enough and was forced to take a savage kick to the side. The sound of ribs breaking was clearly heard as Jiraiya fell towards the ground. Naruto then appeared right above him and delivered another kick straight to Jiraiya's face. Naruto Rendon, Naruto chuckled lightly, haven't used that one in. Since I left Konoha. He then took these few seconds to look around the battlefield, what he saw did not please him. He saw a mostly worn out Kisame go flying courtesy of Tsunade's punch, shit, I need to end, he thought and brought his attention back to the Toad Sanin. Naruto extended his nails to their usual combat length and jumped straight at Jiraiya who was still recovering from being slammed down into the ground by a foot to the face. Since Jiraiya was still somewhat confused, Naruto easily got in a swipe at Jiraiya's torso, ripping straight through his clothes and making a quarter of an inch cut across his stomach. Afterwards Jiraiya jumped back instinctively, but Naruto was right behind him and stuck his fingers straight into Jiraiya's back and pulled out a kidney. He appeared right in front of Jiraiya and tossed the kidney into his hands. The toad Sanin started at his kidney as if in a trance, a slow trickle of blood coming out of the corner of his mouth. Naruto then decided to end this, he quickly pulled out his katana and stabbed Jiraiya straight through the heart. In the distance Naruto heard someone cry no. But didn't pay much attention to it. He twisted his katana 90 degrees, to prevent the wound from closing and slowly pulled out his katana. Meanwhile with Kisame. Kisame saw Naruto jump at Jiraiya and Uchiha Sasuke was stopped from following Naruto by Hirotaro, I guess I'm the only one who can take on another Sanin, he thought. Looks like my fight is with you, Hokage-sama, said Kisame while unstrapping his Seimata. Tsunade scowled, fine, let's do this, she said crouching down into a half stance. Kisame charged right at her, holding his Seimata to the side with only his right hand. He went to swipe Tsunade right across the chest, but she jumped back and counter-attacked with a katanjutsu. Kisame put the Seimata in front of himself, stopping all the flames from hitting him, however the bandages on his Seimata were completely burned off. Kisame smirked and attacked with the Seimata again, Tsunade did her best to dodge, but was finally forced to block it with her kunai. She tried to channel chakra into her kunai to help block the Seimata, but found that it was all disappearing. My Seimata eat up chakra, clarified Kisame when he saw Tsunade's confused look. Tsunade scowled and pushed Kisame's Seimata off of her with her freakish strength. She then dashed at him with punches and kicks. Kisame mostly dodged, the one time he went to block with the Seimata Tsunade disappeared, reappearing right behind him and delivering a terrifying blow to his right shoulder. Kisame ended up flying into a tree all the way on the other side of the clearing. Damn that woman, probably broke my right shoulder, good thing I can still wield with my left hand. Though not as well, thought Kisame as he was getting up. As soon as he was up again, Tsunade jumped at him with chakra visible around her hands and began attacking all his vital points. Since Kisame couldn't block as fast, he was finally forced to use an ninjutsu. Taking a little extra time to concentrate Kisame ran through the necessary hand seals, sutin, spiral water shield. Within the barrier, Kisame was wincing in pain, damn, it sure hurts to make water. Tsunade knew that attacking the water shield would be futile, so she deactivated her medical jutsu and instead started doing hand seals for another jutsu. Doden, mud spike, she said quietly. Kisame suddenly felt chakra gathering right below him, shit, a doden jutsu. He quickly released the shield and tried jumping away from the spike that was coming up right next to his leg, but the spike had already started wrapping itself around Kisame's leg. Tsunade had once again activated her medical jutsu and charged at Kisame. Kisame put the Seimata in front of himself while quickly doing a few hand seals, good thing Itachi-san showed me some Doten Jutsus, he thought. Doten, diffusion, he said and channeled chakra to his captured leg. The mud spike quickly turned into muddy water and Kisame was able to block with his Seimata while jumping away. Kisame panted, I poured a little too much chakra into it, but it couldn't be helped I needed the speed. Tsunade narrowed her eyes, I've never heard of that jutsu, I wonder where a Miss Nin would learn that though it seemed to have worn him out quite a bit, she contemplated. Just then she heard a giant rumbling and looked over to see Naruto and Jiraiya fighting on top of their summonings, a black fox. She mused, but didn't have much time to wonder about it since out of the corner of her eye she saw Kisame get up to his feet. 
Kisame had also noticed the summonings appear, but wasn't so surprised as he had seen Naruto summon foxes before. Rather he focused on Tsunade, who for now seemed distracted by the appearance of the black fox. He quickly formed a single hand seal and created a regular Bushin in his place, while he hid. The Bushin started to slowly stand up and eventually caught Tsunade's attention. As soon as she saw him standing, she immediately charged at him and went to punch his jaw, but the punch went right through as the Bushin suddenly disappeared. Kisame used this opportunity to cut the Hokage on the back, but when his sword hit her she also disappeared in a cloud of smoke. What? No. She saw through the Bushin, then that would mean that. Kisame wasn't allowed to finish his thought because Tsunade appeared right in front of him and punched him straight in the chest sending him flying. Kisame was having trouble breathing and was coughing up blood, if only we were fighting in a more moist place. Just then, a mass of water came down from the sky soaking everything in sight, hmm. I never though my prayers would be answered. He thought. Kisame quickly did a couple of hand seals, Sutan, Suikodan no Jutsu, he said. An, great water attack. The water that had just fallen onto the ground, gathered up and launched itself at an amazing speed right at the female Sanin. Tsunade did a few hand seals and slammed her palms into the ground, Doten Kikai. A wall of earth came up right in front of her and shielded Tsunade from the water attack, but it did not hold for long. Soon the wall started to dissolve into mud and the Sutan Jutsu broke through, sending Tsunade crashing along the ground half a dozen times. The attack was powerful, but it left Kisame in a very vulnerable position. He realized that that was probably the one and only time that he would be able to use a Sutan Jutsu, so he poured a lot of chakra into that one move, hoping that it would sufficiently injure the female Sanin. Tsunade was pretty badly injured from that last water attack, but she quickly did a self-healing jutsu and most of the cuts and bruises disappeared instantly. I may not have a whole lot of chakra left, but it is enough to beat the crap out of him. She then walked over to a very injured Kisame and punched him right under the jaw sending him flying across the battlefield. Kisame tried to get back up and attack her with his same Ata, but Tsunade casually dodged it and easily knocked it out of his hand. This is the end of the line, she said and activated her chakra scalpel. She then used the chakra scalpel to cut several of Kisame's major arteries, Kisame's body collapsed soon after. Tsunade deactivated her medical jutsu and turned to look over at Naruto and Jiraiya's battle, what she was terrified her. There was Jiraiya standing on one knee, and Naruto was standing right in front of him with his katana drawn. Then Naruto just plunged it right into Jiraiya's chest, no. Screamed Tsunade, knowing that her old friend was already dead. Damn you, Naruto. Damn you. First you tear through the village with the Hyuga massacre and now you kill one of my best friends, Tsunade angry and sad at the same time. She saw him retract his blade and wipe it off using Jiraiya's robes. Then he looked over in her direction and narrowed his eyes, Tsunade glared back at him. Without putting his katana away he started walking towards her, oh shit. What am I going to do? I'm in no state to fight against him now. Tsunade was rapidly searching for alternatives in the matter. She turned around to look for any of her subordinates that could help her out, the sight was not pretty. Hinata's battle. Hinata watched as Jiraiya, Tsunade and Sasuke were quickly paired off with the obviously stronger opponents. Her face grimaced, does no one see me as a threat? She wondered angrily. Just then a sound nin appeared in front of her and attempted to punch her, however his attack was stopped by a chakra layer, what the hell? Thought the sound nin. Then he was suddenly thrown back, in flight he saw a rotating sphere of chakra enclosing his opponent. So she uses the force of rotating chakra to push me away. That defense would of course also repel chakra as well as people. Analyzed the sound nin. As he was nearing the ground, he flipped himself over and landed perfectly on his feet. Hinata deactivated her kaiden and at the same time activated the Byakugan. She instantly crouched down into the Hugajukan, gentle fist, taijutsu stance and motioned her opponent to attack her. An, think Lee. Her opponent did not rush in though, she looks very confident in close combat. Pure taijutsu probably won't work on her, I'll have to use my nin taijutsu, he mused. He dashed at Hinata and went to kick her in the stomach. She blocked, but her arm shook a little while it was in contact with the sound nin's leg. He had chakra surrounding the leg that he kicked me with, but that still doesn't explain why my hand shook like that, wondered Hinata. However, she didn't want to lose this opportunity and since her opponent was within hand's reach, she attacked him aiming to close several important tankatsus. The sound nin quickly realized that she was using chakra in her attacks and so he gathered a bit of chakra to his mouth and blew out. Do. He screamed and knocked Hinata back. Noticing the confused look on her face he decided to explain a little, it's a sound attack. 
Chakra can be used to manipulate many things, one of them is sound and in this case it can be used as you just saw. Hinata narrowed her eye slightly, so that is how you were able to make my arm shake, he nodded lightly. Like I thought, he relies a lot on chakra, so I will have to close as many as tenkatsis as I can, planned Hinata. Good, as long she hangs on to that explanation I have a definite edge on her, thought the sound nin with a mental smile, but retained his emotionless composure. He disappeared and reappeared right behind her, but wasn't able to even begin his attack as she quickly hit him in the arm and closed off a tenketsu. Damn it, those special eyes of hers must have something to do with this. And what the hell did she do to that point on my arm? Wondered the sound nin. He jumped back a little ways away from her, she just jumped after him. No time, she's going to continue her onslaught. Then. He quickly did several hand seals and covered his whole body in a layer of chakra. What? Does he think that he'll be able to stop the gentle fist by covering himself in chakra? Hinata smirked, it's not that easy. She continued with her attacks, pumping in a little more chakra into each hit to compensate. As his blocks got harsher, she noticed that her hands were shaking more and more after each collision, he couldn't just be manipulating sound. At this point, Hinata saw an opening and hit him hard with an open palm sending him tumbling over the ground. Yes. She thought. You are within my field of divination, said Hinata as she got into the appropriate stance. Divination? Questioned the sound nin, whatever it is, it can't good for me, he quickly started preparing a ninjutsu. Hakazu, Rakuhu Yanshao, said Hinata and charged at the sound nin. An, hand of the eight divinations, sixty-four palms. The sound nin saw her coming and unleashed his counterattack, sonic boom, he yelled and held his palms outwards at Hinata. Hinata knew that he was attacking, but was already locked into her own attack, he's planning something. Oh well I'll just have to beat him to it, she thought and increased her speed. However as soon as she hit one of his open palms, a loud explosion was heard and Hinata was blown back savagely. She landed several dozen yards away and tumbled along the ground until she hit a tree. Damn, she took the attack at point-blank range. She's not getting off without several major injuries, reflected the sound shinobi. He watched Hinata get up and hold her left arm while slightly limping on her left leg. She's injured, now's the time to attack, he thought and quickly began doing hand seals. Hinata saw her opponent getting ready to attack her and patiently waited for his attack to come, knowing she would have to rely on the Hyuga's ultimate defense. The sound nin fired off several chakra-based projectiles, at least that's what they looked like through the Byakugan. When the projectiles were about to hit, Hinata released chakra all around her body and began spinning, Kaiden. The sound nin smirked, just as I thought, she's resorting to that same spinning defense. He closed his eyes in concentration and did a few quick hand seals, fracture waves, he whispered. To an onlooker it looked like he nothing happened, but then again sound waves are invisible. Suddenly the chitin broke down and an agony-faced Hinata was seen stumbling out of the center of the crater. Her upper body looked somehow deformed, her byakugan had been deactivated and blood was slowly dripping down the right side of her mouth. She stumbled a little and finally fell to ground face first. The sound shinobi narrowed his eyes, something's not right. That attack was aimed at the lower ribs, but that deformity makes it look like. His eyes suddenly shot open in realization. Of course, that defense digs into the ground, so what was lower ribs before became collarbone? The sound nin then made his way towards her, I wonder if she's still alive. He mused. He made his way over to Hinata, flipped her over onto her back and lightly examined her body. Yup definitely a collarbone hit, he sighed, both of them fractured into a million pieces and her rib cage fell, accounting for the deformity. He felt her pulse and didn't find one, one of the upper ribs must gained a sharp edge during the attack and cut into her heart either when her rib cage fell or when she fell face forward onto the ground, he shook his head. It doesn't matter, she's dead either way, he mumbled. He closed her eyes and slowly walked away from Hinata's body, well, my bloodline is one of the most powerful in the sound, he thought with a slight smile of pride. Sakura's battle. Sakura was paired off with a female sound shinobi with short purple hair. The sound nin attacked Sakura with taijutsu, which Sakura countered relatively easily. However she felt that she was burdened with all the weapons she was carrying, so she jumped back and threw half a dozen shuriken at her opponent. The purple-haired shinobi dodged the shuriken and went to attack Sakura, but was stopped short as she felt the shuriken closing in on her once again, chakra strings, she concluded. She quickly formed a few hand seals and disappeared underground. The sound nin's hand came up right below Sakura and she quickly used the Shinju Zanshu no Jutsu on Sakura, only to find that the leaf nin had replaced herself with a log. Damn. And I was underground, so I don't know where she could have gone, cursed the sound nin. 
Soon the sound shinobi found that she was unable to move, looking down she realized that her legs were caught in newly hardened mud, how did I not notice? She wondered. Then she realized that the mud was slowly making its way up her body, hardening as it went up making a sort of second skin over the sound nin. This is. There's no way I can get out of this alone, she thought and bit her thumb. Sakura, meanwhile, was hiding in a neighboring tree overlooking her opponent. Sakura's hands were locked in a hand seal and little bits of sweat were visible on her forehead from concentration. I hope the genjutsu swallows her up before she is able to summon, hope Sakura. But things weren't going to go Sakura's way and right as the genjutsu generated mud grabbed the sound nin's arm, she had already completed her hand seals. Kushios, she said and raised her right arm over her head. Smoke covered the area above her arm and soon a spotted brown and black owl appeared right above her. Yes, master? It asked. Pull me out of this mud, half cried the sound nin. Meanwhile, Sakura encased her victim in another genjutsu where a tree was tightly holding the purple-haired ninja and Sakura's head was coming out right above her. I have you now, said Sakura with a kunai in hand. This isn't good, thought the summoning, I have to use it, even this early in the battle. The owl quickly did a few hand seals. Its eyes turned absolutely white and it dug its claws into the sound nin's arm, pulling her in the direction opposite of the imaginary tree. As soon as her owl clawed her, the sound nin was immediately aware that she was trapped within a genjutsu and that her summoning was countering it. Thanks, Yashi, she said. Good thing I summoned the owl that has a special ability of seeing through and freeing themselves and their summoner from all genjutsus. Though they can only use this ability once a day, but when you're in jam it really helps. Once free of the genjutsu she saw Sakura a little ways ahead of her, standing in the middle of the battlefield with a very confused expression, opportunity, thought the sound nin and quickly did a half dozen hand seals. Few Uatan, wind tunnel, she said and shot the attack right at her pink-haired opponent. Sakura could not believe that the sound nin was able to so easily escape her genjutsu, did she purposely wait until I revealed myself to cancel my jutsu? Wondered Sakura, still not aware of her surroundings. How did she? Sakura couldn't complete her thought as she felt sudden wind around herself and the next moment she was forcefully thrown back and into a tree. Shit. I can't let my mind wander like that during battle, she scolded herself. Looking up, but was surprised to find her opponent gone. However, that didn't last long because soon she heard a voice somewhere above her. Razor feathers, said the sound nin while riding on the back of the owl. The next thing Sakura knew several hundred projectiles were headed her way. Doten Kikai, half dome, said Sakura as she put her palms on the ground. A wall of dirt came up in front of Sakura and curved back to cover Sakura's hunched form behind it. Not so easy Pinky, thought the sound nin with a smirk. She moved her fingers, briefly showing the chakra strings that were attached to them. The sound nin then directed at least 50 of the feathers around Sakura's dome and right into her. At that time she caught sight of movement to her left and saw that Sakura had actually left a bushin in her place. While well, she found the wrong time to show herself, smiled the sound shinobi. Sakura had indeed left her bushin behind and was now going through a long list of hand seals, I hope this works, since it will drain a lot of my remaining chakra. Unknown to her, but her opponent was also going through a long list of hand seals, also wanting to finish the battle. The two attacks were released at the same time, Fuuatan, jet stream, said Sakura. Fuuatan, hurricane winds, said the sound nin. The attacks collided in midair and were more or less cancelling each other out. However, soon it became apparent that the jet stream jutsu was more powerful as it ripped through the hurricane winds and smashed into the sound nin and her owl. The sound shinobi was tossed off of her owl and fell to the ground, but since she wasn't that high up she got off with only a broken hand and a slightly limp. Meanwhile her owl had been able to evade the rest of Sakura's attack and very quickly made his way behind the leaf nin. It then swooped down at her with his feathers turned into razors. Sakura had wrongfully assumed that the summoning had just vanished and was too focused on the sound nin to notice the owl's attack until it was too late. The feathers dug into Sakura's back and arms. She cried out and tried to fight back with her kunai, but before she could, the owl hit her right across the face with three of his feathers. Sakura's vision was becoming blurry as she was suffering from exhaustion and blood loss. The owl to the side of her disappeared in a cloud of smoke and she assumed that she had managed to kill him. Satisfied with the result, she smiled a little and passed out. Well she's out, said the purple-haired shinobi. She then looked over at the rest of the people and gasped. Out of her comrades only one was alive, even Kisame was dead, good thing Otokage-sama is still alive, she breathed a sigh of relief at that. She watched as her still-living teammate swung their fallen comrade over his shoulder and walked over to where the Otokage was talking with the Hokage. 
she slowly limped her way after him. Meanwhile with Naruto and Tsunade. Naruto walked over to Tsunade with a cold look on his face and made a motion with his sword as if he was going to attack her, but at the last second stopped the attack and put the sword back in its sheath. Tsunade tried using this opportunity to attack him using the chakra scalpel. Naruto let the attack hit, but grabbed Tsunade's hand before she could pull it away. You shouldn't give your hands away like this, he said softly while in his other palm activated an incomplete Rasengan and hit Tsunade in the stomach. She was sent flying back to crash into a tree, she sat there against the tree not having enough strength to get up. She watched the wound she had inflicted on him heal up in a matter of seconds, so are you going to kill me now? She asked. Naruto scoffed and did several hand seals, transparency, he muttered. He then reached down and into one of Tsunade pockets and pulled out a scroll. I'll be taking this now, he said softly and turned to walk away. So you got your prize, huh? Going to use it against people that care about you again? She spat out. Naruto turned back to the Hokage with sad and angry eyes, I didn't want the scroll, don't you get that? Naruto yelled at Tsunade, while waving the scroll at her. I didn't come here for the damn scroll. I came here to make peace between us. Me and you, he paused for a second. I didn't want to make this political. It was supposed to be on a personal basis. And what did you expect for me to just forgive you after everything that you've done? Tsunade yelled back. Of course not, replied Naruto softly. I merely wanted to apologize and to try and do a few nice things to make up for some of the horrible things that I've done. Really? Make up for hurting or killing people that cared about you, that worried about you, that were hoping you would escape the darkness and come back to us, the last part Naruto realized was spoken about herself. Naruto sighed deeply and regretfully, like you said, I wasn't able to escape the darkness until it was too late, but I did want to make amends. His tone was giving away to bitterness, but what do you do? You throw it back in my face without even looking at it. He paused briefly to gather his thoughts. All of this, he motioned to the destruction that lay around him, shouldn't have happened. I wanted it to be a happy ending or as happy as it could be made out to be. I wanted peace between our villages, noticing the confused look on Tsunade's face Naruto clarified. I'm the Otokage. He smiled sadly, I guess you could say I attained my childhood dream. You? You are the one in charge of that village? Naruto nodded. So then it was you that rooted out our spies, Naruto nodded again. And I assumed that it was you that gave the order to kill them. At that Naruto's face darkened, don't assume shit about me, you know nothing. Konohamaru and Moigi are alive and well, he clenched his fist and began walking away. Or at least they would have been if you had simply trusted a little and had the courtesy to listen, concluded Naruto darkly. Trust? I trusted you once and you let me down, countered Tsunade. I extended my hand in peace. You should have thought about it. If I trusted you enough to stand before you alone, then you should have at least trusted me enough to hear me out, said Naruto in a very calm voice, but it was clear that it was merely a mask for the anger that he was feeling. Naruto walked over to Kisame and paused to look at his dead body. He lifted up the body and swung it up on his shoulder. I'll make sure to send back Konohamaru. In a box, he said coldly, Tsunade visibly flinched. With a flick of his head he motioned for his subordinates to come over to him. Once they were on either side of him, he started doing a list of hand seals, but paused to survey the battlefield once again. Noticing a more or less awake Sasuke and a completely knocked out if not dead Sakura, Naruto shook his head sadly, Sasuke. Your brother would have been very disappointed, he concluded in a sad tone. He completed his hand seals and instantly three tails of black chakra appeared behind him. Naruto took one last look at his former village mates before mumbling, demonic, fox leap, and disappearing along with his subordinates, in black smoke. Chapter 19, Change of Pace. Naruto along with his injured or dead subordinates, teleported right back into the Otokage's office. Naruto quickly called a few more people to take care of the dead and to take the injured to the hospital. I'll need to arrange the funeral, thought Naruto sadly. He called in his secretary and told her to make arrangements for the funeral to take place three days from now. After all, I have wait for Mia to get back. Can't go burying one of her friends without her. Naruto sat down at his desk, with his hands on forehead and sighed heavily. God damn, he muttered. Naruto looked over at the paperwork on his desk frowned and turned in his chair to gaze out the window. I really don't want war to come to this place, he said softly. He sat like that looking out the window for an unknown amount of time, until an onbu disturbed him with some business. At this point, Naruto sighed and got back to his duties in the Otokage. Three days later at the funeral, all of the shinobi that didn't have missions or guard duty came to Kisame and Hirotoro's funeral, 
Even some civilians showed up. Though most people were there for Kisame because he was a prominent figure within the shinobi ranks. Mia stood next to Naruto after they had both said Kisame's eulogy, and try as they might they were unable to hide their sadness. White roses were soon thrown on top of the coffin by all present and the coffin was then buried. An, I hope I got that at least half right, since I've never been to a funeral. Naruto crouched down next to his friend's grave, I'm sorry old friend. That you had to die, he lowered his head. Mia then continued for Naruto, but. You did always say that it would be a great honor for you to die on the battlefield, while fighting alongside a good friend. She looked over at Naruto who simply sighed and nodded in agreement, I hope you've found peace, he said and stood up. I'm going back to the office, he addressed Mia and left without giving her a chance to reply. Mia stood there in a slight confusion, then kneeled down next to Kisame's grave and whispered, don't worry, I'll take care of him. She tilted her head and looked in the direction of Naruto's house, that is, after I get some answers from him, she clenched her fist. Be at peace my friend. She gently placed his slashed mist forehead protector on the tombstone and vanished. Naruto did go to his office, but could concentrate on anything and finally decided to go home, not wanting to be at the office after that entire ordeal. He was still pissed off about Kisame's death at the hands of someone that he was going to trust. The Yodokage's house was a grand two-story apartment that had a giant living room with a fireplace, a dining room for at least 30 people, a big kitchen, a bathroom, and even a small library on the first floor. On the second floor there was a master bedroom and three guest rooms, and three more bathrooms. As soon as he came in, Naruto found Mia sitting on the couch in the living room, with a serious look on her face. Naruto wasn't too surprised to find her there, since she could get into just about any place, guarded or unguarded. Mia stood up and walked over to him. She stopped right in front of him and looked him dead in the eyes, what the hell happened out there? She demanded. Look, when I heard about Kisame, I was pissed off too, but did you really expect anything better? She asked. Maybe, he said in a slightly calmer tone, maybe I expected some impossible act of forgiveness. I sure as hell paid for it. I told you not to go back there, nothing good can come from visiting your home village. I would know, she added sadly. Naruto suddenly turned to face her, W what do you mean, you know? I went back, after the Akatsuki fell apart, maybe hoping to make up with my old friends, explained Mia in a slightly bitter tone. They blamed me for everything bad that had happened to the village since my departure. But most of all they only saw me as a loose end from the operation to bring down the Akatsuki. The cutting of all the threads, mumbled Naruto and Mia nodded. But why didn't you tell me this before I went, his voice was becoming frustrated again. I would have given it more thought or at least not rushed in there like I did. Before Naruto could react, Mia punched him in the stomach and pushed him back against the wall. She broke the skin just above his wrist with a kunai and slowly pulled upwards, do you really think I like talking about killing my friends? She asked in a dead cold tone. Do you believe my heart to be dead? Once she reached his shoulder she withdrew and her eyes almost instantly lost that coldness, I care about Kisame's death. More than I would ever show, she said softly. You know. You had about the same training. Hiding and or masking our emotions is basically instinctive. I know, sighed Naruto, I'm sorry. He added very softly. He looked down at his arm and quickly generated some chakra to heal it all up. Mia was stunned, she had never heard him use that kind of tone with anyone. On a second take, she realized that the message was genuine, he's never apologized and really meant it. Maybe only to Itachi-san. He's always been the best of us to conceal emotions. Lifetime's practice he said. However, Mia could not figure out what he would be apologizing for, he wouldn't be sorry for interrogating her, could it not be meant for me? She wondered. A long silence passed in the room. It was my fault. He finally said. Huh? Mia wondered. What could have been his fault? The fact that the Leaf Village rejected him? Or could he be talking about Kisame? I must have been too forceful, he continued in a subdued voice, I figured I couldn't go into the meeting in obvious regret, I thought it would make it look like I was begging. Good thinking, if you had done that then they would have surely walked all over you, she thought, but stayed silent. I certainly didn't want that, if they were going to accept me then they were going to accept me for myself not for another mask that I would put up to gain their trust, he explained. You of all people should realize that I didn't really go there for the scroll, it was a nifty excuse to tell myself and anyone that doubted my motives. I would have definitely offered them peace and some sort of comeuppance, but before all that I had to feel them out. And this is where I messed up. He turned around so that his back was to her, so that she could not see the emotions running across his face. Several things that should not have been said, were, and it went downhill from there, 
he tightened his fist. I should have seen it, noticed the little, subtle things that went on in the meeting. I was so absolutely convinced that Tsunade would still like me, that it rendered me blind. Mia could see that this was tearing him apart, he had honestly counted on at least neutrality between the villages, she reached out an arm towards him, but hesitated. Do they know? About you being the Otokage, that is? Yes, I told the Hokage right before we left, he answered. Shock and maybe even fear. Intermixed with her previous coldness. Serves her right, underestimating Naruto like that. That bitch, thought Mia, though also wondered why she was suddenly being so forceful. Maybe I should still extend my hand, this time as the Otokage, wondered Naruto. What? Don't tell me that you are actually considering doing that after everything they did to you, Mia replied vehemently. It was my fault so I should make amends, he said in a half-broken voice. It's not your fault, they made the decision by themselves, she countered. They surely know that no one comes to the negotiations table, without at least some pride and maybe even a card up their sleeve. Still they deserved better. Mia cut him off, persistence is futile. Those people will never change, she yelled. They are not all like that. How many? She asked compellingly, how many do you still consider your friends and vice versa? Five? Less, Naruto answered. One. Perhaps. One? Her mind screamed. I wasn't expecting anything that bad. My god. I don't know if even he would forgive me for everything I've done. Do you really intend to do all this for just one person, that might not even like you anymore? She asked him in a soft tone. But he was there for me. Naruto trailed off. If he had been there for you, we wouldn't be talking right now, and you wouldn't have joined the Akatsuki after running away, she concluded. Well, I don't know. He's just. If Tsunade turned on me then surely he's not too far behind. After all the QB did kill his entire family. Naruto, she said as she snaked her arm around his waist from behind and held him close to her. There are people right here that care about you. Maybe you should also cut all the threads? Naruto sighed deeply and relaxed a little in her in her embrace, I know, he sighed again. He paused to think a little, cut all the threads you say? Well, you said it before me, she answered softly. Yes, I think I will do exactly that, replied Naruto. If this person can forgive me then, he will also have to side with me. But I will not hold out my hand. Mia? Hmm? Thank you and I'm sorry again, he said. Mia was confused once more, that sorry was meant for me, but why? Naruto turned around to face her and put his hands on her shoulders, but couldn't make his eyes meet hers, I know about your feelings, he said after a slight pause. Mia was startled, w what? My feelings, but. She decided to feign ignorance. What feelings are you talking about exactly? Naruto chuckled a little, no games, Mia, Itachi told me. Me being in absolute ignorance about things like that, I never noticed, he calmly said, amused to find her so shocked. So you've known all this time, huh? But then that would mean that you don't reciprocate, right? She looked away not wanting to see his face when he said it. Back then, things were different, we were both in the Akatsuki and any kind of relationship seemed just a bit impossible, he began to explain. Then there was the whole leaf mission incident and Itachi's death and I just had to leave, she nodded. After that, revenge was just about the only thing on my mind. I did go to the grass country right after I had found out that the Akatsuki was gone, I guess subconsciously hoping that I would find you. Then I helped out in the sand, killed Orochimaru, took control of this village and sent some people to find you and Kisame and you know the story from there, he concluded. Mia nodded at the last part, but was still unsure how that answered her question, so? She asked not really sure what to ask. Naruto smirked, so much for your own training of being able to read emotions, he said in a joking tone. Hey! It's hard enough to make coherent sense out of what you say, she snapped. Exactly what do you mean by that? He questioned. I make prefect sense. Really now? Then how come even I can't understand? You're doing it on purpose of course, he half yelled, to piss me off. Hey, you're not as clueless as I thought, he laughed. Very funny, said Naruto in an annoyed tone. Oh come on, you're too uptight. Of course I know what you mean. So then, why? He asked confused. Idiot. I wanted a straight answer, she answered. Oh. Well in that case, I like you too, Mia, confessed Naruto with a slight blush on his face. Mia mirrored Naruto's blush and quickly hugged him part of the reason being so that he wouldn't see the emotions in her eyes. I'm actually saddened that you weren't able to resolve things with the leaf, said Mia. Yay, so am I. 
After all that, did you at least get the scroll? She asked kindly. Naruto broke the hug and walked over the mantelpiece and drew his finger over the surface. A secret compartment rose up from the mantelpiece and Naruto took out the scroll from it. Have you read it yet? She asked. Naruto nodded, but it wasn't what I was expecting. How so? Mia asked with a little concern. Well, of course it had an apology and an explanation for why he sealed the cubie within me, Naruto explained in a soft tone. But there was also an alternate reason for the whole thing. He paused. Well, it just gives me a new cause, Naruto concluded. So, what are you going to do now? The rest of the day, I'm going to spend in remembrance of a fallen comrade and old friend, he stated sadly. Mia nodded in agreement and they stayed at his house for the rest of the day and night, talking about the past times. Mia stayed the night at the Otokage's house, in a guest bedroom just as she had done several other times. Naruto woke up late the next morning with a feeling that he was forgetting to do something. He got up and walked into the kitchen to find Mia had already prepared breakfast. Morning, she greeted. Morning, answered Naruto in a slightly worried tone. What is it? I feel like I've forgotten something important. Mia thought for a moment, does it relate to the meeting? I think so. He trailed off as he realized what it was, oh. Mia tilted her head to the side, oh? Judging by your tone, you don't really want to deal with it or you don't really know how to deal with it. It concerns the prisoners that I was going to give back to the leaf, Naruto said. Well, I doubt that you're going to just let them loose now. Of course not but at the meeting I told the Hokage that I would send her Konohamaru in a box, he explained. And you're thinking if that is really the best course of action, am I right? She asked already knowing the answer, he nodded. If I remember correctly he's the previous Hokage's grandson, so you might get a handsome random for him, she offered. Yes, but. But, he's a liability right? Exactly, replied Naruto. Then, kill him along with a female and have them both delivered to the leaf village, she simply replied. Maybe even have one of our spies put his dead body in a highly visible place. You're quite sadistic when it comes to that kind of stuff, you know? No worse than you, she replied with a sadistic grin. Suddenly an idea hit Naruto and he showed a malicious grin, I'll use one of them as the delivery girl. Mia raised an eyebrow and smirked, you don't bluff on your threats. Nope. After breakfast Naruto made his way to the dungeon and asked the guards to prepare a box for the male prisoner's body, and to also release the girl and bring over to Konohamaru's cell. He then made his way over to Konohamaru. Naruto looked into Konohamaru's cell and saw him sitting down in the corner with one of his hands chained to the wall. Hey, he called from the outside. Konohamaru instantly recognized that voice and didn't even bother looking up, what the hell do you want? He asked with bitterness. Well, I thought I'd tell you that your village decided that you aren't worth anything, so they will not be paying your ransom, he said with a slight amusement. I don't care, I would die for my village, he declared, looking up the Otokage with determined eyes. Naruto laughed at this, until he noticed the anger in Konohamaru's eyes, oh don't worry I'm not laughing at you. In fact, I think that that's very honorable that you think like that, said Naruto in an amused tone. Very few ninjas like you in the leaf, and they throw them away just like that. Stupid, if you ask me. Naruto looked over to see Moegi being dragged over to Konohamaru's cell. Finally the guards managed to get her right over to Naruto and chained her to the door of the opposite cell. Why do you struggle so much? Don't you want to see your lifelong friend? Asked Naruto emotionlessly. Moegi spat in his face, no. I don't want to see him get beaten up in front of me, she yelled. Naruto looked over at the guards in question, really now? It's a form of interrogation, Otokage-sama, I'm sorry if. One of the guards started to apologize, but Naruto cut him off. No, it is no big deal. Nothing to be sorry for, he turned back to Moegi and wiped the spit off his face. Though, now I'll have to make this even more interesting, he said sadistically and flashed his blood-red eyes fro Moegi. Make sure she watches, he ordered the guards. Then in softer tone whispered to them, though you don't have to, the guards nodded in understanding. Naruto opened the cell door and stepped in, now then Konohamaru-kun, let's start. Do your worst, he stated confidently. Oh you don't want my worst, said Naruto, plus then it would be over too quickly. Naruto opened up his robe to reveal dozens of needles, hooks, scalpels and what looked like dull, rusty knives. Naruto noticed Konohamaru's determination waver a little bit and smirked a little. Naruto took one of the needles, grabbed Konohamaru's free hand, pushed the palm up against the wall, 
and stuck the needle straight through the nail of the thumb pinning Konohamaru to the wall. He then repeated the process with his other hand. Both times Konohamaru gritted his teeth to keep from crying out in pain. Naruto smirked at his determination and decided to hit a few more pressure points all over his arms. Konohamaru was still able to resist the pain, which made him worthy in Naruto's eyes. Naruto then decided to switch over to the hooks. He made sure that there were other hooks in the wall slightly above the leaf nin and he slowly removed the needles that pinned Konohamaru to the wall. Since Konohamaru wasn't fed well, most of his muscles had atrophied and so he wasn't really able to resist what Naruto was doing to him. The Otokage turned him around and put several hooks through his back and hung him up on the wall. Naruto then proceeded to cut several muscles in Konohamaru's legs with a scalpel and then switched his attention to the leaf nin's torso. Naruto took out his dull and rusty blades and cut a star-shaped design into Konohamaru's chest, making sure to do it slow enough so that he would feel the maximum amount of pain. A.N., I could write more, but then it would have to be rated R. The tortures continued like that for another hour or two. Somewhere in the middle Konohamaru finally cracked and at first started whimpering, then broke down fully crying out in pain. At the same time Moigi was also crying and begging for Naruto to stop. When Naruto finally did stop, Konohamaru was completely covered in blood from head to toe and he was barely breathing. For the finale, Naruto had activated his demonic eyes and used hell on Konohamaru. Why? Why do you have to be so cruel to him? Moigi sobbed. She had long ago tried to look away, but the guards made sure that she watched everything. He's going to die like that. Please leave him alone, she desperately begged the Otokich. Then as she saw Naruto step away from Konohamaru and walk out of the cell, leaving her closest friend to bleed to death she yelled out, won't you at least get a doctor for him? Naruto turned back to her and brought his demonic eyes to look directly into hers, you have too many requests, little girl. Moigi whimpered. If you hadn't spit in my face I would have made his death quick, but no, you had to prolong it, he stated coldly. But don't worry you will get your true wish and go home, he told her. You'll just have the small duty of delivering Konohamaru to the leaf, do you accept? She quickly nodded, mostly out of fear and continued crying. Good, said Naruto and threw a kunai straight into Konohamaru's heart, killing him instantly. No, yelled Moigi. What the hell did you do that for? Since you so nicely accepted my offer, I ended his suffering, coldly answered Naruto. No, Konohamaru-kun. No, Moigi cried even more. Put the body in the box and get the girl at some semi-decent clothes and escort her to the borders of the sound country, he ordered the guards. Then added, and don't worry about cleaning the body up. The Otokage left the dungeon and made his way to his office to get back to his work. By the end of the day, he received a report that Moigi has been escorted to the border and left to get back to the leaf by any means she can. Naruto was sure that with the current tension, the border would be closely watched and that Moigi would be escorted to the leaf by some Anbu. Later that night, Naruto met up with Mia and they went to get a bite to eat. Even though, Naruto was with the girl he likes, his face only showed gloominess. What's wrong Naruto-kun? Asked Mia with concern. Naruto stayed silent for a moment, I lost control today. With the leaf nin? Remember how I told you that I was going to make it quick for him? He asked. Mia nodded, for old time's sake, you said. Well, when Moigi spit in my face, she reminded me so much of Tsunade. That I just lost it, he said slowly. I just kept seeing Kisame's death face and that little mocking look that the Hokage gave me when she went back on the deal. I see, she said in serious voice. I understand what happened. The rest of the dinner passed in silence. Afterwards they walked to the Otokage's place and just as Naruto shut the door behind them he asked Mia a question. Do you think I'm just like Orochimaru? Mia quickly turned around to face him in confusion. What? How could you even ask that? It's just that, I betrayed my home village murdered several shinobi from there and now I have my own village with which I'm going to wage war against my home village, he explained. Mia frowned, no, there is no way I'm going to let him compare himself with that snake, she decided. Naruto, you are definitely not like that snake. He ran away for a much more selfish reason than you and you killed those shinobi out of survival reasons, she tried to reason with him. Plus, you are waging war for a much better reason than that snake could have ever come up with. I guess, sighed Naruto but why do I always get seen as the evil one? Only by your enemies, Naruto, she reassured. Your enemies will always see you as an evil being. Naruto sniffled a little, I know what I have to do and I have a good reason why I should do it, but. He paused for a few seconds, but why did two of my closest friends have to die for me to get here? 
and how many more of my friends will have to die before this is finally over. Mia gently embraced him and for the first time in more than 12 years Naruto openly cried on Mia's shoulder. Mia held him tight and whispered comforting words into his ear. After a few minutes he stopped and looked up into her eyes, thank you. You're welcome, she gently replied. Do you feel better now that you've released all the pain and suffering you've been keeping inside? Hmm. Definitely, he smiled at her, and she smiled back. Thanks for being here, Mia, he said and gently kissed her. Mia was a little shocked, but kissed back. Several days later in the Leaf Village. Hokage-sama, our scouts are coming back earlier than expected, reported a guard. Reason for their return? Asked Tsunade expecting it to be a confrontation with Sound Nin. They said that they are bringing someone back. Tsunade's heart skipped a beat, bring them to me as soon as they get back, she ordered. She thought back to Naruto's parting words, was I wrong to assume that to be an empty anger-induced threat? She wondered. Within the hour three people entered the Hokaye's office, two of them carrying a box and the third carrying a girl in his arms. Tsunade instantly recognized the girl as Moegi. Where did you find her? She half yelled. Just on the border to the sound country, answered the Anbu. We observed her in that coffin, getting dumped onto our side of the border and left there. And that would then be Konohamaru, said Tsunade sadly pointing to the coffin. Yes, Hokage-sama, answered the same Anbu. We opened it up to make sure it wasn't a bomb. The Hokage nodded and noticed that Moegi was stirring. Take the coffin to the morgue and please inform his friends. Leave Moegi here, I'll need to talk to her, they bowed and disappeared out of the office with the coffin. Tsunade walked over to Moegi to make sure she wasn't too badly hurt. Except for a couple of bruises and a couple of small cuts, the girl was absolutely fine. Moegi, are you alright? asked Tsunade in a concerned tone. The girl half opened her eyes and smiled a little when she saw Tsunade, Hokage-sama. She then mumbled something about home and then started crying again. Yes, you're home. No need to worry anymore, reassured the Hokage. Konohamaru-kun. He's dead, Moegi sobbed. He tortured him to death. Tsunade's face twisted in an angry frown at this, this he must be Naruto. And he was obviously using this poor girl as the messenger, that twisted bastard. Moegi, don't worry he can't hurt you anymore. No, he didn't do anything to me. I just watched as his ass. She couldn't finish her sentence. However she didn't need as Tsunade had already put the pieces together. Moegi, I'll have someone escort you to the hospital. Just rest now, we'll get that bastard, said Tsunade bitterly. Just then Udon burst into the office and instantly made his way to Moegi and hugged her, happy that she was alive. Udon, please escort Moegi to the hospital. She's had a very long day, Udon nodded and scooped Moegi up in his arms and disappeared in a cloud of smoke. The Hokage sat down hard in her chair, I guess war is inevitable, she mumbled. She knew all too well that the village was not ready for war at the moment, so she would have to start preparing her forces and strengthening alliances. She wondered whom the sand would ally with in the event of a war. Through Jiraiya's espionage, Tsunade knew that Naruto had in fact helped Tamari gain power and also that the San knew a long time ago who the Otokage was, and hence had made the trade agreement with the Sound because of Naruto. I see two options, either the San siding with the Sound, which would prove very bad for the Leaf or the San simply staying neutral, which would a bit more beneficial for the Leaf, the Hokage mused. And we were just weakened with the dead of Jiraiya, she mumbled remembering the funeral several days back. The Hyuga head, Hinata, was also killed and Sasuke and Sakura are both in the hospital with medium to heavy injuries, respectively. Well, if I learned one thing from that meeting it's that sound shinobi cannot be taken lightly, said Tsunade. And then there's the Otokage, Naruto. Being able to kill two Sanin, is a feat that is quite incredible in itself. I wonder if I would be able to stand up to him if the sound decided to attack first. After a bit of contemplating, Tsunade called in her special jounin and the best strategist, Shikamaru and briefed them on the situation. Shikamaru instantly suggested building up the Leaf's defenses, before focusing on the offensive. His reason being that if the Otokage felt superior to the Hokage then there was high chance that he would decide to strike first. The next two years were spent just building up defenses, before at last focusing on the offensive. The Leaf had a pretty difficult time forming military alliances, since the sound had made it known that there was increasing tension that could very easily lead to war. So other hidden villages knew that an alliance with the Leaf would ultimately lead to a war with the sound. The smaller villages especially didn't want this, mostly because they had profitable trade agreements with the sound. About halfway through the fourth year, Konoha did manage to sign an alliance with the Mist Village. 
On the other hand, the sound had no problem signing military alliances. The hidden cloud was especially happy to be in an alliance that may give them the chance to get even with Konoha. Naruto had thought that the stone would accept an alliance, but just as he was making the offer, a war had broken out between the stone and snow. The stone knew exactly what the sound was making alliances for and politely declined the alliance saying that they didn't want to fight a war on two fronts. That's what happened officially, however unofficially the Odokage had set up a treaty with the stone making it possible for Sound Shinobi to participate in the war with the snow disguised as Stone Nin. Main reason for this being practice, though Naruto didn't want to lose too many people in this endeavor, and because of that only high-ranked shinobi were allowed to go. By the time that Konoha had allied with the mist, Otto had allied with the cloud and rain. Naruto had respected Tamari's decision to stay out of the war, however he did get her to agree to create a distraction if need be. That's what the plan was for the rain shinobi, to create a distraction so that troops may be snuck into the leaf village's proximity. The Otokage had increased the training of the younger generation, taking them out of the academy a year earlier and making sure that they were assigned to a Jounen instructor specifically based on their affinities. The sound was developing shinobi that were trained to the limit of their abilities in the area that they were best in, whether it be Tai, Jan or Ninjutsu. Konoha, Tsunade's office. Shikamaru, what makes you think that an attack will come soon? Asked Tsunade. Shikamaru groaned, the sound has had enough time to prepare and certainly they know that several of our special Jounen are out on an S-class mission. It's the most opportune time, he explained. There was about the same situation two years ago, and nothing happened, said Sasuke. We should increase our defenses regardless, countered Shikamaru. Suddenly an Anbu rushed in, Hokage-sama, Rain Shinobi are attacking in the northwest. The attack is beginning, said Shikamaru. Tsunade jumped out of her chair, we need to send our Shinobi out there. Shikamaru interrupted her, if the Rain are attacking from the northwest, then the sound and cloud will attack from their borders. Tsunade quickly considered his point, true, we need to send troops out towards the sound border and the northeast border. Get it done, she commanded the Anbu, he bowed and disappeared. Shikamaru, what are our defenses like here? asked Tsunade. Tower and gate guards mostly, he replied. Dozens of shinobi, of all ranks, wandering around in the village. We should send out some of the best Anbu towards the borders to stop the initial attacks and show them they won't even be able to enter the fire country, offered Sasuke. No, declared Shikamaru. Why not? The Uchiha raised his voice. Consider Naruto's personality, his style is to hit as close to heart as possible, explained Shikamaru somewhat sadly. The rain and sound borders are too far away for a proper effect. Then, what the hell do you think he's going to do? A direct attack on the village? asked Sasuke incredulously. Shikamaru shrugged. All right, I want to split it, ordered the Hokage. I want half of the best Anbu teams out there on the border and have to stay in defense of Konoha. The decision was reasonable, even though Shikamaru couldn't shake the bad feeling that the decisions they were making now were life deciding, but he knew better than to oppose the Hokage's orders. About half an hour later, Shikamaru and Sasuke both came back to inform the Hokage that the Anbu teams and several Jounen were sent off to the rain and sound borders. I still say that we should have sent the more powerful and experienced shinobi, said Sasuke. Shikamaru sighed in annoyance and mumbled troublesome, I keep telling you that the main attack cannot come so far from his real objective, he explained for what seemed like the hundredth time today. Suddenly the three leaf nin felt a chill run up their spine and their skin crawl. You feel that? asked Sasuke. What the hell was that? asked Shikamaru. Tsunade on the other hand, had a horrified look on her face. Sasuke was just about to ask her if she knew what it was, when an explosion was heard and the ground shook. The group looked out the window and saw black smoke coming from the main gate. Right after they heard a loud roar and saw something red swaying behind the smoke. Oh God, said Tsunade with her hand over her mouth. Wah? Sasuke wasn't able to finish. A wind blew and cleared the smoke temporarily making the thing behind the smoke completely visible. A giant deep red fox with eight tails was towering over the destroyed main gate, its very light blue almost white eyes were fixed on the Hokage Tower, as if saying come out and fight me. Chapter 20, Judgment Day A solitary figure crouched in a tree a quarter of a mile outside of the leaf village, and watched calmly from behind his masking jutsu as a significant amount of Anbu, Jounen and Chonin left the village making their way north. Perfect, he whispered. He jumped down onto the main road and calmly started walking towards Konoha. Halfway to the gate he was stopped by two Anbu guards, who goes there? One of them yelled out. 
Both kept their distance from the blonde-haired man who wore pants with a shuriken holder on each leg, a jacket with very loose sleeves, a face mask, and a half-cape half-robe that hung down to the man's knees, and a katana strapped to his back, all of his apparel was absolutely black. The man kept his head down so that the guards could not see his face. Another thing the guards didn't notice was the symbol of sound, in red on the back of the cape. In response to the question the man lifted up his head and smirked when the guards flinched at his red demon eyes, why why you, stuttered out the older Anbu, the DDD demon. Both quickly went into a fighting stance. Naruto just smirked and pulled up his left sleeve, revealing the tattoo. The Anbu paused unsure what to make of this, and decided to just wait and see what happened, making their deadliest mistake. Naruto bit his thumb and swiped the blood all the way along his forearm. A dozen hand seals later, he yelled Yumakushios no Jutsu, and slammed his left hand on the ground. The ground underneath Naruto and the Anbu was scorched black and in a cloud of black smoke a giant fox with eight tails appeared, one of its paws instantly killing both Anbu. Naruto-sama, said the fox, you are in need to my help? Yes, HP, replied Naruto. We are going to finish what your brother started. The fox grinned a malicious smile and waved two of its tails in a special way. The ground under the main gate welled up and exploded taking out the entire gate and a portion of wall around it. HP isolated every single chakra signature in the vicinity and focused his eyes on the strongest, which was in the Hokage Tower. HP, I'm going to hide myself in your fur for a little while, said Naruto. I need you to lead them away from the village, even if you have to pretend to be losing. HP grumbled, but agreed nevertheless and started to slowly make his way through the village destroying everything even slightly in his way. Hokage Tower Hokage-sama, what the hell are we going to against another demon fox? Asked several dozen shinobi that had accumulated in the Hokage's office. Tsunade silently walked to the scroll room and brought back the forbidden scroll, we are going to face it head on, she said gravely. Go, gather all the Anbu, Jounin and Chonin and hold off the fox until I get there. She ordered. Everyone left to fulfill the order except one, Tsunade-sama, are you really going to use the same jutsu as Yondaime? Asked Shizun in a saddened voice. Maybe I won't have to, but I'd better learn it anyway, replied Tsunade as she searched for the jutsu within the scroll. This is probably the only way, she thought sadly. Even if history has to repeat itself. Many explosion and screams were heard as the demon fox was slowly being pushed out of the village. Tsunade had taken about an hour to learn the jutsu and another half hour to write her will, Shizun had stayed with her the entire time. Shizun, it's time to go, Tsunade said slowly. Shizun nodded gravely and left to get all her battle gear. As soon as she left Tsunade fell into her seat, God, please don't let this turn out like it did 26 years ago, the god I'm Hokage prayed. Meanwhile on the outskirts of the village, Hichibi was slowly letting the leaf shinobi push him back, just as Naruto had requested. He suddenly felt that powerful chakra from before approaching him, finally someone stronger than these bugs, he thought. Naruto smirked as he also felt Tsunade approaching, finally, time to get the show on the road. As soon as Tsunade arrived on the battlefield, she summoned her slug, Katsuyu. A demon fox? Asked Katsuyu. We have to fight him, and if worst comes to worst we'll seal him, answered Tsunade. Trying to be like the Yondaime? Asked Katsuyu jokingly. Hopefully not, replied Tsunade, thinking of how Naruto turned out. A slug? Scoffed Chibi. You're sending a slug after me? He chuckled slightly. Tsunade scowled and Katsuyu became slightly irritated at being underestimated, Zeshi Nenzen, she said, sticky mouth acid. A stream of acid shot out of Katsuyu's mouth right at the fox. HP quickly sidestepped it and clawed at the slug, which dodged his attack by moving to the side. During this time, Katsuyu made a smaller replication of itself, which Tsunade threw onto the fox's side. Out of the corner of his eye, HP saw what the slug and its summoner had done and channeled chakra into the fur on its side. Kitsune spiked fur, calmly said the demon fox. The fur on the fox's side stood up in completely rigid and razor-sharp spikes. The throne replication landed right in the spikes and died instantly. Shit! Cursed Tsunade. The slug pulled its head back once more and shot out some more fluid, slime covering. This time instead of the fluid being directed at the demon fox, it was shot right below him and spread out along the majority of the forest. HP leapt back a significant distance and watched cautiously as the slime spread out. From the looks of it, this substance must make the ground incredibly slippery, he observed how the slug had no problem moving along its surface, but this is probably a natural thing for slugs, hence it has no problem with it. 
the demon fox's tail swung around violently and the ground shook, causing Katsuyu and the Konoha army to slow their approach. Suddenly a mist appeared and covered up the fox enough so that Tsunade and Katsuyu could not very well anticipate his next move. Damn it, I forgot that demon foxes have an affinity for Doden and Sutan, grumbled Tsunade. Katsuyu, however, did not want to give the demon fox any kind of opportunity and rushed toward him. Once she was within the range of the fog, she was roughly flung to the side by a few of his tails. Noticing that the demon fox had its back to them, the Jounin decided that it was the opportune moment to blast it with fireballs. This however completely exposed their position to the demon fox and Naruto. So while Shpi masterfully dodged the fireballs, Naruto carefully prepared a jutsu, by the time he was done Katsuyu had joined the ranks of Jounin and Chounin that were hurling projectiles at the demon fox. Kinjutsu Kaden, Lake of Fire, rang out for everyone to hear. With only a slight delay, the ground beneath Katsuyu and several hundred meters around her was set aflame. Dozens of shinobi perished in the initial flames, others jumped up on trees and were incinerated once the flames rose up to their proportional height, an, proportional to the radius of the lake, but many managed to escape from the flames and run to safety. Katsuyu was having it a lot harder, since she was in the center of the fire. At first she tried to make her way out of the flames, but found that that would take too long. So instead she covered herself entirely in non-flammable slime. The only problem was that she had to constantly replace the layers, because the intense heat was melting them off. After about two minutes the flames ceased, leaving behind scorched earth in the radius of the lake and small fires, still burning, on the outskirts. Tsunade looked around to assess the damage and didn't like what she saw, damn it. That killed several dozen shinobi and wasted half of Katsuyu's chakra, she frowned, there is no way we can take another hit like that. Suddenly she realized that the voice that had spoken the jutsu wasn't the same as that of the demon fox. She looked up at the demon fox and found a person standing on top of its head. The blonde-haired and black-clothed man stood out against the deep red of the fox. That couldn't be, she mumbled. What, does the old hag not recognize me in her old age? Asked Naruto. Tsunade scowled, Naruto, she spat out, you've released another demon fox onto the world. You don't have to make it sound so negative, you know he replied calmly. So you plan to defeat us all with this demon? She asked bitterly. Naruto responded with laughter, just because you're on home territory doesn't mean you shouldn't be aware of your surroundings. I am quite aware that we managed to push you and this demon far from Konoha, replied Tsunade with confidence. And we can continue pushing you away. As Tsunade said this, Katsuyu rushed at Hb. Hb stood completely still, and right before Katsuyu made contact with him a giant pillar of flame shot out in between them and went upwards sky high. Both parties appeared unscratched by the attack. You missed, taunted Tsunade. Only wasting chakra again, just like when you were a little kid. Naruto chuckled darkly, I told you to be aware of your surroundings, but I guess that at that point it already didn't matter. It suddenly clicked in Shikamaru's head, as he went completely pale, the village, he softly mumbled. What was that, Shikamaru? asked Sasuke, who was still wondering what the dobi meant by surroundings. Our surroundings. Shikamaru trailed off. The dobi is just being stupid again, we managed to push the demon fox far from the village, said Sasuke arrogantly. Shikamaru suddenly grabbed Sasuke by the collar and pulled his face close, that's just it. Don't you get it? He wanted us to push him away, explained Shikamaru. That last attack, wasn't actually an attack. He released Sasuke and teleported next to Tsunade. Hokage-sama, we must retreat back to the village, yelled Shikamaru. What nonsense are you blabbering the demon is right in front of us, she said coldly. The pillar of flame wasn't an attack, it was a beacon, said Shikamaru desperately. Tsunade whipped her head around to the sound of a distant explosion coming from Konoha. Not surprising that the genius Shikamaru has figured it out, Naruto nodded slowly in appreciation of Shikamaru's abilities. You plan to drive most of the shinobi out of the village by making yourself and the demon fox seem like the biggest threat, reasoned Shikamaru. Naruto motioned him to continue. And now that we are all here, you have signaled your army to attack the village, concluded Shikamaru. Quite so, said Naruto. Though I expected you to see through it. I mean, in a war, why would I simply attack you with just one summoning? But the counterargument is that the cage of a village wouldn't want to put himself in such a vulnerable position unless it was absolutely necessary, in which case it would mean that the rest of your troops are out on the borders of the fire country, reasoned Shikamaru. But things aren't quite so, now are they? asked Naruto slyly. Tsunade turned to face her army, 
Everyone pull back and protect the village. She ordered. A shadow then passed over her and a few seconds later the ground rumbled to her side, the demon fox had leapt over Konoha's army and was now blocking their way back to the village. Did you really think I would let you go? Naruto smirked darkly. Shit. Tsunade scowled and mentally cursed. HP, I'm going to need you to occupy these people while I prepare a jutsu, said Naruto. HP nodded in understanding as he saw Naruto close his eyes in concentration and hold his hands in the beginning hand seal. HP jumped at Tsunade and Katsuyu, just as Naruto started off his long sequence of seals. HP poured chakra into his paws, increasing his speed, and attacked Katsuyu from all sides in several seconds. Dodging was out of the question for the slug, as it was definitely not on par with HP in speed, so it was forced to take all the slashings to its sides. Katsuyu managed to heal herself, but found she was running very low on chakra. When Shpi eased off his attacks, Katsuyu tried to use the time given to slow the fox down by spraying the Zeshi Nenzen at it, but Shpi dodged and diverted his attention to attacking other shinobi. Just as Shpi landed from dodging Katsuyu's Zeshi Nenzen, Naruto clapped his hands together and the sky above them darkened. Thick black clouds stretched outwards from right above Naruto, and spread in a spiral motion covering Katsuyu and Shpi. Not too bad on the timing, if I had waited I would have been rooted to the ground with the sticky stuff, thought Shpi. Now I just have to keep them away from Naruto without moving. A tendril of chakra went around Naruto while his hands were together and disappeared as he started doing more hand seals. I hope HP can keep everyone away from me, this jutsu requires too much concentration and precision, mused Naruto as he was picking his way through the necessary seals. Sasuke had his Sharingan activated and was looking at Naruto, he's releasing an incredible amount of chakra, he said. Enough for half a dozen Karyu Endons. To spend this much on one jutsu, what kind of monstrosity is he planning? Tsunade has realized quickly enough that Naruto had to be interrupted before he was able to complete the jutsu, but despite her best efforts, Hishpi's defenses were not to be conquered. Between his tails and the constant shielding jutsus that he put around his head or just Naruto, neither she nor her troops were able to even scratch Naruto. The kid better be getting done with his preparations, I can't hold these chakra-burning defenses for much longer. Naruto had suddenly stopped making seals and held the last one for a little while before switching to the ram seal and holding it such that his middle and index fingers were touching the tip of his nose, his eyes still closed in concentration. Naruto snapped open his eyes and locked them on Katsuyu, Kinjutsu Raiden, Lightning Storm no Jutsu, he yelled. A large bolt of lightning came out of the center of the storm clouds above them and hit Katsuyu dead on the head. As soon as that first bolt of lightning had come down, Hishpi jumped back, so as to clear the radius of the black clouds. In midair he watched as dozens of lightning bolts, thought each consecutively smaller than each previous one, rained down onto everything within the blast area. The first lightning bolt that had hit Katsuyu split outwards from the slug to hit a dozen surrounding living targets, frying and killing them instantly. The same was true if the smaller bolts hit any animate objects on their way down. The smarter shinobi had jumped down to ground level hoping not to be hit by lightning and had, for the most part, been successful in avoiding death. Katsuyu had disappeared from chakra exhaustion and being dealt a fatal blow. Tsunade managed to jump down and raise a Doten Kikai to absorb the lighting. Many experienced shinobi used Doten, Shinju Uzanshu to hide underground and wait out the attack, among them was Sasuke. Shikamaru was not fast enough in getting off of Katsuyu and was the first to have the lightning jump to and incinerate. When it was all over the black storm cloud swirled inwards and disappeared. The stench of burned flesh and clothing hung in the air. The survivors were mostly digging themselves out of the ground, only several had gotten lucky enough and managed to not get hit while sitting in the trees. Those were ones that were the most disturbed by what had happened. Not surprising really, watching their friends and comrades get hit while they were being left alive by simple luck, is unnerving for anyone. The Konoha army had been decimated, those who were left were all surrounding blonde-haired Otokich. Hp had left, since he was unfortunate enough to be hit with a lighting bolt and not have enough chakra to safeguard himself from very much of the damage. The bolt had of course split and hit Naruto as well, completely destroying his cape and leaving his jacket all tattered. Naruto looked around at all the shinobi that were left and noted that he only recognized Kakashi, Gai, Sasuke and of course Tsunade. The Hokage, however, was well worn from the battle with Hp, trying to penetrate his defenses. Kakashi and Sasuke had used about half of their chakra on ninjutsus, so that left Guy as the most dangerous opponent. The others, while Naruto was sure that they could pull their weight, did not seem to concern him. Shall we? asked Naruto, and disappeared jumping back and sticking a claw straight through an unprepared shinobi's throat. Within a split second, 
he felt a presence on both his left and right. Jumping up and twisting his body he said, Konoha Goriki Senpu. Adding a bit of chakra to his counterattack, he was able to break the neck of the first attacker and blast back the second attacker. Guy's eyes narrowed, how do you know that move? He asked, bitter that his opponent knew techniques from his style. Itachi was a good teacher, Naruto smirked at the angry scowl on Sasuke's face. I'll throw him off balance with emotions and that'll be one less jounin to deal with. While Naruto was talking he sensed a team of sound jounin closing in on his position, how nice to know that people worry about you, he smiled internally. Just when Kakashi and Guy were going to attack together, Naruto's reinforcements showed up temporarily halting their attack. Naruto recognized his reinforcements to be one of the sound's advanced Anbu squads and nodded in acknowledgement and gratitude of presence. Before the invasion all sound shinobi were briefed on the different bloodlines of Konoha, the Dujutsu bloodlines especially. So the Anbu team that had arrived to help Naruto knew that they would not be able to handle the two Sharingan users and it was understood that Naruto would be the one to take them on. Thus making the reinforcements job relatively simple, to keep all the other enemies away from Naruto until he managed to disable and or kill Kakashi and Sasuke. Once again Naruto made the first move by attacking Kakashi. The silver-haired Jounin was able to predict Naruto's attack completely with his Sharingan eye and so blocked it and was about to do a counter-attack when he suddenly felt a presence behind him. He realized that Naruto had used the cage Bushin and was now attacking him from the back. How come I wasn't able to see when he used the cage Bushin? Wondered Kakashi as he jumped out of the way of the attack. The two Narutos were standing in a battle stance facing Kakashi when suddenly one of them looked down and saw a hand grab his ankle and pull him underground. Kakashi instantly figured that if Naruto was allowing himself to be pulled underground then it must be a clone, so he instead attacked the other Naruto. Kakashi reached Naruto at the same time that Naruto's clone had been pulled down to his neck, but even in that second and a half Naruto had not made any attempt to dodge or prepare a block and by the time Kakashi realized what was going on it was too late, both Naruto's exploded. Kakashi was thrown back quite harshly and into a far tree, while Sasuke was blown out of the ground and shot into mid-air. It was in mid-air, that Sasuke saw chakra strings wrap themselves around him and tighten before he could respond. Sasuke was then roughly pulled down and thrown into a tree. On impact with the tree, the chakra strings seemed to merge with the tree and turn hard as rock. Needless to say they practically bound Sasuke to the tree. With Sasuke disabled and being watched over by his clone, for the time being, Naruto now had a bit of time to fight with his Janan sensei one-on-one. -on -one. Not being one to underestimate the copy ninja, Naruto didn't even give Kakashi enough time to straighten out before he delivered a savage kick to Kakashi's stomach, sending him back into the same tree. Kakashi coughed a bit as he angrily looked up at Naruto. Kakashi, you're slipping, said Naruto in a disappointed tone. I was expecting a Kawarimi or a Cage Bushin. Kibaku Cage Bushin, eh? asked Kakashi. It makes clones a bit more useful, especially against high-level opponents, reasoned Naruto as he made vines break out of the tree behind Kakashi and disable the copy ninja. A normal clone after its hit just goes poof, but these explode and punish the opponent for destroying the clone at close range. Kakashi fought against the restraints, but found them to be chakra-infused and he certainly did not have enough strength or chakra to get out of them. Naruto turned around to see that one of his shinobi had been killed and the others were getting overpowered my guy and Tsunade. Tsunade is being a pain, but I kind of want to talk to her. So I guess Guy will have to die, thought Naruto as he unsheathed his katana. Naruto used the opportunity, when Guy was attacking one of the sound shinobi, to attack Guy from behind. Guy had not expected this, since he had kept track of the other two sound shinobi and knew that they were fighting Tsunade. Who would that be, a clone? Wondered Guy as he blocked the kick to his head, only to catch the small glimmer of a katana. Oh no. I forgot about Naruto. Naruto had attacked Guy from the top and performed a downward kick, so that when he blocked his midsection would be completely open. Naruto used this opening and slashed at Guy with his sword. He had opted for a deep cut expecting Guy to be wearing armor or weights, and was surprised when the katana easily slid through the leaf shinobi's midsection, spraying out blood all over the place. Tsunade had just blasted away one of the sound onbu with a punch right to the jaw, when she heard Guy scream. She looked in the aforementioned direction to see Naruto do a flip and land, with his katana unsheathed and blood dripping off the blade, with his back to Guy, whose stomach was spewing out blood like a geyser. Naruto was about to perform another vine entrapment jutsu, when suddenly he felt a little lightheaded, damn it. Those vines are chakra taxing, cursed Naruto under his breath. Sir, I trained under Miyasama, I could do a vine jutsu to the Hokage, 
suggested the sound onbu by Naruto's side. However, I don't know any that wouldn't inflict harm on the prisoner. That is quite all right, I don't care if you have to poison her, said Naruto, and then recalculated their position. In fact, I leave you two to finish her off. She's low on chakra and as long as you don't get into close range you'll be fine. You're the team's long-range fighter anyway, right? The Anbu nodded. Good, so take care of her and I'm gonna have a talk with these two. Naruto walked over to Sasuke, well, you're up first, he said. What do you have to say to me, filthy traitor? Spat out Sasuke. Now, now Sasuke, don't want to be insulting yourself there, countered Naruto. I made up for my crimes against the village, responded the Uchiha. No, that pathetic village simply forgave their precious Uchiha. They had no idea, nor did they ever want to find out the truth about how great your brother was and what kind of noble service he did for them. No. Those damned idiots always took things at face value never bothering to dig below the surface, yelled Naruto. And you're just like the rest of them, even if it's an issue that is so close to heart. What the hell would you know about that bastard? And what about you Sasuke? You didn't even bother getting to know your brother. It was always about power and recognition for you. You know what, I'll tell you the truth about why Itachi killed your clan and afterwards you can truly judge if your brother was a good and bad person. Humphrey, was the sound heard out of Sasuke. You know that the Uchiha clan isn't considered a noble clan, right? Sasuke nodded. You also know that the Uchiha were the police force for Konoha, right? Sasuke nodded again. So, what does this have to do with anything? He yelled. Shut up and listen. Naruto punched the Uchiha in the face. Well at about the same time that Itachi was born the elders proposed a plan, which would give them enough leverage to force Konoha to give them the nobility title. What the hell do you mean by, force? asked Sasuke. Their plan was to build strong connections with the village council and the majority of the village people, that were mostly based on money and dark favors, that would then allow them to ask for that large favor of being made into nobility, Sasuke raised his eyebrows in amazement and disbelief. By using their law enforcement powers and their honorable reputations, the Uchiha clan set out to corrupt Konoha's powerful and make them help the Uchiha in achieving their desires. Anyone that disagreed with what the Uchiha wanted were arrested and charged with crimes they didn't commit. To make sure that the village council did not find out what they were doing, the Uchiha did secret missions for the council, payment being favors that the council members would owe them. Thus it continued while Itachi was growing up. Surely you remember the night before it all happened, when Itachi was accused of killing his best friend, Shisui, Sasuke nodded dumbly not knowing what to expect next. Well, with the exception of the elders, your father and Shisui, were the ones who wanted this change the most and were willing to go to great lengths to accomplish it. Itachi did not want for this kind of change to occur, he knew what this title caused to happen within the Hyuga and he also knew about the Namuza clan that had wiped themselves out after breaking apart. Itachi wanted the clan to continue living in honor as it had done till then, but knew that he would not be listened to, he knew that he had to find another way to make them change their minds. However, any ideas he may have had were flushed down the drain when he found out, the council would give the Uchiha anything they wanted as soon as they did one last mission for them. The assignment was to rid Konoha of a certain demon, Sasuke's eyes widened at this. Yes Sasuke, the village council hated me, but let's not stray from the story too much. You may not realize or believe, but Itachi was a very loyal and honorable shinobi. He respected the Yondaime and what he had to sacrifice in order to save the village. So the night of the QB container's assassination Itachi intercepted the Uchiha assassin and fought him to the death. Thus killing his best friend, Shisui. That night, the Uchiha had specifically arranged a secret meeting to prove to anyone in doubt that Uchiha Itachi was a traitor to their cause. Only two people were missing from that meeting, Itachi and Shisui, and the latter was supposed to be missing. They knew that Shisui would not commit suicide on the night of such an important mission and they also knew that Itachi wouldn't just miss a clan meeting, so they automatically knew how Shisui died. Naruto paused to look at Sasuke and judge his reaction. Well, then what about the whole thing of measuring his strength? Asked Sasuke. It was a way to test his honor and loyalty to the village. You know he left you with the burden of reconstructing the clan. He also took on the image of the corrupted Uchiha and wanted you to hate him because of it, so that the rebuilt clan would never do that kind of thing. He even directed you to the room that had all the information about the whole operation. I was there, there was nothing there except a scroll about the Mangekyu, said Sasuke angrily. You idiot, of course they wouldn't have the documents lying around in plain view, yelled Naruto. They were concealed by Genjutsu? Or did you not bother going there after you acquired the Sharingan? 
Sasuke narrowed his eyes in anger and shook his head. That's an elaborate story you got there, said the Uchiha heir coldly. Itachi wanted to tell you after you had gotten stronger, but you seemed too hellbent on revenge. I needed power for revenge, yelled Sasuke. Haven't you ever heard that true strength comes from protecting your precious people? So what? So, that your brother wanted you to have precious people to protect, Naruto said in exasperation. Then why leave me all alone? He thought it would be better for you. He thought that with him around you would become too dependent. Sasuke smirked darkly, I'd like to believe you, but it's a little too late for that, he said as he broke free of the vines and rushed at a crouching Naruto with his chidori blazing. Naruto just shook his head, he had loosened the vines around Sasuke while he was telling him the truth. Plus what's wrong with the Uchiha clan becoming nobility? Asked Sasuke. I deserve it, after all the shit I've been through. I thought you might say something like that, mumbled Naruto and easily sidestepped Sasuke's Chidori to appear behind him with a fully charged Rasengan. Game over, Sasuke. Naruto plunged his attack straight into Sasuke's back, killing him as soon as his spine was ripped apart. And so the mighty Uchiha clan falls, the Sharingan never to be seen again. Naruto walked over to Kakashi, you could have confirmed the story for him, you know, he told the silver-haired ninja that was still trying hard to break his restraints. I didn't know the truth, responded Kakashi. Sure you did, Obito was Shisui's brother. Surely you must have kept in touch, at least enough to learn how to use the Sharingan. I suspected something wrong, but that's all. I could neither confirm nor contradict your story, Kakashi answered simply. You know, I could let you go, offered Naruto. You'll just have to promise not to mess with the sound. Go to hell, spat out Kakashi. I would die for my village, unlike some. I would die for my village too, but I'm not a Leaf supporter, so I'm terribly sorry if I choose not to die for them, Naruto ended sarcastically. Realizing that Kakashi would not take his offer and would be a bother if left alive, Naruto sighed and held his katana over Kakashi's heart. For old time's sake, he quickly pushed the katana forward, instantly killed the copy ninja. Naruto turned around to see a very worn-out Tsunade, whose genjutsu was even slipping, being overpowered by his soldiers. He sighed, wondering why it all had to end in death. Finish her off and scout out the area for anyone living, ordered Naruto as he jumped off in the direction of Konoha. A slow pace will do me just fine. After all I did use up a good 80% of my chakra and stamina. I wonder how things are going with me as attack? He wondered out loud with a slight hint of worry. Even if I did manage to split the forces in half, there weren't very many Hugo on my battlefield. Chapter 21, Failed Spiral All the teams were in position. Fully equipped and well rested, waiting silently, and somewhat anxiously for their leader to give them permission to scale and or destroy the walls, which lay no more than 200 yards in front of them. They had silently witnessed as both armies left the village, one to fight the rain and cloud on the borders of the fire country and the other to fight the demon fox, which their leader had summoned. Mia was sitting in tree overlooking her regiment, using chakra every so often when the ground shook from the movements of the summons. No one in the sound except her knew what the beacon looked like, for security reasons Naruto never showed anyone, but it was one of those one-of-a-kind jutsu that you can't mistake for anything else. He sure is taking his sweet time, thought Mia, as she observed that the leaf army was sufficiently far out of the village. She scoffed at the leaf's stupidity when they were blasting the demon fox with fireballs, while Kyuubi may have been afflicted with Doden and Sutton, his brother, HB, is afflicted with Katan and Sutton. You may as well be giving the fox chakra, since he absorbs any kind of fire. One size does not fit all, but these people are too ignorant to realize things like this. Mia was about to wonder how come the ground hadn't shook in such a long while, when she saw a pillar of flame go sky high, the beacon. She instantly shifted her attention down to her regiment and shouted, the beacon has been lit. She jumped down to the ground and looked about 50 yards in front of her regiment, to a solitary figure sitting on the ground. Jiro, you're up, she shouted. The sound nin, by the name of Jiro, slowly got up and did several hand seals before slamming his palms into the ground, Doten, Dorio Dengo, he shouted. Within several seconds he was holding a giant mud cannonball, 20 yards in diameter. After a bit of weight adjustment, he gathered all his strength and threw it, at high speed, straight into Konoha's wall. A loud explosion resonated through the forest and a dust cloud rose up above the impact area. By the time the explosion was heard, Mia's regiment was already halfway to the wall, and before the dust had a chance to settle sound Nin were already in the village. The explosion was bound to attract attention and that was exactly what the sound shinobi were counting on. 
There were two regiments to the left and right of Mia's that would silently infiltrate Konoha and act as backup for Mia's regiment. Asumo was one of the few Jounin left to guard the village. He had wanted to be out on the front lines with his friends, but knew the importance of the position he had been given. Asuma looked at his team and scanned the surroundings for the hundredth time now. Something is definitely amiss, I've been having shivers run down my spine since we first started patrolling. Under his command was one of his old students, Kuji, who had made it up to high-level Chonin despite his injuries and two other Chonin, whom he had met only in passing, and had no real experience with. Snapping out of his thought Asuma noticed that they were coming up on Kurunai's location, we should stop and trade information, and I'll ask if she's having the same bad feeling I am. She did always. However before Asuma could even finish his thought, the wall slightly behind them blew apart. The whole team stopped dead in their tracks for a second before exchanging quick glances and running there. Within a minute they had arrived. They stood on rubble that had just a minute ago been a wall. They didn't have to wait long to find out who had done this, as a rain of shuriken fell on top of them. Asuma's team easily dodged or deflected them, but had gotten split in two. Asuma and Kuji were standing face to face with two sound jounin while the other two Chonin were facing two more sound Jounin. Those two are barely mid-level Chonin, they won't be able to handle two Jounin, thought Asuma. But it's not like I will be able to help them very quickly either. Asuma quickly did a couple of hand seals and two cage Bushin appeared next to him. But before he could send them to help the Chonin, hundreds of earth spikes came up all around them. Asuma and Kuji managed to jump away with only a minor cut on the ankle and thigh, respectively, Asuma's cage Bushin were instantly destroyed. Jiro looked sideways at Asuma and Kuji, that's Shinan level usage of the cage Bushin. But it seems that your friends didn't fare as well as you did. Asuma spared a glacé at his companions, only to see them being single-handedly slaughtered by a green-haired sound Jounin. Asuma's frown soon turned into an angry scowl, you'll all pay for that. Jiro laughed at Asuma and nodded to his teammate, Takedo. As Jiro finished his hand seals, Takedo nodded back and vanished from sight, slightly startling Asuma. Doden, Land bind, said Jiro as he pressed his palms to the ground. Asuma had seen this jutsu before so was able to evade it and Kuji had already activated his bike a no jutsu and as soon as the ground had started to move around him he had begun meat tank no jutsu. Jiro used Doten, Shinju Uzanshu to escape the meat tank, and started doing seals while underground. Doten, surface quicksand, he said channeling chakra into the ground above him. This was meant to at least slow down, if not completely stop Kuji. Fortunately for the sound nin, Kuji had stopped his attack when he was unable to find his opponent, so as soon as he came out of the spin he was instantly caught in the quicksand. Asuma wasn't faring against his opponent any better. As soon as Kuji had rolled off, Takedo appeared behind him with a drawn katana ready to slice Asuma in half. The veteran leaf nin barely managed to block with his own daggers, making the katana only cut his vest. The sound nin did not relent his attack even a little bit and continued to press Asuma until he had managed to cut a tendon on Asuma's left shoulder. Satisfied that the leaf nin's left arm hung useless, Takedo kicked Asuma in the left part of his back and then jumped back into a defensive position. Asuma, meanwhile, was calculating the maximum amount of damage he could inflict upon Takedo, since he knew that he could not come out as the victor. While surveying his surrounding he glanced to the side and saw a wall of earth rise up around Kuji who had been captured by the quicksand. Asuma felt a pain in his heart knowing that another student and friend of his was going to die. However a long ways past Kuji, Asuma saw Kurunai weaving a genjutsu around the green-haired sound nin, Asuma smiled a little. Takedo followed his opponent's gaze and scoffed, do you really think a team of only four sound jounin attack this part of the village? Asuma instantly realized the validity of the sound nin's question. You threw yourselves in as bait? He asked Takedo. Yes and our reinforcements will close around your own shinobi as soon as they all come here, Takedo smirked darkly. A sort of fly trap, not that we need it, noticing Asuma's confused look he decided to elaborate. You, a jounin, didn't even make me use my second blade. The green-haired one that you saw your comrade casting the genjutsu on, used to be part of the Akatsuki, Asuma's eyes widened and Takedo laughed. Takedo suddenly stopped laughing and put on a completely cold demeanor, game over, he disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Asuma realized too late that he had been talking to a cage Bushin. He felt a quick pain in his back and chest, but his world darkened too fast for him to realize exactly what happened. Takedo walked up to Jiro, who was climbing out of the ground, I know we're considered elite, but this is a joke. They were weak and you know it, replied Jiro. Did they really send out anyone who could stand up to us to fight against Naruto-sama? We haven't even gotten more than 200 yards into the village, countered Jiro, 
I'm sure we'll have some formidable opponents. I hope so, either way we gotta go help Miyasama. Mia found herself slowly being pulled into a mid-level genjutsu. She kicked her last opponent away and sent a kunai right after him, so that when he hit the tree the kunai pinned his heart to it. During the kick, Mia snuck a peek to her side, must be that red-eyed one doing the genjutsu. And Jiro and Takedo looked to be finishing up with their opponents. Mia quickly did a few hand seals, dokumori, poison seeds, she whispered and threw a few needles to Kurunai's feet, upon landing the needles disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Kurunai smirked and continued focusing chakra. Good, thought Mia, she thinks those were cage bushin and that I am actually disoriented from her initial genjutsu. Mia quickly activated her mind bubble, which made it so that half of her mind felt the effects of the genjutsu while the other half didn't, the one that didn't feel the effects was the one in control. Dual layer genjutsu, first layer to disorient me and allow her access to my nerves. The second layer creates the illusion that I am captured by a tree and then she appears right behind me to slip my throat. Well, nice try, but it's time to break it. Mia dispersed the mind bubble that was containing her real mind and forced control over to herself. Kurunai noticed the counter too slow and was swept off the feet and punched into the nearest building. Before she had even slid to the ground a kunai was already embedded into her stomach. Kurunai coughed up a bit of blood, how did you? You were trapped, I made sure. A part of mine was trapped yes, but most of my conscious was isolated from your genjutsu, Mia was about to finish off Kurunai when she felt a chakra signature closing in fast from her right. Instinctively Mia dodged, barely escaping a fireball. Shit. I got too careless. Sakura ran up to Kurunai and quickly pulled out the kunai and started a simple medical jutsu, to close the wound. In several seconds the wound was mostly healed, since it wasn't so deep. Thanks Sakura. Mia narrowed her eyes at the newcomer, short pink hair, body build, chakra quantity and distribution. I think this one is Haruno Sakura, a newly appointed jounin, but more importantly Naruto's Janan teammate. Upon hearing Kurunai's words Mia's suspicion was confirmed. Haruno Sakura, Sakura whipped her head around, surprised that the sound nin knew her. Naruto-kun's former teammate and a newly appointed jounin, after being an academy teacher for a prolonged period of your chounin career. Sakura's eyes narrowed at the mention of her teammate's name, you seem to know a lot about me, why don't you introduce yourself? That is not really necessary, but if you must know who is going to kill you then I will just say that my name is Mia. Kurunai jumped a little at that, you're one of the two remaining members of the Akatsuki, Mia nodded. Sakura, you can't take her on. Retreat and gather up a force of stronger jounin. Sakura scowled at being called weak and held her ground, no, I will fight her. No, are you crazy? This is suicide, yelled Kurunai. I will prove I'm strong, whispered Sakura. Kurunai sighed, knowing that she would not be able to talk her pink-haired comrade out of it. Fine, but I'll back you up, Sakura nodded. Sakura quickly started making hand seals, followed closely behind by Kurunai. They are both genjutsu users, they are each weaving different genjutsus around me. She frowned. Mind bubble is out since one of them can keep sustaining the genjutsu while the other attacks, and I can't move while in the mind bubble. Mia quickly jumped towards the leaf nin, attacking with taijutsu and doing several seals for the cobra strike. However she never made it, Kurunai was focusing on the outer layer genjutsu, and this time she was using the highest lever she knew. Mia fell to her knees holding her head. Sakura grinned thinking that Mia was done for. Sakura was greatly surprised when Mia slowly stood up, shook her head, and closed the distance between herself and Sakura in less than half a second delivering a mighty punch to Sakura's midsection quickly followed up by a kick to Sakura's right elbow and finally a spin kick right under Sakura's chin, Sakura was sent flying backwards. After the dust cloud had cleared from her landing, Sakura looked around to understand what had gone wrong. That was when she saw a man with a katana standing behind Kurunai. Genjutsu users. Slow on the defensive, he watched the blood drip off his blade. I trust you can take her? He motioned to Sakura as he let Kurunai's body fall freely under the ground. Yes, go on ahead, Takedo nodded and jumped off toward the center of the village. As soon as Takedo had gone Mia turned her attention back to Sakura. Genjutsu is quite useful, but only under the right circumstances, she explained quietly. Like when your opponent isn't aware of you or simply doesn't see you. Or when you have someone to hold off the opponent while you trap them in the Genjutsu. Otherwise, you are completely exposed to your enemy's attack. Sakura had gotten up while Mia was talking and was working on a healing jutsu for her fractured elbow, which was proving difficult since she had a really hard time making seals. So you see, a genjutsu user is a team player and very rarely can one do much alone, Mia cocked her head to the side. 
Do you see any teammates around? Sakura flinched at the implication, but kept her concentration on channeling healing chakra to her elbow. But you already knew that. You recently became the Hokaye's apprentice because you knew that Genjutsu alone wouldn't be able to keep you alive against Naruto, Mia snickered. What chance do you have against Naruto, if you can't even beat me? He was trained by the best of the best of the Akatsuki. Trained to be a killer, a mass shinobi killer. Trained to be able to take on one of your sanin and walk away with minor wounds. Sakura frowned at what had become of Naruto. You frown now, but you didn't give a damn when he was young. Always infatuated with that idiot who couldn't take on Itachi even if Itachi did not have the Mangekyu, Mia sighed. She was getting worked up, there was no need to get worked up. These people were just a bunch of fools. She sighed again, I'm done with you, she held up her index and middle fingers in front of her mouth and channeled the appropriate chakra. At first Sakura did not understand what the sound Nin had done, but soon she was a thin layer of green smoke cloud her vision. Looking down she saw the poison coming up from little balls on the ground, she started coughing. The needles I threw during my battle with Kurinai were actually those balls in henge, poison seeds, I call them. They take root in the ground and expel poison once activated, Sakura tried to stomp them out, but was only laughed at by Mia. You can't destroy them once they have taken root. This technique is usually useless, since most of my opponents are taijutsu slash ninjutsu oriented, so they move around a lot and are quite conscious of what is below their feet. Genjutsu users are less attentive, especially a newly appointed Jounin, who is still in the beginning stages of mixing medical jutsu and genjutsu into an effective fighting style. Sakura was feeling lightheaded as if her body did not have enough air, but she could breathe just fine. She ran a quick diagnostic scan on herself and was horrified to find the poison was tearing apart her lungs. As soon as she realized what exactly was happening her chest began to hurt like hell. She had lost a complete sense of what Mio was saying, all her senses seemed to concentrate on the pain in her chest. She desperately tried to heal herself, but it just wasn't working. She thought she heard Mia saying something about not being able to extract the poison, but she wasn't sure, neither did she care. Try as she might, she knew that she was going to die and that she was still weak. That she had failed her friends, family and her village. Sakura died a slow painful death, her face contorted in a silent scream. Once she noticed that Sakura was past the point of no return, Mia just walked off leaving Sakura to die alone. I better take a look around and see how the other teams are doing. She ran off toward the center of the village where most of the fighting would likely be concentrated. The demon fox had been unsummoned sometime during my battle with the Genjutsu users. Naruto specifically ordered that no one approach the forest battleground until after the demon fox was gone. Really I shouldn't worry, Naruto's reinforcements, namely 50 Jounin and Chounin are going to comb through what's left of Konoha's army searching for threats, aka survivors, and making sure Naruto is alright, by now Mia was completely absorbed in her thoughts. So if everything goes according to plan he should be in the village in several minutes, Mia concluded. And if he is really hurt, I'll find the person that did it and chop them up into little pieces and use them as fish bait for the rest of my life. In the forest. Naruto was leaning against a tree, gasping for breath, note to self, don't run at full speed when low on chakra. Suddenly Naruto heard some faint rustling up ahead of him. Naruto quickly pulled out three shuriken and launched them into the foliage. No sooner had the shuriken disappeared from view they were deflected back out and Naruto heard some people cursing, he prepared himself for strong opponents. Odokage sama is this a test of our ninja skills? He heard coming out of the bush, before a sound nin stepped out, whom Naruto instantly recognized. Kenji, what the hell are you doing here? Asked Naruto. Searching for you of course, answered Kenji as if it was the most natural thing in the world. You were assigned as the top medical team for the invasion, said Naruto calmly, so could you please tell me what you are doing outside the village? Well you are part of the invasion, and as you said yourself we are the top medical team. And the Odokage reserves the best medic nin, so here we are, explained Kenji, Naruto grimaced. While Naruto and Kenji argued about the slight inconsistency and ambiguity of Naruto's orders, the medics had healed Naruto's minimal wounds and had given him a special soldier's pill, to refill his supernatural chakra capacity. Halfway through Naruto had given up the argument and was content to know that Kenji's team would follow him back to Konoha and carry out their original orders. See? That took like 20 minutes and you're back at 100%, laughed Kenji. Naruto just sighed and started running towards Konoha, with Kenji's team trying to keep up. Naruto arrived at the main gate to see that half of it was gone and the other was flung completely open. From inside the village faint explosions could be heard and several pillars of smoke were visible. Any word from our allies? 
inquired Naruto while walking through the main gate. The cloud said that they were easily able to break through the leaf shinobi, replied Kenji. There hasn't been any word from the rain yet. The leaf nin on the cloud's front will probably retreat back to Konoha, we will need to be prepared for them, said Naruto. And also send a team to find out what is happening with the rain. Otokage-sama, the cloud messenger said that the cloud army would follow the leaf shinobi as far as Konoha and help in their extermination. Great, said Naruto with a small smirk. Now that I'm here, direct all the messengers to me or if I can't be found Mia or one of our generals. Yes, sir. Bowed Kenji and left with his team. Naruto took a deep breath and slowly let it out, so Konoha, we meet once more. Naruto then ran off towards the Hokage Monument. Halfway to his destination, Naruto heard a loud explosion quite close to him and decided to stop and investigate, maybe help if the situation required it. So he rapidly changed direction and soon landed on top of a building overlooking the fight. He instantly recognized both sides. There were two sound nin and two leaf nin. The leaf nin were Tenten and a Hyuga, while the sound nin were both part of the Anpasaki clan. The Hyuga is dealing with the short-range combat and Tenten is helping doing all the long-range fighting, observed Naruto. But this has already been tested five years ago, the Anpasaki clan were able to defeat the Hyuga clan. I wonder why this battle is taking so long? Wondered Naruto until he took a closer look at the sound shinobi, and almost gave away his position by laughing out loud. Of course, those are the Anpasaki twins, the two prodigies. Suddenly a barrage of kunai and shuriken was launched at Naruto who had managed a kawarimi with his cage bushin, and so was now sitting on the wall of the building looking over at Tenten. Let me guess, the Hyuga found me and you just decided to make me join the battle, so that there were no unknowns, right? Tenten immediately recognized who it was and gasped, the sound shinobi also recognized their leader and bowed slightly in a formal acknowledgement. Ayaka, we can't win this, the best strategy right now is to run, said Tenten to her companion. No, I will not run away from my opponents, said the Hyuga arrogantly. Naruto chuckled, just like Neji, I see. A Hyuga prodigy that thinks everyone is below her. The Hyuga snorted, I'm nothing like Neji, I'm from the main family and I don't die on simple rescue missions. Main family? Didn't I kill everyone in the main family? Asked Naruto. Ayaka's eyes narrowed in anger, so you are the one that killed Hanabi. I have trained to avenge her death and now I will do so. Naruto sighed and looked over at the two sound shinobi, would you two twins please finish her off? Ayaka smirked, as if those two could even lay a finger on me. That last statement got the twins riled, one of them went through a series of quick hand seals and launched a sound blast right at the Hyuga. Ayaka simply did a kaiden to deflect the attack. Tenten used this time to attack the twins by throwing several spiked spheres with explosive tags at them. The twins had anticipated this and the second one had already prepared a wind jutsu that knocked away the explosive spheres. By the time the wind jutsu was done the first twin had already prepared his next ninjutsu, fracture waves. Ayaka was about to laugh and say that nothing happened when Tenten suddenly screamed and fell down holding her knees. The Hyuga suddenly noticed that only one of the sound nin was standing in front of her. Using her Byakugan she instantly spotted the second one firing off some sort of attack at her from behind, so she activated her kaiden without even thinking. After all the kaiden was an ultimate defense. Decibel overload, he calmly said and fired off his attack despite the fact that Ayaka was within her kaiden. Within several seconds the kaiden broke apart and Ayaka was on the ground holding her head and screaming in pain. Not so ultimate, huh? Asked Naruto. Tenten was watching in horror as Ayaka just kept screaming, what the hell happened to her? The Anpasaki clan's blood limit is the ability to manipulate pure sound waves, explained Naruto. While most sound waves are created using chakra, the Anpasaki clan is able to create sound waves without using chakra, Naruto threw two shuriken at Ayaka's head to put her out of her misery. That's how Hinata died, isn't it? Asked Tenten. That would have been our father's work, he was the one at the Otto Konoha meeting, replied one of the twins, that had appeared behind her and knocked her out as soon as he said that. Should we kill her? Wouldn't want clan secrets out in the open, now would you? Asked Naruto. No. I suppose not, the one behind her sighed and slit her throat. How is the situation in the village? inquired Naruto. Most of the fighting is taking place in the middle of the village, they reported. There are of course some isolated fights on the outskirts. As ordered our clan is specifically searching out the white eyes most of which were within their manor and were pretty easily taken out by several doden and sound jutsu while they were still unawares. A small party was obviously trying to get someone important out of the manor, 
so we and several others followed them and here we are. Naruto nodded in approval, good, good. Anyone know where Mia is? The twins both shook their head. Naruto sighed and waved a little goodbye before heading for the Hokage Monument again, the twins jumped of in the other direction. But he didn't get more than a hundred yards before he was attacked by a kick from the side. Naruto didn't even bat an eye, he turned around in mid-air, grabbed his attacker's leg, pulled him closer and punched him in the stomach. This attacker was special though, and burst into a cloud of bugs as soon as Naruto punched him. Shit. Abarame, curse Naruto. The bugs made to wrap around Naruto, but he used a kawarimi and they only consumed a log. During his training Naruto received extensive information about very many advanced bloodlines, so he knew that he wasn't in the clear yet and that there was probably a bug somewhere on him that was revealing his position. I hate using this jutsu, Naruto mentally sighed. He prepped the jutsu that he was going to use, but waited before actually activating it. Bugs may be quiet, but with my enhanced senses I can hear the flapping of wings, Naruto concentrated more chakra to his ears. There. Thought Naruto, but didn't give any outward sign. Let's see, he's not attacking so that means he's setting up some sort of trap, Naruto heard some faint shuffling behind him, for his partner. Naruto waited for a little bit longer until he heard the Abarame moving, then he activated his jutsu, Katan, body burn, he said and expelled chakra from several points all around his body. His body lit on fire for several seconds, completely giving away his location, but also burning off any bugs that were on him, as well as some of clothes. Knowing that he had been completely exposed, Naruto used split and leapt forwards as his clone leapt backwards. Naruto soon came to face to face with the bug user, who was still a little surprised that his tactics had been known and was none other than Shino. Hey, Shino, how is it going? Asked Naruto politely and even with a small smile. Shino just narrowed his eyes and Naruto heard the bugs moving to attack. Come now, I have nothing against you. If you just turn and leave I won't chase you, you can get out of here with your life, offered Naruto. I am loyal to my village, Shino answered simply. Naruto sighed, I really have nothing against him, and got into a defensive stance. Suddenly Naruto felt the ground beneath him shake a little, and realized a little too late that the bugs would be attacking from below. Shit. Thought Naruto as a swarm of bugs burst through the ground and wrapped completely around Naruto. Two times in a row, goddammit. Cursed Naruto as he quickly went through the same hand seals from just a little while ago, plus a few others. Chakra skin, said Naruto and quickly followed up with, Katan, body burn. A skin-tight armor made of a thin layer of chakra covered Naruto's body before Naruto had activated the Katan jutsu. Almost immediately after the fire shot out from the Naruto, the bugs either dispersed or were burned by the flames. The bugs that did move away, made no move to return to Naruto even after the flames had died down. Surprisingly, most of Naruto's clothes remained unburned, thank you Itachi, for having fire-resistant cloth. Bugs are afraid of fire and burn easily, maybe that's why your clan moved to the fire country, so that the fire wielders wouldn't be against you, Naruto calmly dusted himself off. It doesn't matter the bugs did their job, said Shino stoically. If you're talking about the poison, then you should know that I'm immune to just about all, Naruto smiled cockily. And those that I'm not immune to just take a little bit of time to filter out of my system. Shino was startled by Naruto revelation and by the fact that his bugs had just warned him that there was a presence right behind him. Shino jumped away to avoid the imminent attack from behind, but it never came. Instead the real Naruto had opted for a frontal assault knowing that Shino had fallen for his cage bushin distraction. A knee to the stomach greeted Shino in mid-air, followed up by an elbow to the back of his neck. His bugs managed to create a shield to block the elbow hit, but neither Shino nor the bugs anticipated the three needles that Naruto's clone had thrown up at Shino. The needles pierced Shino's neck and he fell to the ground in an unconscious state. In mid-air, Naruto had felt his chakra and forced cage bushin break apart, so he wasn't surprised that he was forced to block half a dozen shuriken and kunai, with his katana, only several seconds after he landed. You're a good shot. Iruka-sensei, said Naruto calmly. Naruto, he said in a bitter tone. Has it really come down to me and you? Asked Naruto. I won't let you destroy this village, yelled Iruka. The village is destroyed with or without me. Meaning killing you now would make no difference, is that right? Asked Iruka. You know a very prominent figure in Konoha's history once said, if the most powerful cannot act accordingly, then they are undeserving of life. Do you know who he was? Asked Naruto. Iruka knew that he had heard that line somewhere, a very long time ago, but just couldn't place it. 
Naruto could see that Iruko was struggling with his memory and decided to help him out, he was the strongest in all the leaf. Iruka's head shot up immediately, the Yondaime Hokage. Naruto nodded, my father. Iruka nodded sadly, yes, but how do you know that line? You weren't even alive back then. He wrote me a letter, in which he explained everything, answered Naruto with a sad smirk. So my advice to you, don't die for the failed and incompetent. Failed and incompetent, repeated Iruka, you mean Konoha? Yes. Just walk away, hell, leave the shinobi world altogether, suggested Naruto. No. If you think I'm going to abandon my home, you are sorely mistaken, yelled Iruka and charged at Naruto. Naruto easily sidestepped, appeared on Iruka's other side and knocked him down to his knees. Then, using his claws, quickly stripped him of his kunai pouch and shuriken holder. I don't want you to die, said Naruto sincerely. I will die for my village, said Iruka defiantly, I will not betray it. I will not let you die for the idiots that could not pass my father's test, replied Naruto and pressed several pressure points on Iruka's neck. Iruka lost consciousness instantly and Naruto gently put his body down on the ground, I'll come back for you, old friend, and he disappeared. Naruto stood on top of the Yondaime's head and looked out over the burning Konoha village, ironic how fire burns leaves, he said sadly. Iruka won't join the sound, not after this, and he probably won't understand why I had to do this. It's alright, I'll transport him to somewhere outside the shinobi world, hopefully without any memories, but we'll have to see what I can do in that department, Naruto mused out loud. Well dad, this may not have happened how you had wanted. But life is unpredictable. I just hope that I can accomplish the dream that you set up for me, Naruto sighed. With destruction comes healing and creation. I wish it were only so simple, but then again these are just overall effects, minute details are never easy. The powerful must be kept in check, whispered Naruto. Funny how both Itachi and the Yondaime found that to be true, yet no one truly understood the meaning behind their words. Dear Naruto. First of all, I must apologize for the kind of life I forced upon you. I, the Yondaime Hokage of Konoha, was your father, and to protect my beloved Konoha village I was forced to sacrifice not only my life, but the life of my son. I really do hope that the village will treat you like a hero, but my common sense is telling me otherwise. The villagers are mostly ignorant and tend to follow the crowd, and there are also many arrogant shinobi clans that will fear the power that I have passed on to you. Why do I love this village? Because of the few honorable and righteous people that can make the difference and keep Konoha highly respected. However, I realized long ago that those few are too few, and in order for the whole village to progress the ignorance and arrogance must be done away with. But this kind of change cannot be forced, rather it has to be learned, through many tests and trials. I didn't intend for this to be their first test, mostly because of the magnitude, but it cannot be helped. Their ability to accept you as a person, not a monster or demon, will be their first test and probably last test, for it contains all the components of honorable, righteous and respectable. Again I am sorry to have to place such a heavy burden upon your shoulders, but this must be done, for the good of the world. You are to be their judge and deal out the punishment for failure, if that is to happen. The punishment being the destruction of Konoha. This might seem as a shock to you, but it must be done. After all, if the most powerful cannot act accordingly, then they are undeserving of life. I sincerely hope that you are not reading this in the Hokaye's seat, but then again if you are then the test has been passes and you have nothing to worry about. On the next page you will find my will, in which I leave you the newly bought estate and everything else I own. The Sandaime keeps insisting that you take your mother's maiden name, while I'd rather have you proudly wear my name, but I will trust his judgment on that issue. I hope you will have the best life a person can have, and that you find that one person for you and love her as dearly as I loved your mother. Best of luck and wishes to you. Love always. Kazami Arashi, the Yondaime Hokage. P.S. Always protect your precious people. Naruto folded the letter back up and sighed deeply, just like he did every time he read the letter. Well dad, it's over. Don't worry I didn't have too bad of a life. And I found those precious people to protect. He looked out over Konoha, the scattered fires still burning, grey smoke rising up into the late afternoon sky. The sun was setting right in front of him, soon the whole village would be swallowed up by the darkness. I wonder what tomorrow will bring, Naruto smiled contently as he saw the last rays of sun disappear behind the horizon. The end.